Chapter 19 Cobham and Bisley Euclid in Surrey Cobham Bagshot rhododendrons vultures of the road the golden farmer catching the smallpox a contented family the queen's bond graces a gentle hermit prize fights Bisley donkey town a willful brook. Half of northwest Surrey belongs to the soldiers. Cobham Common, Bagshot Heath, Cobham Ridges, Bisley, Purbright, Yorktown, and Camberley contain among them pretty nearly all the camps, colleges, training grounds, and rifle ranges that do not belong to Aldershot over the Hampshire border. The whole aspect of the country is military, rural outlandishness has been drilled into rigidity and pattern. The roads run as straight as if the Romans had driven them and, indeed, some of them in the neighborhood are Roman roads, the face of the hills and heather commons is scored with roads like figures of Euclid, triangles, oblongs, radii, rhomboids, every kind of road which enables you to go from one place to another in the shortest space of time possible, which, for that matter, is a thing you frequently wish to do. Nobody wants to linger on a road as straight as a gunshot. Camberley, perhaps, is as good a center as any for exploring this part of Surrey, but the border of the county is intersected with such a network of railways that it is easy to get to Bagshot or Camberley or Frimley from almost anywhere and to join the railway again where you please. One of the best walks is from Chertsey over Cobham Common to Windlesham and Bagshot, and then over Cobham Ridges down into Frimley. Bisley is most easily visited from the railway, as thousands visit it or rather the rifle range every July. Cobham Common is at its best in July when the heather is out. But it has a day in May, under a hot sun, which is, in some ways, more distinct. The scent and the glow of the heather belong to other Surrey hills, but Cobham Common has its own features of sandy hillocks topped by clumps of pines, which set an austere gauntness on the place unlike the rolling flanks and ridges by Frencham and Hindhead. In May the heather is dark and dry, there are sparse patches of gorse scattered about the slopes, and looking across at a group of pines edging the horizon you sometimes get a setting of black, yellow, and blue, which belongs peculiarly to this corner of Surrey. Cobham Common and its heather have often been compared to Scotland, and I can never catch the likeness. The heather is there, and the scattered pines like some of the lowlands, but the wind is a southern wind, and never blows like Stevenson's wind on the moors as it blows in a ship's rigging, hard and cold and pure. Beyond all, there is nowhere the Scottish horizon of hills. Windlesham lies on the western edge of the common, and straggles over a dozen short, crooked roads and oasis among parallelograms. Once it had a reputation for growing bog myrtle, as you may learn from Aubrey. In this parish, at Lightwater Moor, grows great store of a plant, about a foot and a half high, called by the inhabitants Goal, but the true name is Gale, it has a very grateful smell, like a mixture of bays and myrtle, and in Latin it is called Myrtus Brabantica, it grows also in several places of this healthy country, and is used to be put in their chests among their linen. Perhaps it may still be put there. Such a plant must have been a favorite with an excellent housewife buried in the churchyard, whose epitaph attracts wandering readers. She was, but words are wanting to say what, think what a wife should be, and she was that. If Aubrey were making another perambulation of Surrey today, he would forget the Windlesham bog myrtle when he had seen the bagshot rhododendrons. To imagine bagshot without rhododendrons is to think of Mitcham without lavender, Epsom without salts, Farnham without hops. The other name that goes naturally with rhododendrons is waterer, and the waterer nurseries have the magic of gardens of fairy tales. Even in winter, on a sunny day, an Italian air blows through those tall thuyas and cypresses, down those dark aisles of shining green. But in May and June, when the rhododendrons glow from pearl to crimson, and the azaleas light long stretches of flaming chrome and orange, the gardens take a glory that belongs to no other flowers. In the days of the stagecoach Bagshot was a thriving village with an inn, 
perhaps the king's arms of today, where thirty coaches a day changed horses. That rich traffic drew the vultures of the road, and Bagshot Heath was one of the most dreaded stretches of highway in England. Dick Turpin is said to have used the king's arms and the golden farmer further down the road, it was the golden farmer in his day, and an unimaginative age has turned the farmer from golden into jolly. It is a pity, for jolly farmer means no more than white lion or a dozen other names, but to golden farmer there belongs a story. There was a highwayman of Bagshot Heath who never would rob a purse of banknotes, he would touch nothing but gold. At Frimley at the same time lived a farmer, who never paid his debts in anything but gold. The golden farmer one day was recognized as the golden highwayman, and the inn stands close by the spot where they hanged him in chains. Bagshot has had dealings with Stuart and other princes hunting the deer and putting up at the inns. Both the Charleses used to hunt in Bagshot Park. Once there was a pretty prince's quarrel. It was at one of the bagshot inns that the Duke of Buckingham, at the height of his wild career, had the coolness to turn Prince Rupert's horses out of the stables and put in his own. Rupert complained to the king, and the Duke of York backed him, but Charles decided for Buckingham. Twenty years or so later, John Evelyn was at a bagshot inn with Pepys, and went to call on a Mrs. Graham at her house in Bagshot Park. It was very commodious and well furnished, as she was an excellent housewife, a prudent and virtuous lady. She begged him to stay to dinner and sleep the night, she told him all about her children how the eldest was ill with the smallpox but going on pretty well, and the others running about among infected people so as to catch the disease and get it over while they were young. Evelyn quite approved, he had had smallpox in his own family, and knew something about it. The house in Bagshot Park was made even more commodious some forty years ago, as a residence for the Duke of Connaught. In the Ordnance Maps, Bagshot Heath is placed south of Bagshot, in the old maps of the county, the heath lies to the north and northeast, and would merge into what is now Cobham Common. It must have covered many more miles than the maps allow it today. Cobham ridges stretch from its southwest corner, a long, sandy scar of three miles, overlooking the Bisley rifle ranges and the desert ground behind them. You are sure to be invited to admire Cobham Ridges, and no doubt twenty years ago it was fine wild country. But frequent notice boards observing that when the red flag is flying it is dangerous to walk any further, barbed wire, excavations of gravel, and sand trampled by cavalry horses into a paste like wet coal dust may temper the warmest enthusiasm. A hideous foreground can do something to spoil even a fine view, and the view from the ridges is certainly wide and wild. The finest view I have had from Cobham Ridges was a thunderstorm driving down over Brookwood. It was a gusty, rainy day, and the rolling white and grey clouds and the lines of driven hail rode down the sky like a charge. I once met, on Cobham Ridges, a pleasantly contented family. In front of a sort of bivouac of bent poles covered with cloth sat an old, weather-beaten man, tailor fashion, making a straw beehive. Another beehive, finished, with a straw handle, lay at his side. A wood fire smoked and sputtered a yard or two away, on a flat wooden barrow near were rough cooking utensils and a dark tabby cat, two small boys, one of them with not much more on him than a large pair of trousers, brought wood and bracken for the fire. It was raining, but I was wished good afternoon with the utmost cheerfulness. Were those his boys? They were, they generally went with him. Was there a good sale for beehives round there? There was a pretty good sale, this one, with a handle, he should try to sell for two shillings, he might have to take less, a farmer let him have the straw. Yes, he was known about there. That was the boy's cat, it generally went with them. What was that noise in the tent? That was a pair of kittens, yes, the boys liked to have them, they generally had kittens. One of them picked up the cat, upside down, with obvious affection. Cobham itself lies five or six miles away from Cobham Ridges, south by a mile even from Cobham Common. Long before you come into the village you catch sight of the church spire, with its lead covering washed by the rain to a brilliant whiteness. 
Rising above the red tiles of the village into a blue sky it looks as if it had been painted yesterday. The church has been largely rebuilt, but has some fine Norman pillars, and contains besides the tomb of the great Nicholas Heath, once Archbishop of York. He was Lord Chancellor of England under Queen Mary, and a sound papist. When Elizabeth came to the throne he resigned, but remained so much in the Queen's bon graces, as an old writer puts it, that she visited him once a year through his life, believing his mistaken piety sincere. Two miles behind the ridges is Frimley, with an old inn and a church to which Americans come often. Bret Hart lived his last years at a house on the hillside near, and is buried in the churchyard. But the Bret Hart of the luck of Roaring Camp and the heathen Chinny does not, of course, belong to Frimley, those were earlier successes which he never equaled later. The village politician ought to flourish at Frimley. On a board near the church I found a warning against a crime which must be becoming rarer. Notice is hereby given that any person or persons found damaging the parish pump will be prosecuted, it ran, but the pump I did not find. In Aubrey's day, Frimley had the gentlest of hermits. He fled from the changes and chances of the parliamentary wars, and led the simplest possible life in the wilds. Aubrey describes his cottage. At the end of this hundred, I must not forget my noble friend, Mr. Charles Howard's cottage of retirement, which he called his castle, which lay in the middle of a vast heatha country, far from any road or village in the hope of a healthy mountain, where, in the troublesome times, he withdrew from the wicked world, and enjoyed himself here, where he had only one floor, his little dining room, a kitchen, a chapel, and a laboratory. His utensils were all of wood or earth, near him were about half a dozen cottages more, on whom he shewed much compassion and charity. Frimley is a convenient stopping place at which to join the railway. A walk for another two miles or so would bring the curious in the history of the prize ring, if any still remain, to a classic spot on the Hampshire border. It was in a meadow half a mile from Farnborough Station, selected because it would be easy to step out of one county into the next and so avoid the police, that Tom Sayers fought the huge American Irishman Heenan, in almost the last great prize fight fought in England. The fight came off on April 17, 1860, the most extraordinary care had been taken to keep the secret of the place of meeting, and the accounts of the proceedings, when one remembers that it all took place in the mid-Victorian quiet which was producing the idols of the King and Adam Bede are nearly unbelievable. Two monster trains carried 1,200 spectators, peers, members of parliament, magistrates, officers, clergymen, and gentlemen from London Bridge at dawn. Three pounds each was the price of the tickets. Nobody except two or three in the secret knew till that morning where the fight would be, the police, mounted and on foot, lined the railway from London Bridge for 16 miles, all armed with cutlasses. The trains turned off, as the account in Bell's Life in London puts it, at Rygate, took water near Guildford, and ran into Farnborough Station after a most pleasant journey through one of the prettiest countries in England, which, illumined by a glorious sun, and shooting forth in vernal beauty, must have inspired all with intense gratification. Thus Bell's eloquent reporter. Thirty-seven rounds were fought, in most of which Sayers was knocked down, his right arm was bruised and useless, Heenan could only see out of one eye. They were stopped at last, and in a few minutes Heenan was blind. Bell's life next morning came out with a special eight-page edition, the two center pages 12 columns of tiny print nearly 30,000 words describing every detail of the fight, the men, and the history of boxing in general. There were some protests by sentimental people against the brutality of the thing, and Bell, professing a vigorous belief in this particular form of muscular Christianity, remarks reflectively that the whole country is not yet converted to the right way on the subject of pugilism. Bisley, which lies on the other side of Cobham Ridges, opposite to Frimley, is, as I have said, best reached by rail, indeed, there is little inducement to anyone to reach it in any other way. Twenty years ago Bisley was a tiny village. It is now a vast rifle range. 
The name has become shifted from the little group of cottages and the quaint church standing among the cornfields half a mile away to the huge common enclosed by the National Rifle Association, where every year in July the great shooting prizes are won and lost. Bisley is in many ways unique. It carries on the traditions of Wimbledon, which were greater than any other rifle meeting. It can show more targets and better ranges than any other range, it attracts rifle shots from every British possession on the face of the globe, and for a week the rain of bullets sent into the sandy banks behind the targets is almost ceaseless. Perhaps the most remarkable sight of the Bisley week is the second stage of the shooting for the King's Prize, when 300 competitors are down at the same time opposite a hundred targets in a row, and when the shooting is not over until 6,300 separate shots have been fired, signaled, and chalked on the blackboards by the range markers. But the great occasion is, of course, the final stage, when the winner is cheered and cheered, and asked the usual ridiculous questions about smoking and drinking. Through all the week of the meeting the camp is a gay sight, with its white tents and flaring bunting, and the pennons blowing all down the long ranges to measure the wind for prone riflemen. Lying prone on the back, by the way, is a phrase which creeps into many newspapers during Bisley week. It would clearly not do to speak of a supine rifle shot. One would think that the noise of a rifle range would make the neighborhood intolerable. But even with the wind blowing to you from the range, a few hundred yards almost silences the sound of the range. I have walked on the common between Bisley itself and the range, when firing for the King's Prize was in full progress, and was merely conscious of an echo chattering uneasily in the trees. There have been plenty of ways of spelling Bisley. Bustle, Busla, Bushley, Bushily, Busley, Bussy, Busley, and Busley are a few of them, there are probably variations. The church has a fine old wooden porch, with an old U opposite it, but the door is locked, and visitors are not allowed to look over the church unaccompanied. My guide was courteous and obliging, but why should anyone be given all this trouble? There is a famous well near, named after St. John the Baptist, the water of which was once used for all the christenings. It is not very easily found, and the local harvesters could tell me nothing about it, but I discovered it near a farmhouse a few hundred yards southwest of the churchyard. Aubrey says that the dedication of the well made him curious to try it with oak galls, which turned the water purple. Why should the name have impelled him to this particular curiosity? Aubrey was always testing wells with oak galls, presumably for iron. Like many other famous wells, the water of this spring has always been said to be colder in summer and warmer in winter than any other spring in the neighborhood. Some of the names in this part of Surrey are curious. Cuckoo Hill, on the borders of Bagshot Heath, is pretty enough, and so is Gracious Pond, northwest of Cobham, though the pond, which was once great and stocked with excellent carp, is probably much smaller than it was. Brock Hill, near Cuckoo Hill, is of course the hill of badgers, and Penny Pot ought to be, if it is not, a memory of good ale. But Donkey Town? Who would live at Donkey Town? It is, however, quite a flourishing little community, though probably it will be eventually embraced by its larger neighbor, West End, which is the nearest village to Bisley to the north, and the largest. Looking at the map, it is a little difficult to understand why the cheaper forms of village building should spread in this part of the county, which, so to speak, leads nowhere, but possibly the presence of the Gordon Boys home has created fresh needs which must be supplied locally. The large buildings, which cost some £24,000, were set up here in 1885, and are a home for 200 boys. Between Bisley and Cobham runs a road with rather an odd feature. For a short distance near Cobham village the Little Haleborn, into which the Windle Brook has here grown, runs beside it, dark and full, but almost invisible under its overarching alders and dog roses. Just as it leaves the roadside it is joined by a strange companion. Another little stream, coming down from the north, runs into the Haleborn after traveling the last hundred yards of its course over the whole breadth of a road. The road, which is of gravel, and regularly used, is hard and level, 
and the stream turns it into a bed, perhaps eight or nine feet across. The natural course would seem to be to dig the stream a bed of its own by the side of the road, but local ingenuity has preferred to send the traveler dry shot over a stile through the field at the side of the stream, which duly proceeds in the ordnance map down the road it has chosen. Horsel Church Horsel Church Chapter 20 The Way Villages Old Woking behind the Vale a royal palace necropolis when not to dig a grave lumpy Stevens the Ripley Road the Anchor and the Talbot Dog an open box teal by Twilight Occam seven streams Newark Jack Dawes two shillings the dozen the Wisley Garden Biflate a ghost in velvet. In whatever way you may choose to travel through Surrey, it is difficult to avoid making Woking a center and a rendezvous. All the trains stop there, at least, I cannot remember ever passing through the station without stopping, either to change trains, which generally takes three quarters of an hour, or to wait in the station until it is time to go on again, which usually takes eleven minutes. I never found anything else to do at Woking, unless it were at night, when the railway lights up wonderful vistas and avenues of colored lamps. Then the platform can be tolerable. Once when I had a long time to wait I walked out to the church which stands rather finely on the ridge north of the railway. I thought then it was Woking Church, it belongs to Horsell. It was that Woking, the Woking of the station, which for many years I imagined to be the only Woking in Surrey. One did not wish for another. But there is another Woking, and it is as pretty and quiet as the railway Woking is noisy and tiresome. It stands with its old church on the banks of the way two miles away, a huddle of tiled roofs and old shops and pokey little corners, as out of the way and sleepy and ill-served by rail as anyone could wish. I found it first on a day in October, and walked out from the grinding machinery of the station by a field path running through broad acres of purple-brown loam, over which plough horses tramped and turned. It was a strange and arresting sight, for over the dark rich mold there was drawn a veil of shimmering grey light whiter and less earthly than any mist or dew. The whole plough land was alive with gossamer, and old woking lay beyond the gossamer as if that magic veil were meant to shield it from the engines and the smoke. Old woking, indeed, lies in country deep enough to forget the railway altogether, and to take to the water as the highway. The way wanders in and out by the village, and half a mile away at Send the navigation canal joins the way proper, as the little river has come to be called to distinguish it from the canal. The canal cuts business-like corners and straight lines when the way, having plenty of time to spare, wants to wander an extra two or three miles about a field. From Send to Weybridge or to Guilford, downstream, or up, by the canal towing path or by boat, is a delightful journey in spring or summer. As good a round as can be taken walking is from Woking through Send by Newark Priory, Perford, and Wisley to Biflate, where the railway can be joined or the journey continued to Weybridge or back to Woking. But there are, of course, twenty ways of seeing the little villages that cluster round the way so closely in this corner of Surrey, either on foot or by boat, or rowing and walking both. But Woking has not always been quiet and old-fashioned and sleepy. Once it was a royal manor, and contained a royal residence. William the Conqueror held Woking in domain himself, and it passed through the hands of every king until James I, who gave it to one of his foresters, Sir Edward Zush. Sir Edward had to pay something for his privilege. He held the manor on condition that he was to bring to the king's table, on the feast of St. James each year, the first dish at dinner, and with the dish the satisfactorily large rent of a hundred pounds in coined gold of the realm. Perhaps he still made something out of his tenants, at all events, a further token of gratitude, he was to wind a call in Woking Forest on Coronation Day. He may have liked the rental, but he could not have liked the old palace, for he knocked down every brick of it. The strangest and most melancholy fate seems to wait on every palace in Surrey built or lived in by an English king even by the friend of a king. Of Oatlands, Guilford, Woking, none such, Sheen, each a king's palace, scarcely a stone remains, Wolsey's palace by the mole is nothing but a gateway, the archbishop's palace at Croydon has sunk as low as a wash house. Kingston owns the stone on which English kings have been crowned, but elsewhere in Surrey the royal hand has touched only to destroy. 
a persistent association hangs to the name of the town by the station, undeserved but traditional. Woking, like the Duke of Plazatoro, likes an interment. Much of the land near the town is owned by a company which, while it builds villas for the living, especially those who find advantages in a fast train service, has named itself Necropolis, which is grim enough for anybody living or dead. But the Necropolis Company, whether it knows it or not, did not found the tradition. That stands to the record of an old gravedigger interviewed by Aubrey. He conversed grimly and with authority on the places and seasons for the proper digging of graves. He had a rule from his father to know when not to dig a grave. That was when he found a certain plant about the bigness of the middle of a tobacco pipe, which came near the surface of the earth, but never above it. It is very tough, and about a yard long, the rind of it is almost black, and tender, so that when you pluck it, it slips off and underneath is red, it hath a small button at the top, not much unlike the top of an asparagus, of these he sometimes finds two or three in a grave. He was sure it was not a fern root and had with diligence traced to its root, and since he had satisfied himself of its grisly origin, he knew better than to dig a grave near where the root grew. View from the bridge, Woking. View from the bridge, Woking. On the map send looks like a single tiny village, south of Woking by half a mile. It is in reality a large parish, and since the name is corrupted simply from sand, it is natural enough to find it dotted all round the neighborhood with other names tacked onto it send Holm, send Grove, send Hurst, send Heath, and send Marsh. The names are scattered only less widely than the parish itself. The church stands a mile from the little hamlet of Send, on the banks of the Way, like the churches of Perford and Woking, and the ruins of the great priory of Newark, to which Send Church and her chapel at Ripley both belonged. The three villages with their churches are still, perhaps, not much larger than they were two or three hundred years ago, the priory is shattered, only the village with the chapel has grown. By Send Churchyard stands the bowl of a mighty elm, ribbon and iron bound. I like to imagine that it may have been climbed by one of the great Surrey cricketers of the old days of the Hambledon Club. Edward Stevens, the famous Lumpy, was born at Sand, and spent his boyhood there till he went to Chertsey and became, as John Noren describes him, one of the two greatest bowlers he ever saw. Lumpy got his queer name either because he was, in Noren's words, a short man, round-shouldered and stout or, according to another tradition, because at one of the dinners of the Hambledon Club he ate an apple pie whole. Surely he must have been lumpy before, besides after, that achievement. Yet another story has it that he was given his name because of some trick in his bowling. Certainly his methods were not what we should call exactly orthodox today. It was the privilege of visiting elevens in his day to choose the pitch on which the match should be played, and that was Lumpy's opportunity. Noren explains his plan. He would invariably choose the ground where his balls would shoot, instead of selecting a rising spot to bowl against, which would materially have increased the difficulty to the hitter, seeing that so many more would be caught out by the mounting of the ball. As, however, nothing delighted the old man like bowling the wicket down with a shooting ball, he would sacrifice the other chances to the glory of that achievement. Many a time have I seen our general twig this prejudice in the old man when matched against us, and chuckle at it. But I believe it was almost the only mistake he ever made, professional or even moral, for he was a most simple and amiable creature. There is an unkind legend which speaks of Lumpy as a bit of a smuggler in his young days, but Noren, at all events, never believed it, for he ends by declaring handsomely that he had no trick about him, but was as plain as a pike staff in all his dealings. Lumpy, whether he smuggled or not, certainly has his niche in cricket history. It was to him that the wicket owes its third stump. In a match played in 1775 on the Portsmouth Artillery Ground, between five of the Hambledon Club and five of All England, Lumpy three times sent the ball between the last Hambledon man's stumps without bowling him, and after the match, which Hambled in one in consequence, the number of the stumps was increased from two to three. Send lies deep among the fields, counting itself fortunate, perhaps, 
that it is not on the Ripley Road, a mile away. Ripley itself, perhaps, owes its fortune, even if it owes more besides, to the road which it has named. The story belongs to all the villages of a great highway. The coaches brought their heyday, the railway spoiled it, the bicycle remade it, and now the village is being redecorated by the motor car. The Ripley Road, for the two days in the week when it is most used, is a place to avoid. Yet it can be beautiful, and there is an approach to it hardly equaled near any other highway in the county. The late Mrs. Buxton, of Fox Warren Park, above Wisley Common, for years permitted the public to walk and drive through her private grounds away from the high road, and that generous lady's permission has been continued by her successor. The carriage drive runs by oaks and bracken through which pheasants rustle, past a strange, tall column of blackwood a totem pole brought from Queen Charlotte's Islands, then it rises to the edge of a ridge overlooking a wide and level stretch of pinewood and heather. In August, when the ling is out with the bell heather, and the pines stand deep in fern and rushes, no lovelier carpet spreads under any Surrey hill. The road runs a white thread through it a road best viewed from afar. The weight of wheels has ground the surface to powder. Ripley itself, but for the traffic, would be the prettiest village on the road. A long string of low-roofed houses lines the highway, little white gabled cottages offer tea and refreshment, two old inns share most, I suppose, of the custom of fasting travelers. The anchor, an inn of many gables, has fixed itself in the affections of bicyclists since the days when they rode velocipedes, and its black-beamed walls and passages hold drawings of strange souls mounted on wheels which would have scared Ixion. The Talbot, which was once the dog, but a Talbot is a dog always, is a house of imposing squareness. You may see the dog painted above the door, a liver and white fox terrier, all proper. Opposite the inn stretches Ripley Green, a broad and shining level with many memories of Surrey cricket, and in particular of Lumpy Stevens, of Send. The Village Street, Ripley. The Village Street, Ripley. The motor car has brought prosperity, even if it is a prosperity that can soil. But the tarnish washes off in night and rain. Ripley may look its best early on a Saturday morning, before the flood rushes down the road. When the little village lies clean and fresh in the sun, and the inns are busy with white tablecloths and cooking potatoes, and the children sit on the edge of the green before the dust comes, there is a sense of orderly bustle and of waiting for a day of hard work and good money that is pleasant enough. One building only has suffered from the business of the road. The little church stands behind arches and canopies of clipped yew, its walls almost touching the highway. It is an interesting little building, though much altered from its oldest form, the chancel has the remains of clustered pillars, and a beautiful string course of seen stone running round it. But those have not been the only attractions to visitors. When I was there I noticed that the oak collection box by the door stood with its lid propped open. The caretaker happened to be in the church, and I showed it to her. Oh yes, she said in a matter-of-fact tone, we have to keep it like that. It has been robbed so often that we prop it open, so as to prevent people putting anything in. The church door still remains as wide open as the box. It would be a pious act for some passing motor car or a collection from many to present the little church with a stronger box. Such continued hospitality, so vilely abused, deserves a return. Trees on the Green, Ripley Trees on the Green, Ripley Two miles up the road lies the hut pond, opposite an inn that serves many tables. There is no quiet on the pond in the business of the day, but I was once on it on an October evening, and as the sun went down the sky filled suddenly with teal. Bunches of teal wheeled and circled in the cold twilight, whizzed down among the rushes, darted up again and round over the pines, then shot down again and settled, splashing quietly in the sedge. Priest's Door and Norman Chancel Ripley Church Priest's Door and Norman Chancel Ripley Church Ockham Village, with its church and park, is southeast of Ripley by a mile or so. The charm of Ockham Church lies in its tower, its east window, and its deep and happy site among the oaks and elms of Ockham Park. The church lies some hundred yards from the road, 
under the windows of the manor house, a building which cannot be said to owe anything to the taste or consistency of successive architects. The tower is 13th century, buttressed, modeled into cool grays and pinks, and heavy with ivy. But the chief decoration of Occam Church is its 13th century, seven lancet east window, and in the carving of the capitals of its slender columns of black Sussex marble. There is some quaint Flemish glass in one of the south windows, but the church is spoiled by an extraordinarily ugly little chapel built on the north side as a mausoleum for the family of the kings. The first of the line of these kings was one Peter, the son of an Exeter grocer. He came up to London, soon made his mark as a lawyer, and died Lord Chancellor. There are several of his descendants buried with him, and their coronets hang above the arch of the chapel. They add a peculiar tawdriness, but the chapel itself, with its dull blue paint, and the strange, bath-like sarcophagus below Rizbrakis statues of the first Lord King and his lady, is the main offense. Occam Church Occam Church Occam itself, even with that humming white highway not a mile distant, is untouched and unspoiled, nothing more than a half dozen or so of half-timbered or brick cottages and farm buildings, rain-bleached and creeper-veiled, and fronted with some of the prettiest and brightest gardens in Surrey. One of the sleepy little buildings bears the legend County Police, forbidding in new blue enamel. What should anyone do with police in Occam? But Occam, perhaps, lies a little too far from the old waterway to join the group of villages and churches which cluster along this winding stretch of way. Still it belongs to Ripley, if not to Ripley's group along the river. Rivers, here, would be the better word, for the way has hardly yet made up its mind as to its right channel north of Woking, and by Ripley runs actually in seven streams almost parallel with one another, some of them cut artificially, but others tiny remnants of the broad watercourse which once rolled through Surrey to the sea. No doubt it was this abundance of water which first attracted the founder of Newark Priory, whose ruins stand almost in the center of the seven streams. The monks must have had plenty of choice of fishing. Newark Priory is generally supposed to have been founded as a house of black cannons by Ruel de Calva and his wife Beatrice de Sandys in the reign of Richard I. But Ruel de Calva as a fact only refounded or endowed the house, which was founded long before, probably by a bishop of Winchester. Its older name was Aldbury and Newark, or Newstead, as it was once called which for us is an aged ruin, was Aldbury rebuilt with a new church and a new name. It is in some ways a rather uninteresting ruin. Of the tracery of the windows, or any of the lighter and more delicate architectural work, not a stone remains. I believe much of the more easily used stonework found its way into the building of neighboring houses, perhaps into the paving of the roads. But it has a certain bluntness and gauntness of its own, standing solid and stark in the plain meadowland of the way. Perhaps if one were to visit it by the pale moonlight it would take on darker graces and dignities. As it is, there is somewhere about it an air of protest, it is like a ghost that cannot get back before daylight. Horses gallop about the rough field under its walls, boating parties wonder why it should be thought worthwhile to fence it off with wire. Once I caught an echo of the real Newark, late on a dark and stormy afternoon, when a sudden snipe rose at my feet out of one of the half-dry priory stew ponds. That wild cry must have been familiar enough to the old monks wandering by the stream in search of a likely run for perch or pike. The very old castle which Frank Buckland, the naturalist, mentions in the following note, taken from his edition of White Selborne, must surely be Newark Priory, which is now a happy, and I think unmolested, home of Jack Dawes. Newark Priory Newark Priory At Whistley, near Weybridge, the people go in May, when the birds are about a fortnight old, to the ruins of a very old castle. Men carry long ladders, and with blunt iron hooks take out the young jackdaws, and if there are no buyers they throw them to the ground. Bird dealers take hampers down to Whistley and bring up all the birds caught, as many as ten dozen of young jackdaws. They cost on the spot twos. Per dozen. The reason why they are taken is to stop the increase of jackdaws in the neighborhood. If the young jackdaws are taken when about a fortnight old, 
the old ones will not go to nest again that season. If the eggs only were taken, the birds would lay again immediately. The canal and the way by Newark lie in some of the quietest and wildest country in Surrey. It is not the wildness of Thursday Sleigh Common, or the quiet of the pine woods, but it is the sunny peace of a waterway almost deserted, of unpluffed, rushy meadows, of waterside paths and thickets that fill in April and May with a tide of bird life which stays here, and elsewhere passes or is hardly seen. A May morning on the way canal rings with singing. You can count scores of cuckoos gliding in the sun and calling from the budding branches, woodpeckers laugh from oak to oak, plovers tumble in the wind, herons flap up lazily at a bend in the stream, and flap lazily down again, snipe cut high arcs in the blue and drum down from the sailing clouds, perhaps from the very heart of the thicket the nightingale bursts into a pulsing riot of song. Surrey varies extraordinarily widely as a shelter and a nesting ground for birds, but most of its birds, I think, know the Way Canal. Of the seven streams which surround Newark Abbey the northernmost runs under the little hill on which stands Perford Church. Perford itself, on its outskirts, unhappily, is beginning to hear woking. The woking builder's hammer is already ringing under its trees. But the heart of Perford hitherto remains untouched. A cluster of red brick farm buildings, a footpath over meadows of buttercups, a score of arching elms, and a little shingle-spired Norman church on a knoll above the stream Perford is one of the smallest and sweetest of wayside villages. Few churches have so strong an impression of an untouched past. In plan it is scarcely altered from its Norman design of the 12th century, and it stands on its knoll overlooking the meadows away to the great priory of which it was a chapel, the priory in ruins, and itself with hardly a stone loosened for nearly eight centuries. The roof is later than the walls, but there is a fascination in staring up at the old oak timber. It was the same vista of retreating beams of mighty wood on which the eye of the Newark priest droning from the altar must have rested, perhaps for his sleepy congregation there was the same glimpse of ivy tendrils creeping in under the eaves, and on drowsy afternoons in May the same chatter and hiss of nesting starlings. From the scanty scraps of the paintings on the wall you can only guess vaguely at the texts of the old Sunday sermons, manna falls in the wilderness, Moses brings water out of the rock, probably the congregation listened with most eagerness to the third, the death of Jezebel. Mill on the way, between Perford and Ripley. Mill on the way, between Perford and Ripley. Dunn, the poet, perhaps knew the paintings well. In the days when he was still unforgiven by Sir George Moore of Lazuli for having run away with his daughter Anne, he and his bride lived for some years as the guests of Sir John Woolley, Queen Elizabeth's secretary, at Perford Park may it not have been the seven-streamed way by Perford which gave him his stanzas for the bait, his parody of Marlowe, Come live with me, and be my love, and we will some new pleasures prove of golden sands and crystal brooks, with silken lines and silver hooks. Let others freeze with angling reeds, and cut their legs with shells and weeds or treacherously poor fish beset with strangling snare, or windowy net. Let coarse bold hands from slimy nest the bedded fish in banks outrest, or curious traders, sleep silk flies, bewitch poor fish's wandering eyes. For thee, thou need st no such deceit, for thou thyself art thine own bait, that fish, that is not catch thee thereby, alas! is wiser far than I. Perfect Church. Perfect Church. Two miles further down the canal perhaps nearly four by the way itself stands another little church, almost, like Perford and Woking, on the edge of the stream. Wisley Church is the tiniest of the little group between Send and the Thames, but is not otherwise remarkable. The village is not much more than a farmhouse and a noble barn, perhaps Wisley is better known for its pond and its garden. The garden, unhappily, is almost a thing of the past. Experiment and officialdom have settled heavily on its sandy soil, and the wilder charm of the old pleasance has left it. A few years ago, when its late owner, Mr. Wilson of Weybridge, was alive, it was a delight to many hundreds of visitors, whom the owner generously allowed to share in his pleasure in rare and beautiful flowers. He had collected into a few acres of ground, protected by ingeniously laid-out plantations, an almost incredible variety of plants, 
especially flowering bulbs, and in his woods and ponds, besides, had tried to establish other curious and interesting wildlife. Bird boxes fastened to the trees were to tempt tits and nuthatches, in the reeds of the ponds great bullfrogs used to squat croaking, and little green frogs climbed the leaves above them. Today that is hardly more than a memory. When the owner died the garden was bought by Sir Thomas Hanbury and presented to the Royal Horticultural Society. The society came down from Kew upon the fold, and on the open ground beside the old garden, tangled and unhappy, set down a row of superb glass houses, planted a number of specimen fruit trees, and devoted itself forthwith to up-to-date research and education on the most approved lines of modern scientific arboriculture and hybridization in hothouses. Wisley Church Wisley Church Last of the little bunch of wayside churches is Biflate, with a belfry built on some magnificent oak beams. Biflate Manor House used to be a royal hunting lodge, and was given with the right of free warren by Edward II to Piers Gaveston. Its last royal owner was James I's Queen, Anne of Denmark, and it was probably she who built the massive walls and the forecourt of the garden of the present home. But the manor house itself is early Georgian, and though it has had some ugly additions, it still stands square and strong behind its fine old gateway. James is supposed to have planted the Scotch firs in the garden, to remind Queen Anne of the home she left behind her in the north. Such a building would be sure to have some quaint traditions. It is known locally as the King's House, and there is a legend that Henry VIII was nursed there. He may have been, but not in the present building. It has no regular ghosts, but Miss Frances Mitchell, writing on the history of the manor in the Surrey Archaeological Collections, tells us that Anne of Denmark is said to have been seen moving through the lower rooms, and there is a very dim tradition of a dwarf in purple velvet who wanders in the forecourt. A third legend, in which the rustic historian apparently confuses Anne of Denmark with the last Stuart Queen, relates that Queen Anne came to Biflate and from a neighboring hill watched Marlborough win the Battle of Blenheim. Chapter 21 Richmond and Q. The woking of the Surrey Thames peasants in the field ham house the cabal Petersham Richmond Hill the heart of Midlothian deer in the sunlight Queen Elizabeth dying Q Palace the secret of the gardens. Woking is the center to which it is difficult not to return in exploring the way and the way villages, Surbiton is the center of the roads about the Surrey Thames. Surbiton has tramways besides a railway, and Surbiton station is perhaps the most convenient starting point either for Hampton Court on the Middlesex Bank, or for Kingston, or through Kingston to Ham and Richmond and Kew. Kingston, in one direction, has its own chapter, so have the Dittons and Walton in another, beyond Kingston lies a walk, not often taken, perhaps, along the river bank to Ham and Petersham, a walk that leads to Richmond Park and its deer dozing among the bracken in the afternoon sun, and Kew Gardens waiting in the evening the best hour of all the day among those ordered flowers and trees. I never saw him until one day, walking out from Kingston, I suddenly found myself in the fruitful spaces of market gardens and farms. It is the suddenest change. Kingston, with the oldest memories of all Surrey towns, is as new and noisy as a thoroughly efficient service of tramways can make it, and then, within a stone's throw of bricks and barracks, you come upon acres beyond acres of level farmland, bean fields and cabbage fields and all the pleasantness of tilled soil and trenched earth and the wealth of kindly fruits. When I saw the fields by ham on a hot day in August there were country women gathering runner beans into coarse aprons, stooping over the clustered plants, the humblest and hardiest of workers of the farm. Under that hot sun, in the wide spaces of those unfenced fields, with no English hedge to shut off neighboring crops and tillage, the air of those bent, Lowly figures was of French peasantry, French nearness to the difficult livelihood of the soil. They might have gleaned for millet, they should cease their work at the Angelus. Richmond Bridge Richmond Bridge Teddington Lock, a mile downstream from Kingston suburbs, joins Surrey to Middlesex and the tide to the tideless river with a vast piece of engineering. Further down, Eel Pie Island breaks the stream, a bunch of chairs, tables, and trees, where, for all I know, others may still eat and praise eel pie. But the fascination of this stretch of river is on the Surrey bank, 
where Ham House stands among noble trees. Ham House is not a show house, and indeed, considering its nearness to Richmond and London, it would be impossible that it should be. There are limits to the claims which may be made upon owners of historic houses who may also wish to live in them. But Ham House holds other magnets than its pictures and relics of Stuarts and Lauderdales. The guidebooks catalog the pictures, and perhaps I need not copy the catalogs. The real fascination is Ham House with its history, the meeting place of the great cabal. But you may see that Ham House from a distance, the house as the Duke of Lauderdale saw it from the river bank, or driving to the door to join his fellow ministers, the garden front, with its statue of Father Thames, the statue at which Buckingham and Arlington used to stare, perhaps, wondering how much longer their sinister power would be left to them. All that they knew and saw day by day remains the dull red brick, the wrought iron gate, the quaint statuary of the walls, and round the garden walls and shading the wide lawn behind the house, the trees as later, gentler souls saw them, Thompson, walking from his Richmond cottage, and Hood, strolling under the long avenue of elms. Petersham has riverside houses which would dignify Georgian aldermen, square red houses set about with wisteria and high garden walls, worthy to be neighbors of Richmond Park, worthy, too, of a handsomer neighbor than Petersham Church, an insignificant little building which yet was thought sufficient for the dust of the Duchess of Lauderdale. Outside in the churchyard lies the sailor who sought for the Northwest Passage and named Vancouver's Island. The Thames from Richmond Hill The Thames from Richmond Hill Of Richmond Park, and the view from Richmond Terrace, and the departed glories of Richmond's palace which was the Palace of Sheen, what should be said? How should the beauty of the view from the terrace be measured? Scott has set it in the pages of the heart of Midlothian, and Scott, perhaps, thought it the loveliest and richest of English landscapes. It was a huge sea of verdure, with crossing and intersecting promontories of massive and tufted groves. It was tenanted by numberless flocks and herds, which seemed to wander unrestrained and unbounded through the rich pastures. The Thames, here turreted with villas and there garlanded with forests, moved on slowly and placidly, like the mighty monarch of the scene, to whom all its other beauties were but accessories, and bore on its bosom an hundred barks and skiffs, whose white sails and gaily fluttering pennons gave life to the whole. That was the scene which was shown to Jeanie Deans, arrived at Richmond to sue for pardon for her sister, by the Duke of Argyll. We have nothing like it in Scotland, said the Duke of Argyll. Is that the secret? Is it because it is all that is typical of South Country greenness and the peace of broad water and deep woodlands that it made its appeal to the Scot used to grey crags and barren moorland? Or is its chief appeal not to the Scot but to the Londoner, and does the Londoner praise Sir Walter's taste because Sir Walter has praised his? That is part of the story of the beauty of the Richmond view, perhaps. It is so easily found from London. It has all that the Londoner loves to look at. It is the country as he wishes to see it. A glorious stretch of luxuriant woodland, a noble breadth of shining water, sunlight on wide meadows, but above all, setting a difference between this orderly beauty and the wild splendors of some western or northern moorland valley, the presence of befriending, comrade man. The boats, the sails, the swans, the water flashing on the oars, the neighboring roofs, the patterned flower gardens, the comforts of hotels at hand, the readiness with which it is all one and enjoyed those are some of the secrets of the ideal. It is the country seen from an outdoor theater. Palace Yard, Richmond Palace Yard, Richmond Richmond Park itself would be worth visiting for any countryman because of its deer. Deer standing about in the bracken, deer asleep in thick fern under great oaks, deer feeding slowly upwind on a distant slope of green, Deer leaping shadows of tree stems one after another as if the shadows were water, which is one of the deer's prettiest games in the sun, deer trotting off as you try to come nearer to them, with that curious quivering, shaking amble which is born of lissom daintiness and muscles like steel, deer with hot sunlight on their coats it is the Richmond Park deer. Which are the creatures to come and see? How many are there? Who should count them? 1600 fallow deer and 50 red deer, the figures are given, 
Farnham Park, I think, comes next in Surrey, with 300 fallow deer. The Great Palace has left little more than an archway on Richmond Green. More history belongs to it, or rather to the succession of palaces which have stood at Sheen, which was the old name, than I can deal with. Edward III died at Sheen Palace, unloved and alone. Richard II's queen, Anne of Bohemia, died there seventeen years later, and Richard in his grief threw the palace down. It was rebuilt by Henry V, burnt down in 1497, rebuilt and renamed Richmond by Henry VII, then the Richmond who named it died in his new palace. But the overmastering sense of unhappiness which somehow has set itself about the story of Richmond Palace belongs to the closing days of Elizabeth. Elizabeth's death, and the month that went before it, patch English history like a week of night. She had been so strong, so untiring, so wise in her council chamber and so magnificent in her victorious fleet, and the fortune that followed her like a wind, the life of her body had been so unfailing, she had jested, wittily and coarsely, with so many courtiers, she had commanded the chivalry of young and splendid nobles, she had lived to see one of her favorites die and to send another to the block, and now she herself was dying. She knew it, and she would not hear of death. She was never so ready for the gaiety she could not enjoy. Her strength left her, she was a skeleton, still she sat with her dress unchanged, staring before her, flashing sudden rages at her ministers, rallying at the mention of an heir's name. Beecham, heir to the suffix, they put forward, she cried out he was the son of a rogue. The King of Scots? They asked, she answered nothing. Dead, propped among her pillows, an old woman in rough and stays, the memory of her last day's shadows Richmond Palace like a drawn blind. Richmond Hill. Richmond Hill. To the north beyond Richmond Hill and the huge hotel, twice burnt down, which looks over the woods and the river, one may come by tramways and railways to Kew and Kew Gardens. Kew, too, once had a palace, or an attempt at a palace. Frederick Prince of Wales, George III's father the prince who did so much for Surrey cricket, and died, perhaps, from the blow of a cricket ball lived at Kew House, and so did George III after him. George III pulled down Kew House in 1803, and built another, to be not less royal, George IV pulled that down. A smaller building, vaguely named Kew Palace still, stands in the gardens, Queen Charlotte died there, you may see the room, and look, if you wish, on the tables and sofas she knew. But the pictures in Kew Palace were not all Queen Charlotte's, they are catalogued today, and so are many manuscripts and autograph letters of royal persons which attract careful readers. From remarks which can be overheard in those somber rooms, many visitors, I think, imagine the paintings of still life, of flowers in vases, odd representations of game and fruit, and so forth, to have been selected and hung in the house as specially suitable for public gardens. The portraits of royal gentlemen in blue and red puzzle them, why should they be shown these at Kew? These are for palaces and galleries, Kew is for a flower show. What is the chief, the compelling fascination of Kew Gardens? What is it that sets Kew apart, not more beautiful than other gardens, but different from them, with a different attraction peculiarly its own? Is it the sense of change from roaring streets to quiet lawns, noble trees, spaces, and sense of grass and flowers? There may be a sense of change, but that is not all the secret, for Q keeps the same charm for one who has come fresh from the broad aisles and avenues of some great country garden. Is it the rarity and the wealth of the Q museums and houses the orchid houses with their strange, lovely, uncanny inflorescences, flowers that have fancies and willfulnesses, flowers that would people the dark with faces, or the lily houses and the superb Victoria Regia that would cradle a water baby, or the great palm houses, where you may walk in a gallery among enormous leaves and tropical creepers as if you were back again with your grandfathers in the treetops. That is an attraction, but it is not all of it. Nor is it the achievement of the gardens in the separate spheres of gardening. The sheets of crocuses in the low March sunlight, and of daffodils shaking in an April wind, add a glory to the spring at Kew, 
but it is a glory that can belong to other lawns and other vistas of flowers. The Q Rose Garden has a wealth of roses, but it has, too, a wealth of old tree stems and broken branches which a garden meant for nothing but roses would hide. The herbaceous border grows luxuriant phloxes and delphiniums, but the background of glass houses sets a wrong light about it. The rock garden shows more rock and fewer masses of alpine flowers than other English gardens more lately made, with better knowledge of what wall and rock flowers need. Then what is the abiding charm? To me, at all events, Kew has much the same appeal as the Londoner finds in Richmond Hill. It is a London garden, the garden of a town, perfectly made for its purpose. It can never, even with its glorious trees and its wide spaces of grass, have the peace or know the spirit of a country garden. Too many feet tread its lawns, too many voices chatter in its walks. It may spread its wild flowers and grow its curious blossoms for those who know where and how to look for them, but its main effects must be of ordered gravel, of shaven grass, of patterned beds, of flowers that will suit artificial lakes and buildings and stone balustrades. The keynote of Q is by the wide pond, with the smooth green turf and the white stone, and the masses of pansies and heliotrope and brilliant red geraniums. Those are the flowers which suit best the steps down to the water, and the fountains, and the swimming ducks and the birds on the banks. There is the right touch of artificiality about them, the right note of London. The birds are Londoners themselves. The stately brown geese stalk over the lawns careless of poulterers or punt guns. The cormorant, who most certainly knows he is being watched, dives to show off before admiring children. Even the blackbirds have forgotten their country habits, and will sing when country blackbirds are silent for the year. Once, late in July, I heard four singing in evening sunshine after rain. They would take any countryman back to the days of chestnut blossom and the scent of Surrey May, but that indolent melody, in July sunshine, belongs to London. Q Church Q Church Chapter 22 Kingston Kingston Old and New The Stone The Sextons Escape Throwing Over The Church Ducking A Scold Aaron Evans Is Shot At A Cormorant The Dog Whipper A Feast Of The Church Lord Francis Villers Is Fight Kingston 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 Has Kept Little Of The Past An Old Ale House, Old Alms Houses, An Old Staircase, An Old Roof Or Two By The Market Place, And An Old Chapel, Lovekins, Standing Apart The Survivals Are The Loneliest Things. Lovekins, once a chapel, and now a school, is one of the links. Gibbon was a scholar there, and Gibbon belongs doubly to Surrey, he was born at Putney. But the changes at Kingston have made it almost all new, and the changes have come quickly. Only three or four years ago the quaint, small heroine had two companions, the anglers and the three compasses, one with a fireside corner to war mail and tell grandfather's tales in, the other with traditions of highwaymen and the road. They were pulled down. In Market Place there was once a fine Tudor house, the Castle Inn. The noble staircase remains, a good, thoroughgoing piece of carving of Bacchus and full casks, the house has gone. The church is old enough to have seen these and other losses, but the church is a mixed building, the tower, or most of it, is 18th century brick. Only one spot in the open streets of the town, I think, keeps an air of Kingston as the customers of the castle in may have known it, and that is the little byway through which runs the water splash of the Hogsmill River. Cart horses standing in the ford, and bare-legged children fishing for minnows, are what Kingston saw in the old days. The stone remains, the stone on which tradition says that the Anglo-Saxon kings were crowned. Once it stood in the chapel of St. Mary, a Saxon building adjoining the church, but St. Mary's Chapel fell in 1730. It was moved to the marketplace, afterwards in 1854, to the open space where it now stands opposite the courthouse, on the very spot, they say, where there was once an Anglo-Saxon palace. The railing which surrounds it has been described as of Saxon-like design, and perhaps that should suffice. On the pedestal which bears up the stone are the names of the kings who were crowned on it, Edward the Elder, Ethelstan, Edmund, Edred, Edwig, 
Edward the Martyr, and Ethelred the Unready. What is the King's Stone? A Morristane, the archaeologists tell you, one of a circle of stones, on which the chief sat in council with his great men, the predecessors of the Anglo-Saxon chiefs would have been archdruids, perhaps, or pontiff kings, acclaimed by ancient Britain centuries before the Romans set foot in Kent. Kingston Bridge Kingston Bridge Kingston Church, if its architecture is confused and much of it modern, has an imposing solemnity about it, and it contains some strange memorials. One is a stone fragment, on which the grateful survivor of an accident and a ruin has painted the words life preserved. She was Hester Hammerton, daughter of Abram Hammerton, sexton of the church, and in 1729 she was helping her father to dig a grave in the churchyard near the Saxon chapel of St. Mary. They dug too near the chapel foundations, and the chapel fell in upon them. The sexton was killed, almost on the spot, his daughter was saved through the jamming of a piece of stone, and survived him as sexton for fifteen years. Another memorial is a brass kept in the vestry, a long screed begins dismally enough ten children in one grave a dreadful sight, but the verse is unequal to the opportunity. Another brass shows Robert Skern and his wife Joan, she, according to Manning and Bray, was a daughter of Alice Purrers, mistress of Edward III. A fourth monument, said to be in the chancel, but I did not find it, praises Mrs. Mary Morton, daughter of the wife of Robert Honeywood, of Charinga, Kent, she was the wonder of her sex and this age, for she lived e to see near four hundred issued from her loins. So Aubrey describes it, and so, with variations, the local historian. Mrs. Mary Morton died in 1620. Aubrey has another record of the giants of those days. He had heard of one Wiltshire of the Feathers Inn at Kingston, who was a great thrower. He would stand in the churchyard and throw a stone over the weathercock, he would also throw a stone over the Thames, by the bridge, and struck the pails on the town side, which, I think, was not so difficult as the other throw. He was then of middle stature, and about thirty years of age. But if he had grown to greater stature? The weathercock of those days is no more, or we might measure the throw. Kingston has other history besides its coronation stone and its monuments. The parish registers have added pictures of its past. Here is one of two poor women allowed to beg at the church. February 1571. 24 Sunday was here I.J. Women the mother and doubter Ode of Ireland she called Eleanor Salve to gather upon the death of her house band a gentleman slain amongst the wild Irish being captain of gully glasses and gathered aged. Here is a record of a Thames flood, October 9, 1570. Thursday at NYGHT rose a great wind and rain that the temps rose so high that the NYGHT row WT bots out of the temps a great way into the marketplace and upon a sodane. In the year 1572 Kingston got a new cooking stool, the Kingston scolds had become past bearing. It cost one pound threes. 4D and as soon as it was finished there was a very shrewish woman ducked in it. 1572 August On Tuesday being the 19th day of this month of August Downing with to Downing a grave maker of this parish she was set on a new cooking stall made of a great height and so brought a boat the market place to Thames Bridge and there had IIJ duckings overhead and eries because she was a common scolda and fighter. Here are extracts from the burial registers. June 4th 1593 John Akerley went to bathe Heimself and was drowned and buried. August 25. 1598 William Hall was bared being shot by Thafis when he was constable at Cobbler's Hall. September 28. 1623 Richard Ratliff a London inner which was slain. January 17, 1623 slash 4 W.M. Foster son of W.M. a goer about. This is hardly a burial. July 11. 1629 a bird called a cormorant light on the top of the steeple and Aaron Evans shot, but missed it. Here are items from the church warden's accounts. The parish dog whipper had become an institution. 
1561 to Falcon for de year, half a year, WHYPPYNG of dogs out of the church. Aged. 1578 to write for beating the dogs out of the church, for half a year. VJD. But the Morris dance it was the dances that Kingston would spend money upon. There were two kinds of games which brought gifts to the church, May Games, and the Kingham. What sort of a game the Kingham was nobody knows, but it brought the church wardens most of their money, four or five pounds was a good collection. But the expenses could be heavy, there were shoes for the Morris dancers, six pairs at 8D. A pair, there was silver paper for the dance, 8D, and there were for the feast, besides other drinking, a quarter of malt, 4S, 5 goes, geese, 15d, eggs, 6d, lamb, 18d, sugar, cloves, and mace, 11d, small raisins, 3d, saffron, 2d, vinegar and salt, 3d, 2 cocks, 18d, 2 calves, 5s, 8d, sheep, 12d, lamb, 16d, quarter of veal, 8d, quarter of mutton, 60, leg of veal and a neck, 40. The Morris dancers did well, with silver paper and new shoes, but the church kept a feast. Kingston has the credit of the first and the last battles in the parliamentary wars, but the claim is a little shaky. There was an affair of outposts between Rupert's cavalry and some parliamentarian troops between Oatlands and Kingston Bridge in the year 1642 after Edgehill but it was not a battle. The real battle of Kingston came six years later, and ended all the warfare that Surrey saw. That was the battle which crushed Lord Holland's scheme of raising London for the king. We shall meet Lord Holland at Reigate, but the fighting belongs to Kingston. Holland, who had planned a rising on Banstead Downs, and had hoped to capture and hold Reigate Castle, was in full retreat. At Reigate he had feared to hold the position he had taken up, he retreated on Dorking, and from Dorking, pursued by Major Audley of Livesey's horse, he fled north. On Kingston Common, a little southeast of where Surbiton today takes train for London, his horse turned on their enemy, his infantry fell back. From each side a few spurred out, playing valiantly, Audley writes. But the Royalists were beaten. Lord Francis Villers, younger brother to the Duke of Buckingham, a boy of great personal beauty, fought alone in their rear. His horse was shot under him, he backed towards an elm, and fought with six of them. They came up behind him, pushed off his helmet and cut him to the ground. Report came to London that he was wounded, and orders were sent out to care for him. But he was found dead, and his pockets were rifled. The evening was the end of the war in Surrey. The Swan, Thames didn't. The Swan, Thames didn't. Chapter 23 The Dittons and Walden Surbit and Trains Thames Ditton Parks for Trotting Ponies of Verlorn Garden The Dandies Fate Graveyard Poetry The Pleasance of a Fairy Giggs Hill Cricket Ditton Tulips Hampton Bridge A Dreary Road Walton The Scolds Bridal John Selwyn and the Stag Terror at an Elephant William Lilly, Astrologer Surbiton is a growth of 70 years, and was born when the railway came. Once it was called a suburb of Kingston, now it has suburbs of its own. Tramways join it to London, the railway empties Surbiton into London every morning and powers London back again in the evening. Nearly 70 trains a day stop at Surbiton on their way down from Waterloo, nearly 80 stop on their way up. It must be quite inspiriting to lose your train, and to know that you have only three minutes to wait, or to catch the train before your train, or to choose which you will have of two trains. Until you realize these figures, it is difficult to understand why so many people are rushing about late for the train in Surbiton Station. They are catching the train before. But Surbiton is not all villas, or perhaps it is, and it would be truer to say that what is not villas within hail of the station is not Surbiton. Thames Ditton lies rather more than a mile away, and Long Ditton, between Thames Ditton and the railway, straggling, too, beyond the railway. Thames Ditton is rapidly becoming rich and prosperous. A few years ago it was a little, twisting main street, a ferry, an inn, or two, and a church, 
and was flanked by two fine properties, Ember Court and Boyle Farm. Now the villa builder has got to work, and the old estates are being sliced up into acres and half acres. Ember Court was once a manor belonging to Henry VIII, who hunted over it, later, it was the property of Sir Arthur Onslow, the first speaker of the House of Commons who earned the title great. It is now a racecourse, trotting ponies and American machines dash and flash where Mr. Speaker sauntered stately, and theatre bills flare at the entrance gates. Boyle Farm has fared little better. Once it was the Duchess of Gloucester's, wife of George III's brother, a century later, Lord St. Leonard's, Lord Chancellor in Lord Derby's first and shortest-lived ministry, had it. Now the park is crisscrossed with brand new yellow roads. I walked through it while it was still ringing with the builder's hammer, and straying off the gravel, suddenly found myself in the forlornest little place possible a formal garden, box-trimmed, tiny, deserted, the narrow, carefully planned beds nothing but weeds, the summer house at the side a ruin. A park cut to pieces looks as if it were in anguish. But a garden cries. The river at Thames Ditton in 1827 saw a festival which was doubtless considered one of the most prodigious affairs of the season. Five young bloods, of whom two were the Lord's Castlereagh and Chesterfield of the day, subscribed £500 each to organise an enormous water party, to which, presumably, everybody was invited who was worth inviting. It was a superb occasion, with illuminations, quadrilles on the lawn, singers from the opera, covers for 500 people, and all adornments proper to such gaiety. Afterwards it came to be known as the Dandy's Fate, and Tom Moore wrote a set of verses about it, which, perhaps, reflect fairly accurately the wit of the company. Here are nine lines out of many accordingly, with gay sultanas, Rebecca's, Sappho's, Roxolana's Circassian slaves, whom love would pay half his maternal realms to ransom, young nuns, whose chief religion lay in looking most profanely handsome, muses in muslin pastoral maids, with hats from the Arcadian shades, and fortune tellers rich, tis plain, as fortune hunters, formed e their train. Moore sent the verses to Mrs. Norton, she, perhaps, was a Circassian or a nun. But Thames Ditton has had its own poet. He has been dignified by the criticism of Charles Lamb, and his accomplishment was the composing of epitaphs. What is the reason, Lamb writes to Wordsworth in 1810, we have no good epitaphs after all. A very striking instance might be found in the churchyard of Ditton-upon-Thames, if you know such a place. Ditton-upon-Thames has been blessed by the residence of a poet, who for love or money, I do not well know which, has dignified every gravestone, for the last few years, with brand new verses, all different, and all ingenious, with the author's name at the bottom of each. This sweet swan of Thames has so artfully diversified his strains and his rhymes, that the same thought never occurs twice, more justly, perhaps, as no thought ever occurs at all, there was a physical impossibility that the same thought should recur. It is long since I saw and read these inscriptions, but I remember the impression was of a smug usher at his desk in the intervals of instruction, leveling his pen. Of death, as it consists of dust and worms and mourners and uncertainty, he had never thought, but the word death he had often seen separate and conjunct with other words, till he had learned to speak of all its attributes as glibly as Unitarian Belsham will discuss you the attributes of the word God in a pulpit, and will talk of infinity with a tongue that dangles from a skull that never reached in thought and thorough imagination two inches, or further than from his hand to his mouth, or from the vestry to the sounding board of the pulpit. But the epitaphs were trim, and sprag, and potent, and pleased the survivors of Thames Ditton above the old mumps imus of affliction sore. The church itself, or at all events the squat and tiny tower, has not altered much since Lamb saw it but the epitaphs have gone. Search among the ivies and use of the shady little churchyard will discover a number of flat, weather-worn slabs of stone, but the verses and the signatures have vanished. Fire and the waste paper man are the common lot of poets, but this swan of Thames has come to his end by rain and hobnails. The only swan that remains is the inn, 
whose sign sits comfortably above the front door, white and bright. Few Thames side inns have a prettier outlook, or look prettier from the river. Sunlight on shining brown boats and quivering willows is a frequent memory of Thames waters, but the swan lies also opposite a ferry, and a ferry has a hundred fascinations. Old-fashioned rowing, running water, hailings and signalings, quiet motion, thriving business, new arrivals, it is all the cheerfulest of riverside traffic. None of the pleasanter services of travel can be more directly rendered and directly paid for than being ferried across a river. Of Surrey Village Greens, the Thames Ditton ground at Giggs Hill has had much to do with Surrey cricket. Giggs Hill cricket has not always been of the most scientific kind, but who shall say it was less enjoyed for that? An old Giggs Hill cricketer tells us how the pitch used to be prepared for a match. I remember, he says, seeing the late Harry style with an old beer barrel fixed on a trolley and filled with water, wheeling it across the wicket. He would well douse the pitch, and after running a small garden roller he had borrowed up and down a few times the wicket was ready. This proceeding took place the day before the match, so that batting must occasionally have been a venturesome business. In those days a match meant what it still means in some villages, an adjournment in the evening to the neighboring inn, a supper, beer, and songs. How many old inns still keep the name the Jolly Cricketers, and how many for little reason? In later days, Thames Ditton cricket has become scientific enough. The Giggs Hill ground has sent to the Oval Cricketers like H. H. Stevenson, who was making centuries for the county in the 60s, in modern times the great Maurice Reed, whom Mr. John Shooter has described as having started a new order among cricket professionals, learned his cricket at Thames Ditton. But the greatest of all Thames Ditton cricketers is, of course, Tom Richardson. He was actually born at Biflate, but played as a boy at Giggs Hill. Thames Ditton's sister, Long Ditton, is probably known by sight by thousands of people who do not know its name. You are looking at the best of Long Ditton when you see Bar's nursery gardens from the train window. There is hardly a month in the year, except in the deep of midwinter, when the Ditton Hill gardens are not full of blossom. They are never more glorious than in May and early June, when the long parterres glow with the tall, late flowering tulips. Of all flowers which have been added to English gardens in the last twenty years, the great thirty-inch tulips seem to me the finest. A giant daffodil can be superb, but it always looks like a giant. But these tulips have the grace of slightness and the majesty of height, their open chalices burn with the heat of jewels and the depth of the heart of wine, and here are ten thousand of them. Perhaps the daffodils, earlier in the year, light the gardens with a fresher luster, but the tulips have the color and the glow. Railways have the good luck to run by many nursery gardens, the tulips at Ditton Hill would help the southwestern to challenge any line. On the other side of Thames Ditton Ferry lies Hampton Court Park, a noble stretch of ordered green. From the ferry to Hampton Court Bridge is a mile by river, and nearly twice as much by road, which runs through East Molesey. There is little of interest in either of the Molesey's, east or west, but it is worth walking a dull mile or two to look downstream from the bridge over Henry VIII's palace, with its yews and elms, dark and stately, in the garden beyond the imposing walls. There is a far more comprehensive view of Hampton Court to be had from the railway or the river, but it is still a fine pile of brick seen downstream from the bridge. Upstream, Hampton Church stands a mile away at the bend of the river, grey in the sunshine, between the church and the bridge is the lock, bright with boats in summer, and the weir, tumbling down a roar of green water to make roach swims and barbel swims for patient fishermen. In the road to the left you may catch sight or sound of one of the London coaches, with its white-hatted driver and painted panels, well named the Vivid. Molsey's roads carry away many of the motor cars that run to Hampton Court, but the old Vivid still jangles hopefully after them. North and west of Molsey runs the ugliest road in Surrey. It begins with the paling running round the Hurst Park racecourse, and it goes on between the ramparts of enormous reservoirs. To stand on the edge of one of these great basins of water, it is strictly forbidden to do so, is to get a new meaning of desolation. They are horribly deep you can see how deep if you stand above one which is half empty, 
the side slope so steeply that if you fell in you could never climb out again, and they are the loneliest stretches of water conceivable. No bird has any need that brings him to water that has no shelter and no food. Once I watched a sunset in November across one of these reservoirs. When the sun sank low the water blackened, the wind drove little waves slapping with foam against the stone bank, a single seagull swept up out of the dark and fled away downwind like a scrap of torn paper, it was the most solitary ending a day could have. The reservoirs by Molsey stretch far back from the river. Nearer the river the birds find them more hospitable. I remember a day in October when I stood watching the martins making one of their last halts on the way south over the reservoirs on the river bank at Surbiton. It was a pouring wet afternoon, there was a high wind, and the rain drove bubbles in the ruffled water and half blotted the greens and greys of blown willows and the russet of thornberries on the far side of the river. A short trolley line ran down a stone pier from beside the road to the edge of the water, where a barge with a bright brown sail waited, the smoke from a clinker fire built in a pierced bucket swept fitfully about the pier, grimy men loaded a car on the trolley line. Over the grey-blue water hundreds of house martins dipped and darted and chattered, my umbrella blew inside out, a few scared birds near me tossed up into the sky and fell down again, joining the hundreds circling and curtsying in the wind and the rain. The road from Molsey runs west to Walton on Thames, where you strike the river high enough to find it running through something like real country. Walton has an interesting old manor house and a Norman church a good deal spoiled by restorers. In the vestry, preserved in a cabinet made out of an old beam from the belfry, is a relic of days when women talk too much of scolds or gossips bridle. It is a sort of cage shaped to fit the head and made of steel, which time has rusted and blackened. A kind of bit is arranged to go into the scold's mouth and hold her tongue, and according to those who have been voluntarily bridled nobody can remember a scold in Walt and it answers its purpose admirably. When the bit is in and the bridle properly padlocked the most vixenish can only utter inarticulate murmurs. Walt and Church Walt and Church Among some curious old brasses in the church is one which commemorates, John Selwyn Gent, Keeper of Her Matisse Park of Atland Vinder Ye Right Honorable Charles Howard Lord Adiral of England His Good Lord and Mister He died on March 22, 1587, and his brass illustrates a remarkable incident. John Selwyn, dressed in a most workmanlike costume like a Scots gilly with a ruff, is shown riding on the back of a stag, into whose throat he is plunging a great hunting knife. Two stories explain the picture. One told in the antiquarian repertory, is that Selwyn, in the heat of the chase, suddenly leaped from his horse upon the back of the stag, both running at that time with their utmost speed, and not only kept his seat gracefully in spite of every effort of the affrighted beast, but, drawing his sword, with it guided him toward the queen, and coming near her presence, plunged it in his throat, so that the animal fell dead at her feet. Another version told locally is that the stag was charging Queen Elizabeth when the keeper rode up, leapt on its back and killed it, but was killed by the stag as it fell. It does not seem impossible. Against the story of the keeper being killed in rescuing the Queen, Mr. F. W. Smith, a local authority, has urged that Queen Elizabeth would hardly have been hunting six weeks after the execution of Mary Queen of Scots, and also when the Armada was almost on its way. But nobody in England, certainly not Drake, ever stopped doing anything because the Armada was coming, and as for hunting six weeks after the death of Mary Queen of Scots, that would be nothing out of the way for Queen Elizabeth. A huge oak, thirty feet in girth, is spoken of as the tree under which the stag was killed at the Queen's feet, but nobody could tell me where it was. There are many superb oaks in the gardens in Walton and Weybridge. Once the whole district was included in Windsor Park. Hidden in a group of obscure cottages stands the old manor house, partly preserved as a curiosity, partly as an addition to a garden. The house was not improved by an experience for some years as a tenement dwelling, crowded with more families than it should have held. It was rescued from that indignity by its present possessor, Mr. Lowther Bridger. Heavy beams, oak panels, and a fine chimney piece remain, relics of the Stuart days when John Bradshaw, president of the council, had the house. Tradition, 
certainly wrongly, says that Bradshaw signed Charles's death warrant in the hall. Bradshaw, no doubt, signed it at Westminster. But the association of his name would be enough for village gossip. The place where they cut off the king's head, is a variant of the story. Above Walton Bridge are Cowway Stakes, where Julius Caesar is supposed to have crossed the Thames in pursuit of Cassivellaunus, king of the Catovellani. The British chief drove sharpened stakes into the bed of the river, to block the ford, and built a palisade along the bank, where he waited for the enemy. They came on, cavalry and infantry, in spite of the stakes. The Catovellani would have met them, but fled in horror at the sight of an armored elephant. A great cricketer is buried in Walton churchyard, and a great astrologer in the church. The cricketer was Lumpy Stevens, whom we met at Send. The astrologer was William Lilly, author of a yearly publication, Merlinus Anglicus Jr., a sort of old Moore's almanac. The prophecies of storms, fires and disasters were as dull reading then as they are now, but one or two entries in his life and times, written by himself, are illuminating, especially his record of family amenities, thus. The 16th of February 1653-4, my second wife died, for whose death I shed no tears. I had 500 liters. With her as a portion, but she and her poor relations spent me 1,000 liters. Gloria Patri and Filio and Spiritui Sancto, Secul erat in principio et nunc et semper, and in secula seculorum, for the 20th of April 1653, these enemies of mine, viz. Parliament men, were turned out of doors by Oliver Cromwell. In October 1654, I married the third wife, who is signified in my nativity by Jupiter in Libra, and she is so totally in her conditions, to my great comfort. Lily got into trouble with the Parliament men later. He had predicted a town in conflagration, and when the fire of London occurred in 1666 he was accused of having caused it. He had to appear before a parliamentary committee specially sitting on the matter, but he was able to satisfy the chairman that he had nothing to do with the fire. He admitted that he had drawn mysterious designs of persons in winding sheets and digging graves, which were to foretell the plague, and of towers and houses on fire, which might have meant the city of London blazing, but he had never fixed the exact year for these things to happen. So the committee let him off. If he had lived till the next century, when William III's horse had thrown his rider, and the Jacobite toast was the little gentleman in black velvet, Lily could have pointed with pride to other cabalistic drawings in his Merlin one shows a mole walking about under a dragon, another, a mole attacking a crown. Epsom. Epsom. Chapter 14. Epsom. The widest street in Surrey a lucky find Barbara Villers peeps at the wells Nell Gwyn Alderman and Lazy Ladies Epsom's fall a knavish apothecary Baron Swasso, his house Miss Wallen, Bonesetter, Bonesetter, Mrs. Map Epsom remade at the table eclipse the road to the derby the ring round the gibbet Catherine wheels, motor cars, kites, pills Lord Roseberry Lord Littleton's ghost. Epsom is the center of the country between the great railway lines. It has its own railway, but it is midway between the lines that run express trains to Brighton and Southampton, Epsom's own expresses only run for two weeks in the year, when the races come round. For the other fifty weeks Epsom is a quiet town of villas, once a village, now nearly a suburb like Esher or Waveridge. Lord Rosebery sometimes lives near the town, at Durton's, and deplores the large numbers of lunatics who are brought to live near the town always. But Epsom is only occasionally ruffled by the lunatics, and has developed a dangerously good train service. Epsom has the widest and breeziest main street of any Surrey town, and you do not guess the reason until you read the history of the town pretty closely. The story of Epsom, until the two great races that belong to its downs were founded over Lord Derby's wine, is the story of its wells. Before Epsom salts there was hardly an Epsom to give them a name. There may have been a tiny village where the church stands, but that would be all, the rector preached to a few cottagers. Then, one hot summer day in 1618, the lucky thing happened. Henry Wicker, 
trying to water his cattle on the common, found a small hole with a spring in it, he enlarged it, and took the cattle to the water, but could not make them drink. Then the doctors were told about it. They used it first, as Pownall the local historian tells you, as a vulnerary and abstursive, and healed wounds with it, then some laborers accidentally drank it, and Epsom's fortune was made. The doctors agreed, Epsom salts were bitter, diluent, absorbent, soluble, cathartic everything that salts should be. In two years the wells were enclosed with a wall, in twenty years France and Germany had heard of Epsom, and distinguished foreigners obediently paced the common. But the great days were still to come. As yet few buildings had grown up close to the wells, merely a shed to shelter the sickly visitors. Then came the year 1670, when Charles II gave Barbara Villers his palace of Nunsuch two miles away. She, as careless of a king's gift and as avaricious as a king's mistress should be, turned the palace into cash, and out of its demolished walls the local builder piled up houses by Epsom Wells. One of Epsom's inns was already built, the king's head perhaps the old king's head near the church, or an inn on the same site. Pepys was there in 1667, and gives us a glimpse of Nell Gwyn, though she was at Epsom to amuse herself, and was not one of Pepys's party. Pepys went on July 14th, Lord's Day, he got up at four in the morning, and talked to Mrs. Turner downstairs while his wife dressed, and got angry with Mrs. Pepys because she was so long about it. They were off in the coach by five, with bottles of wine and beer, and a cold fowl, and talked all the way pleasantly, Pepys writes, and so came to Epsom, by eight o'clock, to the well, where much company, and I drank the water, they did not but I did drink four pints. And to the town, to the king's head, and hear that my lord Buckhurst and Nelly are lodged at the next house, and Sir Charles Sedley with them, and keep a merry house. Lord Buckhurst had just persuaded Nell Gwynne to leave the king's playhouse for a hundred pounds a year and his company, she was to act no more, which saddened Pepys. However, she was back at the playhouse next month, jeered at by the graceful Buckhurst and as poor as ever. She was less exacting than Barbara Villers, she never had a palace to sell. When none such was built up again into Durdens and other houses near the wells, then came the full tide. Epsom was completed. About the year 1690, Pownall dates the climax, Mr. Parkhurst, Lord of the Manor, built a ballroom seventy feet long, and the inn sprang up on all sides. Taverns at that time reputed to be the largest in England were opened, sedan chairs and numbered coaches attended, there was a public breakfast, with dancing and music every morning at the wells. There was also a ring, as in Hyde Park, and on the downs races were held daily at noon, with cudgeling and wrestling matches, foot races, and C, in the afternoon. The evenings were usually spent in private parties, assemblies, or cards, and we may add, that neither Bath nor Tunbridge ever boasted of more noble visitors than Epsom, or exceeded it in splendor, at the time we are describing. So Pownall praises the great days, but they have not left a glamour about Epsom, as the days of Nash and Brummel have shed on Bath. Why has Epsom so broad a main street? In the great days the open way was narrower. Down the centre of the road as we see it Mr. Parkhurst planted a long walk of elms, and there they stood from James II's day till the 19th century. Then Sir Joseph Mobby, Lord of the Manor, cut them down and sold the timber. He made a good bargain too, for the town people were grieved at losing their trees, and to quiet them he promised to give two hundred pounds to help build a market house, but he never did it, and kept the cash. The trunks of the fallen trees must have made a pleasant prospect for the new inn, the fine red brick building which in Parkhurst's day was built for a tavern, and which still stands, but has now fallen to shops. But in the days when the city aldermen brought their wives to show off their finery, and the young sparks threw their money about at Epsom, what a bustling, handsome, Percy, turtle soup sort of place the wells must have been. John Toland, writing in 1711, describes Epsom wells at their height. Eudoxa is his mistress, 
and to Eudoxa he pictures all Epsom's charms. I quote a few passages from a long letter. Here are two bowling greens with raffling shops and music for the ladies' diversion, as at Tunbridge, but the ladies do not appear every day on the walks as there. Here you see them, on Saturdays, in the evening, as their husbands come from London, on Sundays at church, and on Mondays in all their splendor, when there are balls in the long rooms, and many of them shake their elbows at passage and hazard with a good grace. Surely they never forgave Toland for writing that. Here he writes on the ladies' husbands by the conversation of those that walk there, you would fancy yourself to be this minute on the exchange, and the next at St. James's, one while in an East India factory, and another while with the army in Flanders, or on board the fleet in the ocean, nor is there any profession, trade, or calling that you can miss of here, either for your instruction or diversion. Thus does Toland, unkinder than Pownall, set out the glories of Epsom without comparing them to Bath. But what could be better than the luxury of it all? You would think yourself in some enchanted camp, to see the peasants ride to every house with the choicest fruits, herbs, roots, and flowers, with all sorts of tame and wild fowl, with the rarest fish and venison, and with every kind of butcher's meat, among which Banstead Down mutton is the most relishing dainty. Thus, to see the fresh and artless damsels of the plain, either accompanied by their amorous swains or aged parents, striking their bargains with the nice court and city ladies, who, like queens in a tragedy, display all their finery on benches before their doors, where they hourly censure, and are censured, and to observe how the handsomest of each degree equally admire, envy and cousin one another, is to me one of the chiefest amusements of the place. The ladies who are too lazy, or too stately, but especially those who sit up late at cards have their provisions brought to their bedsides, where they conclude the bargain with a higgler, and then perhaps after a dish of chocolate take another nap, till what they have thus purchased is got ready for dinner. One single attraction Toland admits Epsom never had it lacks a river. One thing is wanting and happy is the situation that wants no more, for in this place notwithstanding the medicinal waters, and sufficient of sweets for domestic use, are not to be heard the precipitant murmurs of impetuous cascades. There are no purling streams in our groves, to tempt the shrill notes of the warbling choristers, whose never-ceasing concerts exceed Bononcini and Corelli. That was in 1711, Epsom never saw better days in spite of the lack of those miraculous concerts. And in 1715 it had all come to an end. Epsom's glories tumbled like a pack of cards. It was the fault of one man, Pownall has gibbeted the rascal, Epsom fell through the knavery of Mr. John Livingstone, an apothecary. Mr. Livingstone may have been a knave, but he was also evidently a fool. He began admirably, as a doctor with a speculative I should do, by building a large house with an assembly room for dancing and music, and other rooms for raffling, dicing, fair chance, what a perversion of terms. And all sorts of gaming, together with shops for milliners, jewelers, twomen, etc. He was quite a heathen, for he planted a grove, and he made a bowling green, and then spoiled it all by sinking a well, putting a pump to it, and calling the place the new wells. The new water was neither diluent, nor absorbent, nor cathartic, nor anything else that water at a watering place should be, and the visitors found out the difference. But the end was the maddest thing of all. Somehow or other, John Livingstone got a lease of the old wells, the real, genuine spring. Then he locked up the old wells, and tried to make money with the new. It killed the watering place. But Epsom revived to relapse and revive again. First, it was brought to life again by the South Sea bubble, which would have brought to life anything, and for a wild short season the quacks and alchemists and Jews came back, the ballrooms and the gaming saloons filled again. New houses were built, amongst them that of Baron Swasso. To speculate as to who Baron Swasso may have been is agreeable, but the baronial hall could not save Epsom. Even a more powerful attraction than Baron Swasso failed to do so, or, rather, refused to try. She was Miss Wallen, whom the vulgar addressed as Crazy Sally, but she was not so crazy. 
Miss Wallen was a bone setter, she could put in a man's shoulder without help, and she was not to be imposed upon. Once a cheat came to her with his head done up in a bandage, and asked her to set his dislocated wrist for him, it was not dislocated, and he wanted to show Miss Wallen up as an imposter. She saw through that, and dislocated his wrist on the spot, telling him to go back to the fools that sent him. Such a woman should have been kept at Epsom, she was worth more than mere cathartic waters. But Epsom could not keep her, she desired more than anything else in the world to marry one Mr. Hillmap, who did not and would not live at Epsom. She pursued him, always with an eye on the church, and Mapp capitulated, but they were married in London. Epsom took back Mrs. Mapp, but she could not live forever. After Mrs. Mapp, the end came quickly. Sea bathing finished the little town altogether, the modern delightful practice of sea bathing, as Pownall puts it with tolerance. He does not give up hope, even in 1825, he hopes that the medical profession will still give the wells a trial, and believes that the waters will be found worthy. After that he comes to the consideration of Epsom's races. Water ended Epsom in 1715, wine began Epsom again in 1780. A party of gentlemen, drinking at Lord Derby's table at Lambert's Oaks, a house on the high ground above the town, lifted their glasses to the glories of horse racing. They founded two races, one, in 1779, for three-year-old fillies, another, in 1780, for three-year-old colts and fillies. They named the races after their host and the house where they drank, and Epsom was made again. The Derby and the Oaks became national institutions. Before that roistering party, the Downs had seen racing, but had not seen a racing crowd. Charles II had run his horses on Epsom and Banstead Downs, perhaps his horse now and then bore away the silver bell, which was the first and simple prize when horses began racing. Queen Anne may have entered a colt or two at Epsom, her consort, Prince George of Denmark, loved horse racing and drank Epsom waters. Greatest of all memories of the turf, Eclipse lived for years by Epsom Downs, and won poor little races for an obscure commoner. He would have won any race he could have been asked by a king, but it was the fate of the finest race horse ever foaled to live before the derby was founded, and before he could race another horse worthy to pass the starting post with him. Pownall, in his history of Epsom, has a pleasant passage extolling Eclipse's merits. He writes in 1825, he has studied, he tells us, Lawrence's history of the horse and Bingley's British quadrupeds, and this is the result. Eclipse was withheld from the course till he was five years of age, and was first tried at Epsom. He had considerable length of waist, and stood over a large space of ground, in which particular he was an opposite form to the flying childers, a short-backed, compact horse, whose reach lay in his lower limbs, but, from the shape of his body, we are inclined to believe that Eclipse would have beaten Childers in a race over a mile course with equal weights. He once ran four miles in eight minutes, carrying twelve stone, and with this weight Eclipse won eleven king's plates a he was never beaten, never had a whip flourished over him, or felt the tickling of a spur, nor was he ever for a moment distressed by the speed or rate of a competitor, outfooting, outstriding, and outlasting, says Mr. Lawrence, every horse which started against him. Eclipse, like Homer, had many birthplaces. Mr. Theodore Cook, who has written authoritatively of him where others have guessed or accepted tradition, has been informed of more than seven, and, in collecting details of relics of the great horse, he has been supplied with evidence that Eclipse possessed no fewer than six undoubted skeletons, nine authentic feet, sufficient genuine hair to have stuffed the largest armchair in Newmarket, and certified portions of skin which would easily have carpeted the yard at Tattersall's. There never was such an omnipresent animal. After 1780, the horse racing crowd grew. In Pownall's time, when the Derby and Oaks had not been established 45 years, the Derby attracted some 60 subscribers, and the Oaks about 40, of 50 guineas apiece, and Epsom was full to overflowing. 
the watering place has become a circus. The race week brings down all London. At an early hour in the morning, persons of all ranks, and carriages innumerable, are seen pouring into the town at every inlet. All the accommodations and provisions that the surrounding villages can supply are put in requisition. The royal family would come to look on, 60,000 spectators, Pownall thinks, met on the downs. But Pownall has nothing to say of the road. The road must have been the thing to see, not as we see it today, when motor cars start for the course before lunch instead of before breakfast, and luxurious railway trains draw decadent racegoers to Tattenham Corner. In the real derby days all racing men that were men drove to Epsom, early in the morning, by the road. Four in-hand coaches travelled level in the pack and the dust by costermongers' donkeys, at every inn there were touts and tipsters, haunting creatures with secrets of betting, they knew what would win outright and what would certainly lose, the duke's trainer had whispered to them, the swindling captain had tipped them the wink, you merely had to pay for the knowledge. Wayside strips of green were turned into coconut chies, wherever a man might wish to shy at nuts, clowns on stilts stalked in checkered blue, bare-legged boys and girls turned amazing Catherine wheels. There was the hill to finish with by the course, and the plaudits of the crowd for him who took his team up in spanking style. They still drive four in-hand coaches up the hill, but the motor horn follows the coach horn. Frith has made the Victorian Derby Day immortal, a less well-known hand has written of what Frith painted. The author who signed himself Sylvanus, and wrote with an admirable gusto of racing men and racing scenes in the forties, has set down in his by lanes and downs of England a strange picture of the ring on Epsom Downs as he saw it. In his day it was formed on the crest of the down, round a post or limb of a gibbet similia similibus, you might suppose reading the list of heroes who met there. The plunging prelate and his ponderous grace, my Lord George, the bold baker, and Mr. Unwell, Sir Xenophon Sunflower, the assassin, and the flash grazier, the dollar, hellite, billiard marker, and bacon factor, the ringlet o' bluster, double-jointed publican, leather lungs, and handsome jack contrasted in the pig's skin, and, yes centaurs. What seats were there? It must have been a sight for proper men to see. Not the veriest tailor would walk on derby day. He would mount a misteached hippogriff, and risk the chance of a pearl, rather than not show at the covered side. Who, indeed, would not bestride a steed when he might meet the assassin and the obluster in the ring. But there were others. At the time we write of, old Crutch, too, with his scaffolding under his arm, and disabled limb dangling like a loose girth from his Rosinante's side, a quadruped equaling the dollar's mount in beauty might have been seen side by side with Lord Chesterfield, on his thoroughbred, and addressing him in all the Timbobinish horrors of his frightful vernacular. My lord was then in the zenith of his good looks and humor, and was, moreover, so well upon Cutherstone, that he saw graces in old Crutch's Fisog, with the charming thousand to forty he hoped to draw him of on the Tuesday P.R.O.C. hind that he joked and rattled with the uncouth old cripple in undisguised merriment. With these might have been noticed the elegant form of Lord Wilton, on his roan, shaded again by a round-shouldered knave from Manchester, with ungloved hands and snub nose, who had potted the crack for his special line of action. His yeoman grace of limbs, fresh and hardy as a summer gale, mounted on his blue-eyed maid, loomed in stalwart manhood by the side of some pallid Greek or city trader, having a word of greeting and jollity for all alike, for he was there for the sake of sport, and had no anxiety beyond his pony. The heavies, as Thornhill of Riddlesworth, Sir Hercules Fitz Outlaw, and poor fatty Sutherland, together with my Lord Milltown, from his not being particularly adapted for an equestrian display, appeared in their several chariots on the outskirts of the ring, an occasional lull in the wordy tumult permitting the Irishman's lisping scream to penetrate the dense and agitated circle, in his praiseworthy efforts to do business. Old Crocky, too, was there, mounted on a subdued wretch of the horse species, tenanted, according to the Pythagorean doctrine, by the evil spirit of some defunct croupier, and ready to return on the nick as usual. In this mess tossed up of Hockley Hole and Whites, in addition to our foregoing inventory, were dukes and butchers. 
but these are perhaps enough. Has the crowd on the hill changed much since the forties? The ring roars no longer round a gibbet, of course, a grand stand of vast dimensions overlooks the course from starting gate to paddock, dukes no longer ride side by side with butchers to make bets. But the crowd itself, and what the crowd does, and what it sees and feels all that, surely, has changed hardly at all. The gypsies still swarm, and the touts still swindle, the bookmakers, bedizened with belts of silver coin, and outlandish hats, and flaring assertions of personal integrity, still clamor by their blackboards, they still chalk up the odds they offer against horses whose names they misspell, the sun still shines on the jockey's silk jackets, still, down a course cleared empty, distracted dogs rush madly, still, before the start for the great race, there broods over that huge concourse and intense, almost a dreadful silence, still there is the shout as the jackets flash from the starting gate, still the hum as they sweep down the bend, the roar as they rush for the straight, the yell as the leader drops back, shoots out, thunders past the judge. All that remains, and will remain. But two changes are insistent. One is the motor cars, which are all over the hill and almost everywhere else, but that is a permanent thing. The other is the advertisements on the kites. In the old days the downs lay under blue sky and white clouds. Now they lie, on Derby Day, under strings of kites. You may go to Epsom to see horse racing, but you will not escape soap, mustard, or pills. Of Epsom's residents and neighbors, Lord Derby won the race named after him in 1787, and doubtless others have won since. But the best record belongs to the owner of Durdens, who won the Derby in 1894 with Lottas, in 1895 with Servisto, and in 1905 with Cicero, and who, in addition to his career as politician, man of letters, and owner of racehorses, has added difficulties to the tasks of other writers by contributing to Mr. Gordon Holmes' guide to Epsom a discouragingly brilliant preface. Another peer has made Epsom history in a different way. At Pitt Place lived the second Lord Littleton, and at Pitt Place he died, leaving behind him a profligate name and a ghost story which Dr. Johnson thought the most extraordinary he had ever heard. It was in November, 1779, Lord Littleton had just returned from Ireland, and was seized with suffocating fits. One night he dreamt a dream. A dove hovered over him, changed to a woman in white, and spoke to him. It was a dead face, and he knew who it was, her two daughters were under his roof. Her words were few, Lord Littleton, prepare to die. When, he gasped. In three days, she answered, and vanished. He called his man, who found him wet with sweat and his whole frame working. The third day came, and he jested with his guests at breakfast if I live over tonight, I shall have jockeyed the ghost. He dined at five, went to bed at eleven, called his servant a slovenly dog for not bringing a spoon for his medicine, and sent for a spoon. The man returned, found him in a fit, and roused the house. But Lord Littleton was dead. He was thirty-five. A quiet corner in Whitley, P-159. A Quiet Corner in Whitley, P-159. Chapter 25 Mid-Surrey Downs and Commons You will a clear stream none such palace the right use for a king's gift cheam satin haycocks a chained anachronism chessington dancing round the mulberry tree a house of mourning a fool for a present esher the great horse bendigo macaulay and the hop pickers surrey english gypsy boy selling a pony. North and south of Epsom are scattered villages on downs and commons, some, like Ewell and Cheam to the north and east, changing the word village into town, others, like Walton on the hill and Headley to the southwest, or Chessington to the northwest, merely groups of cottages with a church. Epsom is the center of the Surrey churches which have been destroyed or disused rather than restored, and the reason for the destruction of the group is obscure. Some strange infection ran in the destroyer's brains, Epsom, perhaps, began it, Ewell, Cheam, Headley fell later, Esher built a new church, but stayed from destroying the old. 
Walton, Woodmanstern, and Banstead have been altered almost out of recognition of what was old, Chessington alone looks upon almost untroubled centuries. Ewell almost joins Epsom, Ewell with its old name Atwell, which its historians tell you means at yet well, the guess looks too easy. The well is plain enough to see, Ewell has pools of the clearest water and springs running fast by the side of the street, it is the most definite beginning of a river that ever attracted a village to its banks, and it runs out of the village as the Little Hogs Mill River a stream with a sparkle in it that deserves a prettier name. But the village which the stream drew to it has changed. The high street has kept some of its older houses, with upper stories jutting out over the road, but the church which the old houses knew has gone. They pulled it down in the forties that unhappy decade for anything ancient and quiet in Surrey villages, all they left was the tower, a mighty mass of stone and ivy that stands with its nave reft from it, the forlornest and most meaningless of ruins. If the tower might stand, why not the nave? They pulled the nave down, and left the tower standing, so Mr. C.J. Sweet, one of Epsom's historians, tells you, in order that it should remain to beautify the landscape. They acted, he observes, with good taste and judgment in so doing. Theirs is that praise. But Ewell has a greater ruin. Ewell Castle preserves it in Ewell Park, but when I was at Ewell the castle and park were for sale, and I could find no one who could show it me, or even who knew where it was. Few, perhaps, have seen it, and there can be little to see, by all accounts, but what remains is the ruin of none such palace just the foundations of the banquet hall, that is all that remains of the palace which was to be incomparable, like no palace a king ever built before, the royalist building in Christendom. That was what Henry VIII meant to make it, when he began it in 1538, and he had built most of it when he died nine years later. It stood unfinished for ten years more, then Mary sold it to the Earl of Arundel, and he finished it. Elizabeth bought it back, and so it came a royal palace to the Stuarts, even the parliamentary wars left it untouched, and it was the refuge for Charles II's exchequer at the Fire of London. Pepys has a picture of none such, just after the Restoration. A very noble house, he calls it, and a delicate park about it, where just now there was a doe killed for the king, to carry up to the court. Two years later he walked in the park and admired the house and the trees, a great walk of an elm and a walnut set one after another in order and all the house on the outside filled with figures of stories, and good painting of Rubens or Holbein's doing. And one great thing is that most of the house is covered, I mean the posts and quarters in the walls, with lead and gilded. I walked also into the ruined garden. That is Charles II, the doe killed in the park for the king, the ruined garden. An old print shows none such in 1582, a great quadrangle with towers at the corners, and cupolas, which perhaps were gilt, and bannerets round the cupolas, and countless little windows, along the face of the building are high Tudor windows with bas reliefs between them, in the foreground of the park a great lady rides in a chariot with gaily caparisoned horses, a greyhound bounds by her side, spaniels in leash drag a huntsman after the carriage, in the far distance, beyond the palace, hounds and Men hunt a noble stag, pictured as if the whole airy chase flew round a cupola. It was a great palace, and it should be standing today, with its lead and its gilt and its Rubenses and Holbeins. But Charles II gave it to Barbara Villers, and she knew the right use for a king's gift. Cheam, east from Ewell by two miles, has kept not the tower of its old church but its chancel. The little building stands apart in the churchyard, you may peep through a grill at the tombs and the pedigree of sixteen generations of Lumleys, and at a palimpsest brass mounted on a screen. But if Cheam's church has gone, in the village there is still the White Hall, a gabled Elizabethan house of painted timber, the daintiest and lightest little place, with tiny ordered lawns under its white wood, and old-fashioned flowers in the garden and in the windows. White Hall has the graces of old books, old ladies, old lace but its gables and chimneys are not the only happy picture in Cheam. The road that passes by the left of the house leads to an untouched corner of little, white wooden cottages, 
as lowly and as English as anything in deep Surrey country, and this is nearly town. They will not last long, I am afraid, the new Cheam buildings are staring at them. All above Cheam and Ewell are Banstead Downs, once as free and open as the Downs by the Sussex Sea, and even now sunny places where you may walk in fresh wines. But the houses are nearer every year, and they will be lucky if they escape another asylum, the high ground gives an opportunity to asylum architects. On Banstead Downs are Lambert's Oaks, where Lord Derby's roistering guests founded great races with bumpers of claret, and where Lord Stanley, when he married Lady Betty Hamilton, gave his famous fate Champetra, which Horace Walpole guessed would cost £5,000, Lord Stanley had bought all the orange trees round London, and the haycocks he imagined were to be made of straw-coloured satin. Banstead itself, like Woodmanstern, its neighbour to the east, has not much to show of village buildings. Banstead and Woodmanstern churches have many memorials to the Lamberts, one of the very old Surrey families, and it is from Garrett's Hall, whose grounds border Banstead Village, that Colonel F. A. H. Lambert dedicates his guide to Surrey, a valuable little pocket book, to Admiral Charles Matthew Buckle, head of another ancient Surrey family. One of the oldest things near Banstead stands in ground once owned by the Buckle family. Nork House has a field in which stands Tumble Beacon, a mound which saw the flares run from the hills of Hampshire to London, when the Armada was breasting the channel and Hampshire had caught the signal from Dunkery and the Lizard. Tumble Beacon would not light an alarm now, or if it did, it would burn pine trees and elders and nettles that grow about it, and would scare a hundred rabbits. How did the trees come there? A beacon should not be planted, it should stand open and high and free as when the Spaniards came, and from the same spot where Elizabeth's sailors in the Thames saw its flame, it should wait for jubilees and coronations to send its fires roaring up into the night. Nork, etymologists have guessed, may be corrupted from Neverca perhaps it once had a Roman owner. There were Romans who lived on the high ground near. Walton Heath, south of Banstead on the Chalk Plateau, has had the pavement of a Roman villa dug from it, I have been told that you may still find Roman pavements there, if you know where to dig. But Walton's chief possession the village is Walton on the Hill, so named that you may never mistake it for Walton on the Naze or Walton on Thames is in the church. It is a leaden font, the only leaden font which Surrey possesses, though England has thirty, and of the thirty English fonts, Walton's is of as fine workmanship and design as any. Throned apostles circle the bowl, and bless with the right hand, or hold a book in the left. The church has some interesting old glass in a southern window, and, by an oddly deliberate anachronism, a chained Bible dated 1803. The chain is an old and genuine guard of the printed word, taken from Salisbury, but why should it chain Georgian printing? But Walton has long been anachronistic, there is a tomb outside the chancel, in a recess of the north wall, on which some modern Latin scholar has set the inscription, Johannes de Walton Hudges Ecclesiae Fundator 1268. The weather has removed part, but the rest is in black paint. A neighboring village, Headley, has separated its new and old more definitely. The church has been taken down, all but the porch, which holds a grave and what looks like the sign of an inn, you may just distinguish the royal arms. The pillars of the old church have fallen, but where they stood, Little clipped box trees mark the line a prettier memorial than a drawn plan to hang in the vestry, but need the old church have fallen? These level heights, perhaps, provoke church building, but how few spires stand on the horizons. Ranmer Spire you may see from half over Mid-Surrey, but Ranmer is high on a ridge. Here you are on a plateau, and the heights see each other no more than the low ground. Kingswoods is the best scene of the spires on the plateau, a shining thing, white as the chalk of the ridge. From Epsom to the north is quiet, empty countryside. Esher is five miles to the northwest as the crow flies, something more by road, but the best roads near Esher are the wild pathways of Esher Common. Midway between Epsom and Esher, but among pastures, not in the heather of the common, is Chessington. Chessington Hall and Chessington Church are deep in the fields. 
The hall may not be today quite the simple little building that Fanny Burney knew, when Samuel Crisp, Daddy Crisp, had it, but the garden and the trees, and the avenue to the church where she walked and talked over his music with Dr. Burney can be little changed. It was at Chessington that Fanny Burney took a packet from the postman and found herself famous. Evelina, which not even her father knew she had written, had taken the town. All the talk of the great men was of Evelina. Dr. Johnson was praising it, Sir Joshua Reynolds would not let his meals interrupt him, and took it with him to table. Edmund Burke had sat through the night to finish it. That was in 1778, and a hundred and thirty years after that wonderful morning her delight is as infectious as dance music. Dr. Johnson's approbation, she writes in her diary, it almost crazed me with agreeable surprise it gave me such a flight of spirits that I danced a jig to Mr. Crisp, without any preparation, music, or explanation to his no small amazement and diversion. She danced round the mulberry tree on the Chessington lawn, so she told Sir Walter Scott years afterwards. She was just twenty-six. The mulberry tree still stands by the window, and the fields by Chessington are still as green and quiet as when poor Mr. Crisp, a writer whom a careless world did not want to read, retired from his disappointments to a home where none but his friends should find him. He lies in the churchyard, under the shadow of the quaint little spire that sits on its bells like a candle snuffer, Dr. Burney has written an epitaph for him, in the formal Georgian English that was always somewhere, too, in Fanny Burney's head. It was only the girl in her that kept it out of Evelina, after Evelina the girl survives almost only in her diary and her letters. The books grow dull. Esher, beyond Claygate, is three miles to the northwest, and Claremont borders Esher Common. Claremont is a house of happiness and mourning. Queen Victoria spent the brightest days of her childhood there, princes and princesses have lived here and died before their day, a great name darkens its memories, ennobles its history. The first house at Claremont was built by Sir John Vanbrugh, afterwards the Duke of Newcastle had it, on his death Lord Clive bought it, pulled it down, and built the Claremont of today. A hundred thousand pounds he spent on the house and garden, and in the serenity of his chosen home he should have ended his days. Envy and persecution prevented that, and Clive of Arcot and Plassey died in London. Forty-two years later, in 1816, Prince Leopold, afterwards King of the Belgians, brought his bride, Princess Charlotte, to Claremont, she died with her baby the next year, a girl of 21. In 1848 Louis Philippe, a refugee from the Revolution, came to Claremont, he died there in 1850. Seven years after, in 1857, Claremont and the countryside were in mourning for the Duchess of Nemours, a princess of glorious beauty. Queen Amelie died at the house in 1866. Today the Duchess of Albany has Claremont, perhaps, as it lies so near a great highway, it might be worthwhile to say that it is not shown to the public. Wolsey's Tower, Esher Wolsey's Tower, Esher A ruined palace is Claremont's neighbor. The great gateway of the building stands on the bank of the Mole, in the grounds of Esher Place. William of Wainflet built it, Wolsey repaired it, and was sent there in disgrace by his king, the great seal had been taken from him. Stowe has a story of the fallen minister's journey to Esher, Wolsey had left the river at Putney, and was riding along sadly enough, when a messenger brought him a kind word from the king. In his joy and relief he looked round for a present to send back, he fixed on Patch, his fool, and ordered him to the court. Patch was all rage and tears, and stormed his unhappiness at his master. It was no good, he was for Henry, and six yeomen it took the tallest Wolsey had carried him struggling back to the king. The palace did not keep Wolsey long, he was allowed back at Richmond. After him, in Elizabeth's reign, came Richard Drake, and kept Spanish grandees prisoners there, taken from the armada by Sir Francis Drake. After the Drakes came the Latins, one of whom, John, held a remarkable number of offices under William III. Aubrey gives the list. 
In the reign of William III, this John Latin had given him by that prince the honors and places following. Equerry. Avener. Master of the Buck Beagles. Master of the Harriers. Master of the game ten miles round Hampton Court, by particular patent, distinct from that of justice in air. Master of the lodge at the old park at Richmond, with a lease of thirty years from the crown for the lands thereto belonging. Steward of the manor of Richmond. Keeper of Windsor House Park. Head customer at Plymouth. All which were conferred upon him, without asking for, directly or indirectly, and were all held together during that reign. Esher Palace as John Latin knew it survives now only in old prints, they show a long wing on each side of William of Wainflet's gateway. Opposite the palace a pleasure boat, half dinky, half barge, asks for passengers, on the bank a fashionably dressed lady holds a long fishing rod hopefully over the river, shaded by an enormous parasol. Esher itself is scattered round a village green and a long broad street. By the green is the modern church, and in the churchyard a strange tomb. Lord Esher, the late master of the rolls, lies in white marble with Lady Esher, Lord Esher designed the tomb in his lifetime, and would pass it on his way to church. But the real Esher lies away from the village green, along the main road to Portsmouth a road edged with trees and strips of grass, behind the trees stand the little, low, one-storied red houses, and Esher's fine inn, the bear. The bear has been rebuilt, but it has kept the air of a coaching inn, in the hall there is a vast pair of boots, once worn by the postillion of Louis Philippe. Esher's old church lies behind the bear, the saddest little deserted place. Sorrels and grasses wave about its forgotten graves, you open the church door, and you are back in the days of Waterloo. The pews are square and high, the pulpit is a three-decker, the paint is that peculiar yellow dun which belongs to Georgian and early Victorian aesthetics. But the value of the church is that it is untouched. No restorer has laid a hand on the mouldering base which lines the pews, no one has knocked down the hideous galleries, nobody has broken into the gallery pew in which, warmed by a fireplace and chimney in winter, the little Princess Victoria of Kent used to sit when she was allowed to visit Claremont. You may see at Esher, better than in any other Surrey church, the surroundings in which our Georgian great-grandfathers worshipped, the service might almost have ended yesterday there should be a forgotten prayer book somewhere under a seat, praying for the health of His Gracious Majesty King William. Or there might be in the body of the church, not in the Queen's pew. I think American visitors have been there. To racing people Esher is Sandown, and Sandown is what all travelers see from the railway. Of the smaller racecourses few can be prettier, the long flank of a green hill, the white pavilion under dark pines, and the curving course picked out with fresh painted railings and green canvas it is as spick and span as a lawn. Either in the summer, for the eclipse stakes, or in the spring for the steeple chases, most of the great English race horses go to Sandown. Bendigo won the eclipse stakes of £10,000 for Mr. Hedworth Barclay in 1886 the first time any horse won so huge a stake. Bendigo is surely one of the great names. Even those who know least about horse racing may talk of Bendigo, Bendigo whom the crowd loved, Bendigo who never failed them, Bendigo who carried nine stone seven pounds, and won the Jubilee Stakes at Kempton in 1887. I have for Bendigo the affection of a schoolfellow. What is Surrey English? Lord Macaulay heard it at Esher. He was walking from Esher to Ditton Marsh, he writes on September 22, 1854, and he listened to it in a public house. A shower came on. Afraid for my chest, I turned into a small alehouse, and called for a glass of ginger beer. I found there a party of hop pickers, come back from the neighborhood of Farnham. They had had but a bad season, and were returning, nearly walked off their legs. I liked their looks, and thought their English remarkably good for their rank of life. It was in truth Surrey English, the English of the suburbs of London, which is to the Somersetshire and Yorkshire what Castilian is to the Andalusian, or Tuscan to Neapolitan. The poor people had a foaming pot before them, but as soon as they heard the price, they rose and were going to leave it untouched. They could not, 
they said, afford so much. It was but four pence halfpenny. I laid the money down, and their delight and gratitude quite affected me. Two more of the party soon arrived. I ordered another pot, and when the rain was over, left them, followed by more blessings than ever, I believe, were purchased for nine pence. Perhaps the English of the Surrey suburbs was different in Macaulay's days. There is little dialect left anywhere to distinguish Surrey English from any other, even the gypsies speak the English of the suburbs of London. There are still gypsies on Esher Common, I came across quite a settlement once, walking over the common to Cobham on a sunny morning after late April snow. The common was patched with sparkling white and blue, the snow lay in blue shadows unmelted under the gorse bushes, and among the gorse and sodden bracken twenty ponies snuffed for grass. Three gypsy boys shuffled through the fern near them. What did they do with the ponies? I asked, and the eldest told me they sold them, they were good ponies, he was voluble in suburban English. What did they fetch? That depended. What was that one worth, it was a small chestnut creature with a child's pink pinafore for a halter. Ah! That one, he began, and his eyes became inscrutable. He would have sold it well. Chapter 26 Leatherhead The millpond magic water leatherhead bridge the running horse the tunning of Eleanor rumming noppy ale a penny a coffin deflected chancels Judge Jeffries and his daughter Emma Mr. Woodhouse's gruel. Leatherhead ought to be entered from the west and left by the south. To meet the little town on the road from Fetchame is to begin with a stretch of water, which is always a good introduction, and to leave it and travel south is to pass through one of the most fascinating valleys of all Surrey. The stretch of water lying to the west is the mill pond, and is unlike any other pond I know. It is two or three hundred yards long and perhaps eighty yards wide, slopes gradually from the sides over a chalky bottom, and is of an intense clear green. Here and there are open spaces in the weeds, patches of deeper blue-green, which can be seen, if you look closely, to be moving a most uncanny motion. The water wells up incredibly fast and quiet, and surely incredibly cold, from some unplumbed, invisible source below. It would be interesting to try to find the bottom with a plummet, but probably one would be caught by a policeman. All that I have tried to do is to throw in white stones, which disappear as if they were swallowed. But the swallowing is a puzzling thing. The stone strikes the surface and sends out a widening ripple. Then you watch the stone sinking down slowly against the uprush of water, but distinct and white and wavering. Then another ripple a mere ring of light, in some way mirroring the real ripple of the surface leaps out apparently from the side of the pool a foot or so under water, touches the white, wavering stone, and the stone vanishes. There is no stirring of mud, as there would be if it struck the bottom of an ordinary pond, it merely disappears into an invisible mouth in the green. Leatherhead. Leatherhead. No frost ever sets ice on the mill pond, it is said, and in hard winters wild fowl flock to it. I never have seen on the water any fowl that were wild, but it is crowded with swimming and diving birds. You can count thirty or forty coots, besides moorhens and a dozen dab chicks or so, and at the end where the mill stands there are a fat duck and a bevy of swans. It is an arresting picture, the long, clear surface, the coots with their white foreheads dabbling in the weeds or rushing after one another with loud splashings, the dab chicks diving six at a time out of sight, and the dignified swans breasting the flowing water under the red brick and lichens of the mill. The coots, unlike all other coots, too, actually swim up to be fed. There is a strong spell of magic over all that strange pool. Some naiad Circe combs her hair far below the weeds, and has bewitched the wildfowl and the green cold water. Ye yeah, old running horse in, leatherhead. Ye yeah, old running horse in, leatherhead. It would be easy to believe that the rushing springs of the millpond were in reality the mole reappearing from her dive below ground at Michaelham, higher up the stream. But if that is so, the river must pass through some kind of filter, for it can be thick and cloudy at Michaelham, but is never anything but clean and pure at the mill. The mill stream joins the mole just below Leatherhead Bridge, a fine span of fourteen arches. The mole can put on many faces, 
but I think she is nowhere in all her journey more fascinating than where she divides her stream under Leatherhead, and comes dancing down by separate channels to her broad sheet of ripples at the bridge. Beyond the bridge on the left, is the site of a very famous old inn. The present inn, the running horse, has been partly rebuilt, and has few external attractions, but the mistress of the old inn, 400 years ago, was the subject of an ode written by the poet laureate. She was Eleanor Rumming, alewife of a cabaret at Letterhead in Sotre, and John Skelton, perhaps to amuse Henry VIII, and perhaps to please himself, wrote one of his pungent, tumbling romps of doggerel about her. The tunning of Eleanor Rumming, per Skelton laureate, as one of the old editions prints it, is an interminable piece of rhyme, mostly an orgy of coarseness, but with a certain rude vigor of humor and live truth. Here are a score of lines out of some hundreds the tunning of Eleanor Rumming, per Skelton laureate. Tell you I chill. If that ye wyll. A while be still. Of a comely gyll. That dwelt on a hyll. But she is not gryll. For she is somewhat sage. And well worn in age. For her visage. It would assuage. A man's courage. And this comely dame. I understand her name. Is Eleanor Rumminge. At home in her wanting. And as men say. She dwelt in Sotre. In a certain steed. By side letterhead. She is a tunnish gyb. The duel and she be sib. But to take up my tale. She brought noppy ale. And make thereof port sail. To travelers, to tinkers. To sweeters, to swinkers. And all good ale drinkers. That will nothing a spare. But drink till they stare. And bringe themselves bare. With now away the mare. And let us slake here. As wise as an hare. The legend is that Skelton was a fisherman, and used to come over from none such palace by Epsom to fish in the mole. Perhaps he did, and drank Eleanor's noppy ale, in any case, a portrait of the leatherhead alewife found its way into one of his books, with a rhymed couplet beneath it. When Skelton wore the laurel crown, my ale put all the alewives down. The portrait is of a hag of such appalling ill favor as would certainly assuage a man's courage. And in of more interest, though never the subject of a laureate's ode, is the old coaching hostel, the Swan. It was a famous house in the 17th century, and cooked the mole trout as well as the Dorking Inns cooked their water sauchy of carp and tench. The Reverend S. N. Sedgwick, in his ingenious little collection of leatherhead legends, adds a strange record to the inproperty. He founds one of his stories on a local tradition that the carrying of a dead body can establish a right of way, and he says that in quite recent times the sum of one penny has been charged for permission to bring a corpse through the Swan Brewery Yard, to prevent a right of way being established. Whether or not the right of way was established originally by carrying a dead body over it, there is another leatherhead tradition of a right of way which is connected with the church. The church, with the curious double dedication of St. Mary and St. Nicholas, stands apart from the southern road out of Leatherhead, above the banks of the mole. The tower is strangely out of the axis of the nave as much as three or four feet and the tradition is that it was so built to avoid encroaching on an established right of way. Probably the explanation is something more symbolical or superstitious. One of the most learned of all Surrey archaeologists, Mr. Philip Mainwaring Johnston, holds to the theory that these deflections of the church axis are connected with legends of the crucifixion. The deflected chancel, he thinks, suggests the head bowed upon the cross. But the deflected tower seems more difficult. The church is interesting in other ways. It contains a leather-bound book of homilies, chained in its original position to one of the northern pillars of the nave, and in the porch is an upright gravestone erected to the memory of Lady Diana Turner, the story being that she chose to be buried under the very spot where her sedan chair stood for the Sunday service. She was paralyzed, and listened to the homilies from the porch. Leatherhead has two faces. She shows one, which is slate and new, to the traveler entering the town from Ashtet and Epsom to the northeast, and another, 
which is the old bridge and the church road and the best of her, to those who approach her from Feltham or Michaelham. St. John's School, founded for the sons of poor clergy, lies on the Ashted Road, a large modern building of red and grey patterned brick. But the best of Leatherhead's houses stand about the mole. One is Thorncroft, which represents the domain of Tornacrosta in Doomsday Book. Another is a fine early Georgian building now known as Emlyn House, but formerly as the mansion. Alexander Ackhurst, M.D., one of the church wardens who presented the Book of Homilies to the church, rebuilt this house early in the 18th century, but parts of the older building remain. Once it belonged to Sir Thomas Bloodworth, whose sister married Judge Jeffreys of the Bloody Assize. According to a local tradition, Jeffreys, when his worthy master King James had fled to France, slunk in disguise to Leatherhead. It was one of the many roads he found closed against him in his attempts to escape. But he did not come to Leatherhead solely because it lay on the road to the south. His little daughter lay at the point of death at her uncle's house, and his desire was to see her once more before she died. The once mighty Lord Chancellor, dressed as a common sailor with shaven eyebrows and coal dust smeared on his cheeks, hated with a furious intensity of loathing which has never been felt for an Englishman before or since, knocked fearfully at dead of night at the door of the house where his dying daughter lay. So says the legend, and history does not forbid belief. For the register dates the child's funeral on December 2nd, 1688, and it was ten days afterwards that a wild crowd nearly tore the judge limb from limb at Wapping. A gentler memory, or rather association, belongs to the church street and the houses in the neighborhood. There have been many attempts made by Miss Austin's readers to identify Highbury, the large and populous village, almost amounting to a town of Emma, with some Surrey town or village. There is a school of serious students who place it at Esher, another band of enthusiasts support Dorking. Mr. E.V. Lucas, in his engaging introduction to a new edition of the novel, has another suggestion. He recommends the theory that Highbury was Leatherhead, which satisfies most of the conditions of the book. It is, as he says, rightly placed as regards London, Kingston and Box Hill, though seven miles, which was the drive from Hartfield to Box Hill, is surely rather a generous estimate of the actual distance. But Leatherhead certainly has a river and a Randalls, and Mr. Lucas has been told that it has an abbey farm. That may be a mere coincidence, but, if so, it is the more striking when one turns to the parish registers, and finds in them the uncommon name of Knightley. Mr. Knightley, in 1761, raised the pulpit of the church, and erected a new reading desk and seat for the clerk, and it was hereby ordered that the thanks of this vestry be paid in the most respectful manner to Mr. Knightley for this fresh mark of his regard. Surely that is precisely what would have been the attitude of Mr. Elton's parishioners to Emma's husband. If Miss Austen read the parish literature, she may also have set eyes on a poem entitled, Norbury Park, which was written by a minor bard of the neighborhood named Woodhouse. But that is insisting too much, though, to be sure, from the quality of his verse, Mr. Woodhouse, author of Norbury Park, may well be imagined to have had, like Emma's father, a nice taste in gruel. The Mole at Slyfield Place The Mole at Slyfield Place Chapter 27 Stoke d'Aubernon Slyfield's a great bowl of silver the air the danger of parish relief Stoke d'Aubernon Church and nightly memorial stolen woad sire Richard L. E. Petit Long Sermons the earliest honeymoon Cobham a hermit 4 pounds 700 Matthew Arnold at Paynes Hill the mole wanders west away from Leatherhead by Randall's Farm and Randall's Park, and perhaps Miss Austen used to imagine Emma and Mrs. Weston walking along the rather dull road that runs up the valley by the side of the stream. North of the road, about a mile from the town, stands an old Roman camp, now buried in a small wood, with notice boards loudly forbidding access. Another mile to the west but you must walk to to get there is one of the most charming of old Surrey manor houses, now a farmhouse, but still known by its name of Sly Fields. The Sly Fields were essentially a Surrey family. They lived and worked as gentlemen and yeomen and parsons among small Surrey villages, 
Send and Great Bookham and Biflate and Perford and Ripley and the Clandons, one of them, Edmund, was Sheriff of Surrey and Sussex in the time of Elizabeth. He was the greatest of the Sly Fields, and left behind him sixteen sons and daughters, four Surrey manors, and a will as careful and studious as himself. Some of the items are quaint reading. To his son Walter, my black velvet doublet and pair of hose of wrought velvet, my best nightgown, my best hat, flower of my best shirts and my best riding cloak. To his son William, my coat of tough taffeta and a short cloak of rashi, laid with parchment lace. To his son-in-law, Edward Skeet, one short cloak, called the Dutch cloak, of black damasky furred with squirrel, faced with caliber, and guarded with velvet. To Elizabeth, his eldest daughter, forty pounds, but she not to trouble molest or disquiet my sade with, her mother, my executrix. To his grandson Edmund one of his great bowls of silver. The last item is one of the most interesting. It ought to be read in conjunction with an earlier item in the same will, in which special directions are left to the executors not to pull down or to deface any manner of wainscot or glass in or about the house of Slyfield. For the end of the Slyfield family as a power in Surrey came with bitter suddenness. Henry, the sheriff's eldest son, succeeded his father in 1590, and died in 1598. He was succeeded by his son Edmund, who had been left one of the great bowls of silver. Within sixteen years Edmund Slyfield had sold every stick and stone of the Slyfield manors, the Slyfield house was razed to the ground to make room for a new building, and in the new building and on the old tombstones alone the name of Slyfield remains. The new manor house is nearly three hundred years old, and was built for the possessor of another great Surrey name, George Shears. He was the grandfather of Sir George Shears, baronet, who was one of the most generous of testators to Surrey villages. Among other bequests, he left a sum of money to the parish of Great Bookham, which was to be thus devoted. In preferring in marriage such maids born in this parish as have lived and behaved themselves well for seven years in any one service, and whose friends are not able to do it. To dispose of the surplus to such poor as by sickness, age, a great family of children, or otherwise, shall be in danger of coming under the common relief of this parish. The danger of coming under the common relief of the parish was evidently felt to be real a strange dislike for running the hatred which the modern English villager feels for the house. When Louise Michel, the leader of the Petroleuses of the French Revolution, was shown over one of the great London unions not long before her death, she was filled with wonder and admiration. If we had had that in France, she said, we should have had no revolution. The Englishman leaves legacies to enable poor parishioners to escape from the danger. Slyfield's manor, picturesque though it is, is still only a remnant. Only one side of what was once a quadrangular building remains, but the solid symmetry of its red brick walls and ivied gables, and the hugeness of its ornate and lichened barns and granaries, make it as imposing as any farmhouse well could be. Curiously enough, like the older Crowhurst place, the other side of the county, a farmhouse it still remains. The Slyfields and the Shears lie in Great Bookham Church. Another church stands not half a mile away from the house, in a smooth and green garden on the banks of the mole. Stoke D'Aubernon Church contains one of the great possessions of Surrey the oldest brass in England a monument which, besides being the oldest of its kind, is the very knightliest memorial an English gentleman could have. A plain slab of brass, on which has been elaborately engraved the figure of a soldier in full chain mail, with his six-foot lance and its fringed pennon, his long prick spurs, and his great two-handed sword, it has lain in an English church for nearly six centuries and a half. The Lombardic lettering which runs round the brass is half illegible, but the form of the old inscription, perfect in its simple dignity, is clear enough. Sire, Iahan, Daubernown, Chivaller, Gist, I see, Dev, De, S.A., Alma, E.Y.T., Mercy. By Sir John D. Aubernon's brass lies that of his son, and between the dates of the two brasses are 50 years 1277 and 1327. The D. Aubernons were a knightly family, 
but they never provided an English king with a great soldier, or a great politician, or with anything much more than the quiet services of a country gentleman. The founder of the family in England was Roger de Aubernon, who in Doomsday Book is a tenant of Richard de Bienfait, son of Gilbert Count of Brian. The first Sir John de Aubernon, whose brass lies in Stoke de Aubernon Church, was the most distinguished of the family. Like Edmund Slyfield, he was Sheriff of Surrey and Sussex. Edmund Slyfield, dead 300 years before our day, we can see his brass in Great Bookham Church, perhaps often stared at the brass of Sir John de Aubernon, dead 300 years before him. Perhaps, little guessing that within 30 years the Slyfield manners would belong to a stranger, and the Slyfield name be half forgotten, he reflected comfortably on the misfortunes of his predecessor in office. For Sir John was a most unlucky sheriff, and lost a large sum partly by robbery and partly in the law courts. The story of his loss is a strange medley. One William Hod, of Normandy, in the year 1265 shipped to Portsmouth ten hogsheads of woad. Robbers seized the woad at Portsmouth and carried it off to Guildford, Hod, pursuing, recaptured his hogsheads and lodged them in Guildford Castle. Immediately appeared Nicholas Picard and others from Normandy, demanding the woad in the name of Stephen Buck Arl and others. If the woad was not given up, they threatened to destroy the whole of Guildford by fire the next morning. The undersheriff, whose family lived in the neighborhood, at once gave up the woad, whereupon Hod instituted proceedings against Sir John de Aubernon the sheriff, and won his case. Sir John had to pay as damages six score marks about equivalent to 900 pounds of our money. Stoke de Aubernon Church holds a number of other interesting monuments and brasses, indeed, for its size, it is fuller of valuable work and memorials than any other Surrey church. One of them, placed to the memory of Sir Richard the Little, formerly parson of this church, has a haunting note of personal loss. It is a pleasure to puzzle out the old Norman French. Sire Richard L. E. Petillides Person de Cest I Glyce I just receive L. A. Alma I. E. S. U. Christ. Another rare form of brass is that of a little chrism child, Ellen Bray, another, a curious engraving of Lady Anne Norbury, with four tiny sons and four tiny daughters gathered at her feet in the folds of her gown. There are imposing monuments to Sir Thomas and Lady Vincent, Sir Thomas enormous in trunk hose and his lady with her hair elaborately frizzed in a Paris hood. In the body of the church, the pulpit is a magnificent piece of early 17th century carving, and to the wall near it is fastened a wrought iron hourglass, which must have measured many a weary discourse. Another of Stoke de Aubernon's possessions is one of the finest 13th century oak chests in the southern counties. Stoke de Aubernon Church Stoke de Aubernon Church Outside, the church is interesting in other ways. You can see in the south wall of the chancel a large slice of Roman herringbone brickwork, perhaps brought by pre-conquest builders from some villa or other ruins close at hand, and on the south wall of the nave, high up, is a sundial which before the conquest probably stood above the old south door. With so much that is old and venerable in the building and its monuments it is dismal to add that much, also, that was old and venerable has been destroyed. It is probably the worst restored of all old churches worth restoring. Stoke de Aubernon has a claim on the attention of those about to marry. The manor house is the first which is recorded as having been lent for a honeymoon. So I learned from Mr. J. H. Round, writing in The Ancestor. When William Marshall, in 1189, secured the hand of the heiress of the Earls of Pembroke, who was as good as she was beautiful, he proposed that they should be married on her own estates on the Welsh border. His host, however, a wealthy Londoner, would not hear of such a thing, and insisted on their being married in London and paying the cost of the wedding himself. After the ceremony, as the society papers of the time might have put it, the young couple left for Stoke de Aubernon in Surrey, the peaceful and delectable country mansion of Sir Ingerant de Aubernon, kindly lent for the occasion. Mr. Round has extracted this the earliest known reference to an orthodox honeymoon in the country, from the bridegroom's poetical biography, El Histoire de Guillaume L. E. Marichal Quant Lénosis Biafates Furent, E. Richmond, 
si cum els durant, la dame amena, ce savon, gs sire angerin di abernon, a stocks, and lupazable eece delightable. The bill for the trousseau of the heiress has also been discovered, entered in the pipe roll of the year. It cost nine pounds twelves. One d. The road from Stoke d Abernon runs northwest through the two Cobhams, Church Cobham and Street Cobham. The Little Plough Inn, which acts as refreshment room for Cobham Railway Station, suggests the proper spirit of village revelry. A spreading yew arbor should shade good ale from the summer suns, and by the side of the garden across the road, gay with geraniums, seesaws and swings, runs a tiny stream, rippling down to the mole. Unlike the way, the mole runs by few churches. Only five, Horley, Betchworth, Leatherhead, Stoke D. Abernon, and Cobham, stand near the river, and only Stoke D. Abernon actually on its banks. Stoke D. Abernon, too, has the best view from the churchyard across the stream, over a broad stretch of grassland on which partridges call and rooks stalk majestically. At Cobham you can scarcely see the mole when you are in the village, but there are few prettier glimpses of its stream than the brimming pool by the road outside. A grey mill stands in the stream, double-wheeled and doubly silent, swans or themselves leisurely about the eddies, and the meadow beyond in May is a sheet of king cups. Yet old church-style house, Cobham, AD 1432, restored 1635. Yet old church-style house, Cobham, AD 1432, restored 1635. Yet old church-style house, Cobham, 1432, restored 1635, is the engaging legend painted on a low-roofed timbered house which stands at the churchyard gate. With its square beams, its latticed windows and red curtains, it is a model of what a home of rest for gentlewomen which is its vocation should be. Cobham has one or two other good houses, Georgian, red and solid, but the best perhaps is the old white lion posting in at Cobham Street, half a mile away on the Portsmouth Road. The white lion stood by the fourth toll house on the highway from London, and its oak-paneled parlors have entertained travelers for four centuries or more non-thirstier, perhaps, than Liberty Wilkes, who passed that way on a day in 1794, and drank a large bowl of lemonade. Payne's Hill, which rises above the mole a little further on the road, is a name associated with a gardener and a poet. The gardener was Charles Hamilton, who burdened his lawns with such an astonishing variety of temples, chapels, grottoes, castles, cascades and ruins including a hermitage with a real live hermit that the result was voted one of the greatest achievements in landscape gardening of the Georgian or any other age. The hermit, sad to relate, was a failure. He was offered £700 to live a Nebuchadnezzar-like existence in his cell, sleeping on a mat, never speaking a word, and abandoning all the conveniences of a toilet. He would gladly have taken the £700, but threw up his post after three weeks. The poet was Matthew Arnold, who spent most of the last fifteen years of his life at Paynes Hill Cottage. He wrote little poetry there, he came to Paynes Hill in the year after he had published Literature and Dogma, when his mind was occupied with his revolution against the somberness and narrowness of modern English religious thought. But to Paynes Hill, I think, belong Guy Scrave and Kaiser Dead and poor Matthias, Guy Scrave written for his little son, and poor Matthias for his daughter, perhaps Matthias, bought at Hastings to please a child, though she, childlike, would have chosen a bigger bird. Behold! French canary merchant old! Shepherding his flock of gold! In a low dim lighted pen! Scandy of tramps and fishermen! There a bird, high colored, fat! Proud of port, though something squat! Percy, play de out Philistin! Dazzled Nelly's youthful ain! But, far in, obscure, there sturdy! On his purchase sprightly a bird! Courteous eyed, erect, and slim. And I whispered he, fix on him. Home we brought him, young and fair. Songs to trill in Surrey air. Here Matthias sang his fill. 
saw the cedars of Paynes Hill. Here he poured his little soul. Heard the murmur of the mole. And it was while Matthew Arnold was living at Paynes Hill that he chose out his little collection of selected poems. I like to think of him reading over his work in his Surrey garden, and answering once more the cuckoo calling from the wet field, through the vexed garden trees. Too quick despairer, wherefore wilt thou go? Soon will the high midsummer pomps come on. Soon will the musk carnations break and swell. Soon shall we have gold-dusted snapdragon. Sweet William with his homely cottage smell. And stocks in fragrant blow. Roses that down the alleys shine afar. And open, jasmine muffled lattices. And groups under the dreaming garden trees. And the full moon, and the white evening star. Bridge over the mole, Cobham. Bridge over the mole, Cobham. Chapter 28 Leatherhead to Dorking the Roman rode over the hill the swallows of the mole and imperial draft Michael Ham Fanny Burney A story of letters Juniper Hall and its cedars Norbury Park How to measure trout from the mole conversation Sharp Keats and Endymion Mr. George Meredith's poems The best known hill in the world is soldier's whim. The best way from Leatherhead to Dorking is the longest, and hardly goes by the high road at all. It begins at Ashted, you can get to Ashted from Leatherhead or Epsom, but you must start from Ashted out over Ermine Street, the old Roman road. One might begin the walk from Epsom, but Epsom Downs, with the great empty race stand, can be depressing, and the best of the old road lies south, nearer Michael Ham. Ashted is growing towards the railway, but east of the main street there is hardly a cottage. The church stands in Ashted Park, and shows that it once had Roman walls for neighbors by the quantity of Roman brick and tiling mixed among its flints and stones. It has been elaborately roofed with cedar, but otherwise contains little, the prettiest part is the churchyard and the park beyond it, with its deer which walk by the gates and gaze gently over the paths at strangers. Ermine Street or Stain Street of the Maps, which English tongues here have named Pebble Lane, skirts Ash Ted Park by the southeast, at first a wide green lane, afterwards a narrow path sometimes half choked by trees, sometimes, in wet weather, impassable with mud, but always driving straight as the Roman roadmaker drove his pick towards the cap of Michael Ham Downs. The narrow lane to which the road has shrunk is less than the Roman made it, but Michael Ham Downs can look very little different today from the Downs which the legionary knew. He, too, like the modern traveler tramping by the yews and box trees, saw the sunlight on the dark, shining leaves, and watched the wind ruffle the white beams on the shoulder of the hill. Michael Ham Church Michael Ham Church Below the downs lies Michael Ham, halfway between Leatherhead and Dorking, and famous in all the guidebooks for the swallows of the mole. The swallows are described as deep, blue pools, into which the mole disappears underground, and, except from the most carefully written accounts, you would imagine that the whole river dives completely into the earth and jumps up again at Leatherhead. But if you ask at Michaelham to be directed to the swallows, the chances are that you will have to explain that you do not mean birds. The fact is that it is only in seasons of great drought that they would be noticed. In summers when there is very little rain the mole is said to run dry between Burford Bridge and Thorncroft Bridge near Leatherhead, but I have never happened to see it do so, and had the greatest difficulty in discovering the swallows, which, when I saw them, were brimming with very muddy water, the stream was as full as possible. The best comment on the legend of the diving mole is Thomas Fuller's in the Worthies. I listened not to the country people telling it was experimented by a goose, which was put in and came out again with life, though without feathers, but hearken seriously to those who judiciously impute the subsidency of the earth in the interstice aforesaid to some underground hollowness made by that water in the passage thereof. The swallows are really fissures in the chalk bed of the stream, which runs as it were over the top of a long chalk sponge. In rainless summers there is only enough water to fill the bottom of the sponge, and the top channel runs dry. Braley has some amusing calculations as to the amount of water which the sponge drinks. From calculations made on different days, after measuring the height and velocity of the current received into these pools, it was ascertained, when both were in activity, 
that the swallows of the outer pool engulfed 72 imperial gallons per second, 4,320 per minute, and 259,200 per hour, and those of the inner pool, 23 imperial gallons per second, 1,380 per minute, and 82,800 per hour. 72 gallons a good-sized tank full of water in a second is very pretty swallowing, an early instance of thinking imperially. To Camden, in the Britannia, the disappearing water suggests another image. The inhabitants can boast, like the Spaniards, of having a bridge that feeds several flocks of sheep. Michaelham is almost the center of the Fanny Burney country. At Michaelham Church she was married to General D. R. Blay, Juniper Hall is half a mile from the church, Norbury Park lies west of the Mole, Camilla Lacey south of Norbury Park at West Humble. Fanny Burney, retired from her post of maid of honor and receiving a pension of £100 a year, met M. D. R. Blay in January, 1793, when she was staying with her friends the Locks at Norbury Park. He was living at Juniper Hall with other French émigrés a brilliant little colony, Madame de Stal was there, and an Arbonne, and a Lally Toll and all, and Talleyrand. The general began as tutor, and the course of Fanny Benny's acquaintance with Juniper Ians, as her sister Mrs. Phillips used to call them, and particularly with her French master, perhaps may be given in a few extracts from her correspondence. Madame de Stal Holstein to Miss Burney. Written from Juniper Hall, Dorking, Surrey, 1793. When Jay learned to read English Jay begun by Milton, to know all or renounce all in once. Jay follow the same system in writing my first English letter to Miss Burney, after such an enterprise nothing can affright me. Jay feel for her so tender a friendship that it melts my admiration, inspires my heart with hope of her indulgence, and impresses me with the idea that in a tongue even unknown Jay could express sentiments so deeply felt. My servant will return for a French answer. J entreat Miss Burney to correct the words but to preserve the sense of that card. Best compliments to my dear protectress, Madame Philip. Miss Burney to Dr. Burney, her father. Michael Ham, February 29, 1793. There can be nothing imagined more charming, more fascinating than this colony, between their sufferings and their agremens they occupy us almost wholly. M. de Narbonne, alas, has no £1,000 a year. He got over only £4,000 at the beginning, from a most splendid fortune, and, little foreseeing how all has turned out, he has lived, we fear, upon the principle. M. D. Arblay is one of the most singularly interesting characters that can ever have been formed. He has a sincerity, a frankness, an ingenuous openness of nature, that I had been unjust enough to think could not belong to a Frenchman. With all this, which is his military portion, he is passionately fond of literature, a most delicate critic in his own language, well versed in both Italian and German, and a very elegant poet. He has just undertaken to become my French master for pronunciation, and he gives me long daily lessons in reading. Pray expect wonderful improvements. In return I hear him in English. Miss Burney to Mrs. Locke. Thursday, Michael Ham. Madame de Stahl has written me two English notes, quite beautiful in ideas, and not very reprehensible in idiom. But English has nothing to do with elegance such as theirs at least, little and rarely. I am always exposing myself to the wrath of John Bull, when this coterie come into competition. It is inconceivable what a convert M. de Talleyrand has made of me, I think him now one of the first members, and one of the most charming, of this exquisite set. Dr. Burney to Miss Burney. Chelsea College, Tuesday morning, February 19, 1793. Why, Fanny, what are you about, and where are you? I shall write at you, not knowing how to write to you, as Swift did to the flying and romantic Lord Peterborough. Miss Burney to Mrs. Phillips. Friday, May 31st, Chessington. My dearest Freddie, in the beginning of her knowledge of this transaction, told me that Mr. Locke was of opinion that the £100 per annum might do, 
as it does for many a curate. MDA. Also most solemnly and affectingly declares that le simple necessaire is all he requires, and here, in your vicinity, would unhesitatingly be preferred by him to the most brilliant fortune in another sejour. If he can say that, what must I be not to echo it? I, who in the bosom of my most chosen, most darling friends. Dr. Burney to Miss Burney. May 1793. Dear Fanny I have for some time seen very plainly that you are a prize, and have been extremely uneasy at the discovery. You must have observed my silent gravity, surpassing that of mere illness and its consequent low spirits. I had some thoughts of writing to Susan about it, and intended begging her to do what I must now do for myself that is, beg, warn, and admonish you not to entangle yourself in a wild and romantic attachment which offers nothing in prospect but poverty and distress, with future inconvenience and unhappiness. From Madame D'Arblay to Mrs. August 2, 1793. Last Sunday, July 28, Mr. and Mrs. Locke, my sister and Captain Phillips, and my brother Captain Burney, accompanied us to the altar in Michaelham Church, since which the ceremony has been repeated in the chapel of the Sardinian ambassador, that if, by a counter-revolution in France, M. D. Arblay recovers any of his rights, his wife may not be excluded from their participation. You may be amazed not to see the name of my dear father upon this solemn occasion, but his apprehensions from the smallness of our income have made him cold and averse, and though he granted his consent, I could not even solicit his presence. From Madame D'Arblay to Dr. Burney after his first visit to her at Bookham. Bookham, August 94. It is just a week since I had the greatest gratification of its kind I ever, I think, experienced so kind a thought, so sweet a surprise as was my dearest father's visit. How softly and soothingly it has rested upon my mind ever since. How thankfully did I look back, the 28th of last month, upon a year that has not been blemished with one regretful moment. It was at Bookham that Madame D'Arblay wrote Camilla, and out of the sale of the novel she built her cottage, Camilla Lacey, on a plot of ground at West Humble leased to her by her friend Mr. Locke. Camilla, which Horace Walpole thought deplorable, infinitely worse than Cecilia, which was not so good as Evelina, was an instant success. Within a month Madame D'Arblay had made two thousand pounds, and Macaulay's estimate of her whole profits was over three thousand guineas. There was never a stranger climb down a ladder to fortune than Fanny Binney's. Evelina, her first and incomparably her best novel, brought her thirty pounds, Cecilia, her next, two hundred and fifty pounds, then came Camilla, and her last novel, The Wanderer, which she wrote after ten years' absence with her husband in France, actually sold 3,600 copies in six months at two guineas a copy, and was an absolute and hopeless failure. Camilla Lacey, invisible from the road, has been enlarged and altered to look like nothing the D.R. Blaze knew. Juniper Hall has also changed, but the splendid cedars which stand round its lawns must have been familiar to Talleyrand and Madame de Stal. They have grown curiously slowly, they do not strike one as larger than many trees which are known to be not more than a hundred and twenty years old those, for instance, at Farnham Castle, but John Timms, in his Promenade Round Dorking, written in 1823, speaks of them as immense, and as said to be of the finest growth in England. Cedars at Juniper Hall Cedars at Juniper Hall Norbury Park also has its famous trees. The Druids Walk, a path running under enormous yews, is no longer open to the public. But Lewis Jennings, 30 years ago, saw the trees and preserved a memory of them in field paths and green lanes. As the path descends the shadows deepen, and you arrive at a spot where a mass of yews of great size and vast age stretch up the hill, and beyond to the left as far as the eye can penetrate through the obscurity. The trees in their long and slow growth have assumed many wild forms, and the visitor who stands there towards evening, and peers into that somber grove, will sometimes yield to the spell which the scene is sure to exercise on imaginative natures, he will half fancy that these ghostly trees are conscious creatures, 
and that they have marked with mingled pity and scorn the long processions of mankind come and go like the insects of a day, through the centuries during which they have been stretching out their distorted limbs nearer and nearer to each other. Thick fibrous shoots spring out from their trunks, awakening in the memory long-forgotten stories of huge hairy giants, enemies of mankind even as the double fatal you itself was supposed to be in other days. The bark stands in distinct layers, the outer ridges moldering away, like the fragments of a wall of some ruined castle. The tops are fresh and green, but all below in that sunless recess seems dead. In another respect Norbury Park has changed in the opportunities the mole running through the park offers to anglers wishing to catch large trout. Mr. C.J. Sweet, writing in his handbook of Epsom, not longer ago than 1853, is pleased to take his reader with him by the banks of the mole, in which he has obtained permission from the proprietor to gather some of the finny treasures of its liquid mines. Quite unwarrantably, he assumes that his reader is no fisherman. Well, now, cast out your line, you have a respectable cast, for here the river is broad, you can scarce cast your line across it. Well, you must be a little patient you cannot expect to catch a fish the moment you throw in. I see you are not a great proficient at the pescatory science. Cast out very little line at first, perhaps about the length of your rod, and then increasing by degrees, you will soon be able to throw full across and with precision. Ah! Now you have a fine fish, let him down the stream a little. Now bring him close to the shore. Stay. It is safer to land him with the net. For this stream it is a very excellent fish, exactly three pounds weight, I find. How do I know it is just three pounds? I will tell you. He proceeds to do so. He knows because he has measured the fish and finds him nineteen inches long by ten in girth, and if you do the sum his way, it works out at three pounds. This is in accordance, as you suppose, with the mathematical law that similar solids are to each other in the triplicate ratio of one of their dimensions. That is the way to measure trout in Norbury Park. Two quaintly spelt epitaphs can be read on the black marble tombstones in Michaelham Church. Under one lies the body of Peter de la Haye, eldest yeoman of His Majesty's confectionery office, who departed this lie in 1684, and under the other Thomas Tooth, yeoman of his Matus Skillery, who deceased this life a year later. Almost opposite Juniper Hall is Fredley Farm, once the home of Conversation Sharp, hat maker, poet and member of Parliament. Fredley Farm, in the years between 1797 and 1835, when Sharp lived there, must have been visited by more distinguished poets, authors, politicians, wits, scholars, and artists than any other house in Surrey. Wordsworth came there, and Scott, Coleridge, Campbell, Southey and more, he talked painting with Lawrence, and sculpture with Chantry, Macaulay talked with him about everything and everybody, and so did Grote and Mill and Lockhart and Geoffrey, Porson was there, and perhaps had his favorite porter for breakfast, and the politicians were without number Brougham, Sheridan, Grattan, Talleyrand, Huskisson, and almost a link with today, Lord John Russell. Macaulay has left a few sentences which greater men than Sharp might not deserve as an epitaph, one thing I have observed in Sharp, which is quite peculiar to him among town wits and diners out. He never talks scandal. If he can say nothing good of a man, he holds his tongue. Yet with all his virtues and all his conversation, Sharp lacks his Boswell. A little further towards Dorking the road crosses the mole at Burford Bridge. The inn at Burford Bridge, a sort of Swindon of the Dorking Road, where everybody stops to have lunch or dinner, perhaps will again welcome a great admiral and finish a great poem. Nelson stayed there before leaving to command at Trafalgar, Keats came there to finish Endymion. His visit, he writes to his friend Benjamin Bailey, is to change the scene change the air, and give me a spur to wind up my poem, of which there are wanting about five hundred lines. Night on the Hill inspired him, in another letter he shows the way for other poets, I went up Box Hill this evening after the moon you a seen the moon came down and wrote some lines. And it is of the inn at Burford Bridge that the story is told, 
by Mortimer Collins, in his Walk Through Surrey, of Keats and the Waiter. Keats was reciting Endymion for wine, for wine we left our kernel tree, for wine we left our heath and yellow brooms, and cold mushrooms. The waiter heard, and obeyed, bringing mushrooms uncooked on a plate and a decanter of sherry. But that story is a little too artificial. Still, Endymion owes a good deal to the trees and the solitude of the hill above Burford Bridge. It was with the woods in his memory that Keats wrote something very like a description of Box Hill, with the mole below it. Where shall our dwelling be? Under the brow of some steep mossy hill, where ivy dun would hide us up, although spring leaves were none, and where dark yew trees as verussel through, will drop their scarlet berry cups of dew. Oh thou wouldst joy to live in such a place, dusk for our loves, yet light enough to grace those gentle limbs on mossy bed reclindy, for by one step the blue sky should st thou find, and by another in deep dell below, see, through the trees, a little river go all in its midday gold and glimmering. But the great poet and novelist of Box Hill came later. Mr. George Meredith lived his long life and died at last, on May 18, 1909, at his house, Flint Cottage, near Burford Bridge. It was by Box Hill that he imagined the gayest and wisest of novels and some of the most glorious of all English poetry. Here, in his chalet looking out over the Surrey Hills, he wrote the thrush in February I know him, February's thrush, and loud at eve he valentines on sprays that paw the naked bush where soon will sprout the thorns and vines. Now ere the foreign singer thrills our veil his plain song pipe he pours a herald of the million bills, and heed him not, the loss is yours. My study, flanked with ivied fur and budded beech with dry leaves curled, perched over you and juniper, he neighbors, piping to the world the wooded pathways dank on brown, the branches on gray cloud a web, the long green roller of the down, an image of the deluge ebb the lines ring with the bird's song, the light of all February evenings is on the hill. But if you are to take the heart of the poem, you must choose the last eight lines for love we earth, then serve we all, her mystic secret then is ours, we fall, or view our treasures fall, unclouded, as beholds her flowers. Earth, from a night of frosty wreck and robed in morning's mounted fire, when lowly, with a broken neck, the crocus lays her cheek to mire. The noblest philosophy of poetry belongs to the Surrey Hill, and so does the most wonderful love song of its century, the long, enchanted cadences of love in the valley lovely are the curves of the white owl sweeping wavy in the dusk lit by one large star. Lone on the fir branch, his rattle note unvaried, brooding over the gloom, spins the brown abahar. darker grows the valley, more and more forgetting, so were it with me if forgetting could be willed. Tell the grassy hollow that holds the bubbling well spring, tell it to forget the source that keeps it filled. Box Hill must be pretty nearly the best known hill in the world. It has all the advantages. It is within easy reach of London for school treats, excursions, choir outings, weekends, and all other journeys in open air, it has a railway station at its foot, and several inns, and a tea garden at the top, and a hundred bank holidays have left it unspoiled. The box trees that name the hill are the finest in England. Box trees love chalk, and here they drive their roots into the crown and scar of a cliff of chalk, so steep on one side down to the mole that a stone could almost be thrown from the path round the ridge into the water. On the grass outside the box grove the distance to the level valley below deceives even more strangely. It looks as if you could drive a golf ball straight from the hill onto the green, you may speculate as to the beauty of the arc curved in the sunlight, and the deadness with which the ball would lie after an absolutely perpendicular drop to the extreme danger of those disinterested in the experiment. But the hill is not really steep enough. The contours crowd on the map, but they show that you would have to drive nearly a quarter of a mile. At a distance, in spring and summer, the trees which mark Box Hill are not box or juniper, but the white beams that patch the deeper green of the oaks and beeches with glaucous grey. The box trees, though they're thick, snaky stems look as if they might be any age, are not all of them old. The trees have more than once been cut and sold. 
Sir Henry Mild may put them up for auction for £12,000 in 1795 and apparently sold them for £10,000 two years later, with 12 years to cut the wood in. In later days, the wisdom of a war office cleared a wide space of trees and built a fort there, the wisdom of another war office abandoned the fort as useless. There it remains, behind spiked railings, the idlest monument of a whim. View of Box Hill Misty Day. View of Box Hill, Misty Day. Dorking. Dorking. Chapter 29. Dorking. Mr. Stigjins at the Marquis of Granby a ruin the Battle of Dorking real fighting the table and cellar water sauchi, a delicious dish wild cherries Dorking snails sandy kind women without roses Shrove Tuesday football Dorking's glory jump at Kotmandine an earthquake giant and dwarf. Dorking has twice had history made for it and travellers come to visit the scenes. It was in the bar of the Marquis of Granby at Dorking that Sam Weller met his mother-in-law, and watched the Reverend Mr. Stigjins make toast and sip the pineapple rum and water, and advised Mr. Weller Sr. as to the best method of treating shepherds with cold water. Pilgrims cross the Atlantic to visit the Marquis of Granby. No Dorking in bears the name, nor ever has, but Americans will tell you that the Marquis is only a name Dickens invented to cover the identity of the white horse, which fronts the cobbles of Dorking High Street with its gables and white and green paint much as it must have done in the time of Dickens. Dickens himself, in all the year round he did not sign the article, but in that paper none but he might have written of that inconceived the Marquis to be the king's head, in the old days a great coaching house on the Brighton Road. It stood at the corner of High Street and South Street, and in South Street today you may still gaze at its unhappy walls and windows. The old lattices are boarded up, smashed with stones, the rooms are empty. When the post office came to stand at the corner, the king's head became a tenement house, afterwards a ruin. The Battle of Dorking took place on the ridge north of the town in 1871, and resulted, after the invasion, in the conquest of Great Britain by Germany. It all came about perfectly simply. A rising in India had taken away part of our army, war with the United States over Canada had taken another 10,000 troops, and half of what were left were dealing with a Fenian revolution in Ireland. Germany put to sea and sank our fleet with torpedoes, a new and dreadful engine of war, then the German army landed and the end came at once. At least, it would have come, if Sir George Chesney, who described the Battle of Dorking in Blackwood's magazine, had prophesied truly. He lived till 1895, to see more than 20 years after his battle pass without an invasion, but the battle, for some of his readers, became a very real thing. The late Lewis Jennings, in his Field Paths and Green Lanes, tells us that he had a friend who, believing most people to have very hazy notions of history, was in the habit of saying, of course you remember the Battle of Dorking. Well, this was the very place where it was fought. He was seldom contradicted. The real history of Dorking has traditions of the table and the cellar. Dorking fowls perhaps first came to the neighborhood with the Romans and poultry and Dorking have been associated ever since. The true Dorking fowl is a large, well-feathered bird, and walks on five toes instead of lesser fowls four. He has always been a great fowl for the table and historians have written about him since the days of Columella. Thus a contributor to the Gentleman's Magazine, in 1763. An incredible quantity of poultry is sold in Dorking, and it is well known to the lovers of good eating for being remarkably large and fine. I have seen capons about Christmas which weighed between 7 and 8 pounds each out of their feathers, and were sold at 5 shillings apiece nor are the geese brought to the market here about Michaelmas less excellent in their kind. The town is supplied with sea fish from Bright Helmstone and Worthing, in Sussex. Dorking. Dorking. The Dorking cooks knew well what to do with the sea fish when they got them from Brighton. Dorking was famous for a particular way of making water sauchi, a delicious dish of various fishes, of which Mr. J. L. Andry in the Surrey Archaeological Collections, has preserved the recipe rescued from an 1833 cookery book by a lady. Stew two or three flounders, some parsley roots and leaves, 
30 peppercorns, and a quart of water, till the fish are boiled to pieces, pulp them through a sieve. Set over the fire the pulp fish, the liquor that boiled them, some perch, tench, or flounders, and some fresh roots or leaves of parsley, simmer all till done enough, then serve in a deep dish. Slices of bread and butter are to be sent to table to eat with the sauchi. It looks rather vague, but the gentlemen's dorking club used to assemble every other Thursday from June to November to discuss the tench and flounders at the Red Lion, and the kings had used even to attract diners out from London, especially Dutch merchants, who were particularly fond of the admirable dish. Wine, too, was grown in the town. There was a particular kind of wild cherry, of which Aubrey was told by John Evelyn that it made a most excellent wine, little inferior to the French claret, it would even keep longer. With the cherry wine, perhaps, you would have eaten dorking snails. They were large, white snails, which some said were brought to the downs by the pilgrims, others thought were introduced from Italy by the Earl of Arundel, Lord Marshal of England, Lady Arundel used to cook and eat them. They roamed the downs by Box Hill and other chalky places, and are still to be found there. Perhaps the Romans brought them, but they are not peculiar to Surrey and Sussex, I have found them on chalk in Hertfordshire, and I have heard of them on the Cotswolds. Such good fare should have built up the constitutions of Dorking people. But it was not so in Aubrey's time, for he picks out the Dorking men and women as weaker and paler than others. He liked to see women with rosy faces. Handsome women, viz. Sanguine, as in Barks, Oxon, Somerset, and C are rare at this market, they have a mealy complexion, and something hale like the French Picards, light grey-eyed, and the kind hereabout are of sandy color, like those in Picardy. None, especially those above the hill, have roses in their cheeks. The men and women are not so strong or of so warm a complexion as in Wiltshire, Gloucestershire, Herefordshire, and C. The White Horse, Dorking. The White Horse, Dorking. One, at least, of the old customs of the town survived until very recent memory. Now it has died out with the rest. From Mr. J. S. Bright's history of Dorking I learned that the office of constable has lapsed, the places of the beggar poker and the ale taster have been taken by the local police. Parish funds are no longer dispensed at the close of church service. The poor on St. Thomas's Day used to go out gooding, today they plead no more. The ditchling singers, which were the dorking waits, no longer keep Christmas. On the 29th of May, sacred to King Charles II of blessed memory, an oak bough used to hang from the church tower, the tower is bare throughout the year. Guy Fox has been burned for the last time, the Jack in the Green dances no longer in cowslips and buttercups on the 1st of May. One ancient rite alone persisted until the other day. Every Shrove Tuesday, in dim remembrance of the great carnival which in ancient, pre-Reformation days, preceded the rigors of Lent, mummers made the circuit of the town. In the afternoon all the shops were shut and boarded up, and a game of football, started at the church gates, rioted up and down the main street. In the Southern Weekly News, an account describing the game of 1888 says that just before midday a procession of men grotesquely attired was formed, headed by a man bearing three footballs on a triangular frame, over which was the motto kick away both wig and Tory, wind and water dorking's glory. The town crier started the game, kicked off the first ball at 2 o'clock, and stopped it at 6. But that was in 1888. Twenty years have changed the crier's duties. Fines and the police have stopped the old custom altogether. Fifty years ago the Dorking cricket ground at Cotmondine was hardly less well known than the Oval. Two Dorking cricketers belong to the glorious days of Cotmondine. Henry Jupp was born in the town, and Tom Humphrey at Mitcham, but both kept public houses in Dorking, and both played great cricket for the county. Many stories are told of Jupp, who was a favorite with the crowd, but one of the oldest belongs to Cotmandine. The match was for his benefit, and he was batting. Playing back at a ball, he trod on his wicket, and a bale fell. He picked up the bale, replaced it, 
and was reminded that he was out. Out? At Dorking. Not me. Nor did he go out, but made a hundred instead. Another of Dorking's inhabitants made history in a different way. Braley's history of Surrey was printed throughout in Dorking, and Ada, the printer, is said to have spent over £10,000 in the printing. What he made out of it is doubtful, he had made the £10,000 by his three businesses as printer, chemist, and perfumer. The real Dorking, apart from its battles over and to come, is sufficiently happy to have had very little history. The Danes sacked it, tradition says, they cannot have had much plunder. Julius Caesar marched through it, perhaps, if there was a Dorking then, the Roman road, at all events, the Great Stone Street, which is still an English road by Ockley to the south, drove through the corner of Dorking Churchyard. Another event of the dark days was an earthquake in 1551, in which, according to Henry McKin's diary, pots, panes, and disease downst and met fell down about house and with many odor things. But an earthquake which could do nothing more than make pots, pans and dishes dance is hardly an earthquake at all. Perhaps its greatest event of historical times was a funeral. On the 23rd of December, 1815, Charles Howard, 11th Duke of Norfolk, was buried at Dorking with the pomp and pageantry of a king. The procession left St. James's Square in London at nine in the morning, the coach and six horses of the Duke of Sussex and twenty carriages followed it, they reached Dorking at five. Deputy Garter King of Arms, Norway King of Arms, three heralds and three pursuivants attended in tabards of state, Deputy Garter, after the service, proclaimed the Duke's styles and titles. The Most High, Mighty, and Most Potent Prince. Charles Howard, Duke of Norfolk. Earl Marshal. An hereditary Earl Marshal of England. Earl of Arundel Castle. Earl of Surrey, Earl of Norfolk, Earl of Norwich. Baron Mowbray. Baron of Howard, Baron of Segrave. Baron Breweries of Gower. Baron Fitzalan, Baron Warren, Baron Clun. Baron Oswald Esther, Baron Malt Ravers. Baron Greystock, Baron Finneville, Baron Verdon. Baron Lovetoe, Baron Strange. And Premier Baron Howard of Castle Rising. Premier Duke, Premier Earl, Premier Baron of England. And Chief of the Illustrious Family of the Howards. The parish registers add little that can have stirred the world. Eleven years after the earthquake, on February 28, 1562, Owen Tani was christened, who, a later hand adds, scoffing at thunder, standing under a beech was stroked to death, his clothes stinking with a sulfurous stench, being about the age of twenty years or thereabouts. Another entry is more personal. Defoe, perhaps, who lived near Dorking, and knew two Dorking giants, might have liked to see the parish register side by side with a note in his tour. The tour gives two measurements of the giants. At this place lived another ancient gentleman and his son, of a very good family, Augustine Belson, ESQ, the father measured seven feet and a half, and allowing that he might have sunk for his age, being seventy-one years old, and the son measured two inches taller than his father. From the parish register, 1738, May 16, Richard Matterson, aged twenty-nine years, and was not above three feet and three inches high, but in thickness grown as much as any other person. He was all his life troubled with an inward griping distemper, of which he at last died very suddenly. Thus the quiet life of Dorking in the quiet centuries. The days before the repeal of the Corn Laws, with the introduction of machinery for hand labor, saw the usual terror and the usual threats. Captain Rock and Captain Swing signed the letters which were sent to Dorking farmers, special constables were sworn, the windows of the Red Lion were broken, and once, on November 22, 1830, a van drawn by four horses took Dorking prisoners to the county jail. Cavalry patrolled the town by night, but that November saw the end of Dorking's nearest knowledge of modern war. Chapter 30 Wotton and Leith Hill 
Denby's Tivani and die a temple of gloom Watton House John Evelyn a child of five the crossways dab checks in the tilling born Friday street a Swiss tarn Leith Hill the day of days 41 spires unseen on Steve Berry camp the black adder of Leith Hill. Northwest of Dorking, and overlooking the wide greenness of the wheeled away to Leith and Holmberry Hills, is Denby's, now the residence of the Lord Lieutenant of the County, and once the property of Mr. Jonathan Tyres. Jonathan Tyres was the Kirill Fi of a less aspiring age. He was the founder of Vauxhall Gardens, where, as Boswell puts it, you had a form of entertainment peculiarly adapted to the taste of the English nation, there being a mixture of curious show gay exhibition music, vocal and instrumental, not too refined for the general ear, for all which only a shilling is paid, and, though last, not least, good eating and drinking for those who choose to purchase that regale. The founder of Vauxhall Gardens was also the father of Tom Tyres, the wit who parroted Virgil over Dr. Johnson's teacups. T. Vaniant die, T. Distant. A phrase which has been of incalculable service to tea drinking undergraduates. It was Tom Tyres who summed up Dr. Johnson, to the doctor's liking, Tom Tyres described me the best, sir, said he, you are like a ghost, you never speak till you are spoken to. Jonathan Tyres reserved a private gloom for his own garden at Denby's. He named one of his plantations I.L. Pence Rosso and in it built a small temple which he bespattered with dismal texts. A clock struck every minute, to remind the visitor of the constant approach of death and in an alcove were two life-size paintings of a Christian and an unbeliever in their last moments. At the end of a walk stood a pair of pedestals, one of which carried a gentleman's skull and the other a lady's skull with appropriate verses, upon all of which melancholy properties Mr. John Timms in his picturesque promenade round Dorking, printed in 1823, meditates thus. Such eccentric imageries, making irrefragible appeals to the feelings of the dissolute debauchee, might form a persuasive penitentiary, and urge the necessity of amendment with better effect than all the farcical frenzies of mere formalists and fanatics. A later owner removed temple and all. Denby's of today offers the traveler a kindlier welcome by allowing access to more than one private roadway, from which the outlook over the country to the south is more than worth the steady climb from Dorking. The road runs on to Ranmer Common, where Mr. John Timms was able to look north to the dome and pinnacles of St. Paul's Cathedral and Westminster Abbey, but I was not lucky enough with the weather. Ranmer has a church more finely placed, I think, than any in the county, except perhaps St. Martha's, but St. Martha's has no spire like Ranmer. Ranmer Spire is a landmark, you take your bearings from that graceful needle for many miles in central Surrey, as you may from Crooksbury Hill in the west. East Surrey has no landmark quite so friendly. Polston Lacey, where Sheridan lived after his second marriage, is a mile away to the north. To the south, below Ranmer, at the foot of the downs, is Westcott, once a small hamlet and now something more, with a pretty little church set on a hill. Further on the road west, is Wotton Hatch, and at Wotton House and in the church you are with John Evelyn. Of all the great men who belong to Surrey history, John Evelyn is first. He had not the religious exaltation, nor the ambition of a stern divine like Archbishop Abbott, he had the dignity, but not the desire of public service, of a politician such as Sir Arthur Onslow, he was not a fiery reformer like William Cobbett, or a diplomatist like Sir William Temple, he left behind him no such monument of stately learning as Edward Gibbon, nor a record of military service like that of the great Howard, the general of Queen Elizabeth's navy at sea against the navy of Spain. But what he left will endure, the fame of an English gentleman who was honest, surrounded by intrigue, unambitious of honors and titles, a royalist who had the friendship of kings whom courtiers flattered, a virtuoso of learning hardly equaled in his time, a diarist whose jottings, never meant for printing, are a classic, a pious, honorable, shrewd, country squire of deep family affections, and set in a niche of his own by all who live and work in the country today, as one of the greatest of English woodmen and gardeners. Upon his grave, on the 200th anniversary of his death, February 27, 1906, 
the Society of Antiquaries placed a wreath of bays in honor, I think, unique in the annals of Surrey churches. Wotton House Wotton House The Evelyns have their own chapel in Wotton Church, locked by the same wooden gate which opened to John Aubrey. In the little square space lie John Evelyn and his wife, in raised tombs, and on the walls are elaborate memorials of other Evelyns. One tomb the chapel does not hold, though John Evelyn intended it should. His son Richard, who lived to be scarcely five years old, died at Say's Court, John Evelyn's property in Kent, and lies at Deptford. The father wrote nothing sadder than his short record of his child's few years a strange enough comment on the life of the nursery, if it was a nursery, of Stuart days. At two years and a half old, he could perfectly read any of the English, Latin, French, or Gothic letters, pronouncing the three first languages exactly. He had, before the fifth year, or in that year, not only skill to read most written hands, but to decline all the nouns, conjugate the verbs regular, and most of the irregular, learned out pure elise, got by heart almost the entire vocabulary of French primitives and words, could make congruous syntax, turn English into Latin, and vice versa, construe and prove what he read and did the government, and use of relatives, verbs, substantives, ellipses, and many figures and tropes, and made a considerable progress in Comenius's Janua, began himself to write legibly, and had a strong passion for Greek. He was all life, all prettiness, far from morose, sullen, or childish in anything he said or did. Far from childish it is perverse enough. John Evelyn himself began the dreary round of tropes and primitives almost as early. He was taught in a little room above Wotton Church porch, by one friar, when he was nearly four. The porch has been renewed, and the room has gone. Wotton House stands in a dip of grassland under noble trees. It is little like what it was in Evelyn's day, for fire has taken away part of it, and much that is new is added. The result is partly imposing, partly incongruous, but much of the best of the house has aged well, and the red brick court and walled carriage drive stand finely from their background. Behind the house is the terraced garden which Evelyn himself made, and beyond it a streak of water running between wooded banks away to the blue dimness of Leith Hill. John Evelyn shall describe Wotton as he knew it. The house is large and ancient, suitable to those hospitable times, and so sweetly environed with those delicious streams and venerable woods, as in the judgment of strangers as well as Englishmen it may be compared to one of the most pleasant seats in the nation, and most tempting for a great person and a wanton purse to make it conspicuous. I will say nothing of the air, because the preeminence is universally given to Surrey, the soil being dry and sandy, but I should speak much of the gardens, fountains, and groves that adorn it, were they not generally known to be amongst the most natural, and, till this later and universal luxury of the whole nation, since abounding in expenses, the most magnificent that England afforded. Between Wotton and Westcott is the rookery, once the home of David Malthus, father of the historian and economist. The name of David Malthus hides behind his more famous sons, but he was a translator of the sorrows of Werther and of Paul and Virginia, who deserves memories of his own. He lies in Wotton churchyard. From Wotton one might go on by Abing or Hammer to Goms Hall, but the natural round, perhaps, and certainly one of the loveliest walks in the county, is by Abing or Hatch and Friday Street to Leith Hill. But by neither way must anyone walking by these roads miss the crossways, a mile west of Wotton Hatch, with its perfect little farmhouse and the stream running through the fields past Abing or Mill. The Crossways farmhouse perhaps Mr. Meredith had the name in his mind when he imagined the most gracious of his heroines is of all the Surrey farmhouses I know the most fascinating. It lies behind a high wall, which runs round a square little garden, you peep through a gateway covered with ivy, and find an old lichened, weather-worn house, with ornamented brickwork and latticed windows, a house which Evelyn's grandfather may have known, and would find today unaltered. Crossways Farm is most like Sly Fields, the old Jacobean house near Bookham, but it is smaller, and is, I think, perfect, whereas Sly Fields is a fragment. Crossways, besides its delightful front, 
has a fine chimney stack, and a strange but most satisfying buttress which ties the house to the garden wall. The farm lies among pasture lands through which rushes the prettiest possible little brook. It is the Tillingborn, here a stripling, and never much bigger for that matter, but here it is the meadow brook in its ideal form. It runs from a broken mill wheel below an old hammer pond, past a cottage shaded by four noble ewes, and then races through two meadows faster, I think, than any brook anywhere else in Surrey. The water runs with the deep sparkle of cut glass, forget-me-nots grow about it, and reed mace and figwort and bittersweet, water hens wander in the shaven grass of its brim, and dab checks go plump in the current like cricket balls. There may be trout in the stream here as there are by Albury, but I am sure it runs too fast and round too many corners for anybody to catch them. Crossways Farmhouse, Abinger Crossways Farmhouse, Abinger The road leads south and uphill from the crossways to Abinger Hatch, bordering deep woods of oak and beech. In July and August the glades of the Abinger Woods, like the woods about Biflate and Woking, gleam with the pinks and purples of Rose Bay. Abinger Hatch is no more a village than Wotton Hatch, both are wayside inns, and Abinger Hatch one of the best country inns to be found in a walk Saturdays and Sundays in the summer fill it with guests from almost everywhere, who sit down to a long table, my own first visit to the inn was on an ordinary weekday, and the surprise was to discover that there was a hot lunch ready. Such surprises are rare. But Abinger has everything worth keeping of the old customs. The stocks stand at the churchyard gate, mouldering, but they are there. The inn has the old name, and the little old bar, and the old-fashioned custom of hanging the squire's portrait in the dining room. Only the church is a difficulty. It is kept locked, and it takes ten minutes to walk to the rectory to get the key too far for the patience of those who would merely wish for rest and refreshment in the cool and sacredness of a country church. I was fortunate in my day, for I found the vestry door accidentally open, and a kindly countrywoman cleaning the church, she let me in. The nave, with its hugely thick walls and lancet windows, is unlike any other Surrey church, Mr. Philip Johnston, who perhaps knows more about Surrey churches than anyone else, dates it at 1080. Nobody should go straight from Abinger Hatch to Leith Hill. You should turn aside to the left and let the road take you eastwards into the woods. Then you may come upon the tiny gathering of cottages called Friday Street with a suddenness which is a delight. You turn a corner of the road and you are in Switzerland. A little tarn, unruffled by any wind, mirroring a hill of pine trees, lies below you, beyond the water is the blue reek of wood fires, open grass runs to the edge of the lake, a light green rim to the dark of the pines. So do the little emerald tarns lie like saucers full of sky and trees in pockets of the Alps. The illusion wants but the tinkle of cowbells, it would be pleasant to present bells to straying goats. From Friday Street to the tower on Leith Hill is a walk through the very depths of the wood. Heather glows in the openings of the pines, bracken brushes rain on your sleeve, bilberries ripen in the scented heat, and almost any path though not the road runs higher and higher to the open ground at the very top. At the top, 965 feet up, you are on the highest hill in the southeast of England. Leith Hill is not for the multitude which climbs Box Hill. It is further from London, and further from a railway station. But it calls its own companies of travelers, and they are often large. The roads from Holmwood, which is the nearest station, are lined with notices indicating the right direction. When brakes carry excursionists from Holmwood, the brakes halt at the foot, and the visitors climb. The climb ends in a tower with a story. It was built by Richard Hull, eldest bencher of the Inner Temple and member of several Irish parliaments. He built it, his Latin inscription informs you, for the enjoyment of himself and his neighbors, and six years later, in 1772, he was buried under it. Gratefully enough, the neighborhood rifled the dead man's tower of its doors and windows, then, by way of compensation, to prevent more robbery, filled it half full of cement. It was left to the late owner of Wotton, Mr. W. J. Evelyn, in 1863 to restore the building and to add a staircase, 
and I believe the platform of the roof stands now exactly a thousand feet above sea level. Friday Street Friday Street The full view from Leith Hill has been described by a number of very fortunate persons. Aubrey was one of the first, and he estimated that the whole circumference of the horizon could not be less than 200 miles. It is probably more. But did Aubrey ever see the full vision? If he did, he climbed the hill on a lucky day. English weather sends few days clear enough of mist to set a sharp outline on the Kentish Downs, the Buckinghamshire Hills and the slopes of Wiltshire, and the combination of transparent air and presence in the neighborhood of a great height must be rare for ordinary men. Yet Leith Hill, even on the mistiest day, can give the true notion of height. The first day I climbed it was after a night of July rain. A wind had sprung up and seemed from the lower roads about the hill to have blown the distance clear. Then came an hour of hot sunshine, and the sudden view of the wheeled was of a sea of cloud. For two or three miles, perhaps, near the hill the oaks and elms, the roofs and the roads were plain enough. Beyond swam an infinite veil. But the sense of height, of detachment, remained. I have never been on Leith Hill on the day of days, nor seen the spires of 41 churches in London, which the ordnance surveyors counted in 1844, nor watched a sail on the sea through Shoreham Gap. But I was once there on an August day of sunshine and cold rain and wind, and saw all the southern view in a way I should like to see it again. I came to the hill from the west by cold harbor, and black rain brooded over all the distance to the east. To the southeast the air was clear to the Kent horizon, northeast the glass of the Crystal Palace winked in the sun. Then the rain came down over the wheel to the south and the west, and the cloud rode over the fields and dotted trees like the shower of rain in Struwelpeter, blotting out the villages and the Sussex Downs one by one. Then behind the cloud drove up blank blue air, and to the west Hindhead and Blackdown and hills beyond them came clean cut in a cold wind that made my eyes water, Hascom Bay Hill stood up dark and far, and the hogs back to the north of it, edged like grey paper, I was lucky to see the hogs back so plainly, the vendor of tea and melons at the tower told me, she had seen the sea by Shoreham Gap that morning, but often went a week without seeing the hogs back. Below, to the southwest, Vaukery Pond lay a gold mirror, Chanctonbury Ring faithfully marked the south as the rain drew past, and I left Leith Hill with the rain cloud riding downwind like night over the Weald of Kent. Among the Pines Among the Pines The unsatisfactory result of climbing a hill for a view is that you must come down again. Leith Hill is better than other hills for the reason that if you come down the best way, which is eastwards, you can climb up almost as high again on the other side of the dip and walk nearly a mile in the wind at the edge of a ridge overlooking half Kent and Sussex, and then come to the prettiest village of all the downs. Friday Street is less a village than a handful of cottages, but Cold Harbour has its church and its inn, the plough, and its scattered roofs lie on the side of a valley of green brake and red sand. Cold Harbour is almost as Swiss as Friday Street, and the paint of its inn as bright white as any in the sun of the Engadine. If Friday Street lacks the cowbells, Cold Harbour would be complete with the grey turbulence of snow water. Left and right of Leith Hill are two great camps, both of them firmly linked in local legend with Caesar and the Danes, and both of them connected by history with neither. Like the camp on St. George's Hill, the camps on Unstebury and Holmbury Hills were ancient British settlements, places of refuge where the men of the tribe left their women and children and cattle while they themselves went out with their stone-tipped arrows to find the men of other tribes. Unstebury Camp is the larger, and covers 11 acres or so of what is now deep beechwood. Unstebury has an easy and certain derivation. Heenstichberig is early English for the berry of the highway. Mr. H. E. Malden, in the Surrey Archaeological Collections, points out that this may be the Roman Stone Street, which passes half a mile left of the hill, or it may be the ancient British road which runs from Cold Harbour to Dorking, the latter he thinks most likely. Certainly a native with proper pride would hardly refer to the newly engineered road in the distance in preference to the wonderful highway close at hand. It runs from the hilltop north and south, cut deep in the yellow sandstone as the ancient Briton liked his pathways cut. 
a man 20 feet high could walk invisible between the banks of that sheltering trackway. On Steve Berry Camp came near to harboring a modern garrison early in the last century, when the Napoleon scare was at its wildest heights, and good citizens went to bed praying that the next day Boney might not be thundering at the town gates, it was actually proposed that the old British camp should be used to shelter the women and children of Dorking. Another battle, an extra rumor or two, might have filled the breaches with the dauntless subjects of King George. Happily, that cloud vanished. Round the camps and the battlefields of the heights of Leith Hill and Holmbury cluster the names of wilder enemies than men. Bearhurst, Boar's Hill and Wolf's Hill belong to the neighborhood, and members of the Surrey Archaeological Society have heard Mr. Malden discourse incisively on the scavengers' work after the Battle of Ockley, when the West Saxons buried their dead, and there were no Danes left alive to bury theirs. Leith Hill has another curious record of an animal. On July 27, 1876, a tourist walking over the hill trod upon a snake, which bit him, he managed to get to Ockley, but died in two days. The interest of the record is that Mr. J. S. Bright, the historian of Dorking, says that the snake was a black adder, Coronella laevis, while Mr. Bollinger, in his list of Surrey snakes does not admit that the Coronella laevis has ever occurred in the county. From on Steeberry the old high road runs steep to Dorking a road of later memories of sudden death than British battles. On a gallows at the foot of the hill three highwaymen once hung in chains. A house has been built upon the very spot. Looking towards Dorking from Westcott. Looking towards Dorking from Westcott. Chapter 31 Dorking to Rygate Nicknames Anastasius Hope Deep Dean Mr. Howard's Garden Betchworth Chestnuts and Castle Brockham Badgers The Straw Yards Bakers Among the Roses Lee, Lily Place Arderns and Copley's Sir Thomas's Notion of a Gentleman Buckland's Barn. Of three dull nicknames, stuck like burrs on the mantles of Dorking's prophets, the dullest and prosiest has stuck to the richest. Conversation is a pretty severe burden for a man named plain Richard Sharp to carry, the hideousness of the Balt Elysian of Silva Evelyn sets the teeth on edge, he developed into Sylvie as well as Silver Evelyn, poor man, capability Brown, the gardener, must have been buttonholed by a thousand boars, but Anastasia's hope is beyond tolerance. How should such a name be endured? Thomas Hope endured it. He was the owner of Deep Dean, the great house and garden and park a mile west of Dorking, property that once belonged to the Howards, and in particular to the ninth Duke of Norfolk. His father was a vastly wealthy Amsterdam merchant, he himself a patron and a critic of art. He gave Turvalson his first commission in marble, and Turvalson celebrated the day of the order every year of his life. But he owed his name to a romance, Anastasius, or Memoirs of a Modern Greek, which he wrote at his leisure, and which places him, as Mr. John Timms, promenading around Dorking in 1824, assures us, in the highest list of eloquent writers and superior men. The Edinburgh Reviewer was not less effusive. Until Anastasius was published he had known Mr. Hope merely as the author of an essay on household furniture and interior decoration. In Anastasius was the change from the upholsterer to the epicurean. Deep Dean still holds statues and pictures, of which Mr. Bright, in his History of Dorking, gives a long list. Such a list belongs rightly to a history, but since the pictures can no longer be seen, other pages need but note that permission is occasionally granted to walk in the park Aubrey's engaging description of the garden as he saw it late in the 17th century, a hundred years before Mr. Thomas Hope, belongs to his century and ours. Near this place the Honorable Charles Howard of Norfolk hath very ingeniously contrived a long hope, i.e., according to Virgil, deductus valis, in the most pleasant and delightful solitude for house, gardens, orchards, boscages etc., that I have seen in England, it deserves a poem and was a subject worthy of Mr. Cowley's muse. The true name of this hope is Dibden, quasi-deep dean. Mr. Howard hath cast this hope in the form of a theatre on the sides whereof he hath made seven narrow walks like the seats of a theatre, one above another, about six in number, done with a plough, which are bordered with thyme, and some cherry trees, myrtles, etc. 
Here was a great many orange trees and syringas which were then in flower. In this garden are twenty-one sorts of thyme. The pit, as I may call it, is stored full of rare flowers and choice plants. He hath there two pretty lads his gardeners, who wonderfully delight in their occupation, and this lovely solitude, and do enjoy themselves so innocently in that pleasant corner, as if they were out of this troublesome world, and seem to live in the state of innocency. But not the gardeners alone. The visitor had a quiet mind who could exclaim, as John Aubrey did, that the pleasures of the garden were so ravishing that I can never expect any enjoyment beyond it but the kingdom of heaven. Aubrey has been called ill-natured, and a scandal lover. Nobody ever called him that who has met him in a garden. East of Dorking and the Deep Dean are half a dozen Betchworths. Betchworth Clump rides a shoulder of the Downs, with a superb view to the south, Betchworth Village lies under the clump a mile and more from the foot of the hill, Betchworth Park and Castle are between the village and Deep Dean. Through the park runs a road, and an avenue of wonderful limes, but the castle, which cannot be seen from the part of the park open to the public, is a castle no longer. It was never more than a castle in name, Sir Thomas Brown fortified it under Henry VI, but it saw no fighting. Thomas Hope's father, when he added Betchworth to his purchase of the Deep Dean, pulled it down, and a mere fragment remains. Not much younger than the ruins, perhaps, are the gnarled and twisted bowls of the Betchworth sweet chestnuts. Albury Park holds some giants, and there are a few trees quite as fine in Weybridge Gardens that once stood on royal ground, but the Betchworth chestnuts must be older than either. Badgers must have been common by Betchworth, for Brocks multiply in the local names. Brockham Village, with a pretty green, stands beyond Betchworth Park on the Mole, probably the badger has left Brockham since the bricklayer came out of Dorking. The Red Lion, Betchworth. The Red Lion, Betchworth. Other outdoor life has survived, Brockham still plays good cricket. Cricket was a favorite game on Brockham Green very early in its history. Cotmandine was not far away, and no doubt Cotmandine cricket encouraged smaller games. One of the customs of Brockham players was to wear straw hats of a pattern made in the village, and when the eleven went to play over at Mitcham there were derisive shouts here come the Brockham straw yards. But the straw yards won, and in an innings. It would be quite easy for a stranger to pass through the Betchworth that lies on the main road between Dorking and Rygate, and to believe he had seen it all. But the best of Betchworth is by the little church, south of the main road on a bend of the mole. The church, cool and white, stands deep in a ring of beeches, elms and ash trees, and the baker and grocer of the village lives among roses in a little street of cottage gardens opposite. At least one of the bequests to the parish is curiously described on the church wall. Mrs. Margaret Fenwick left 200 pounds, which was to be used partly in binding out poor children as apprentices, and partly in preferring in marriage such maid servants born in this parish as shall respectfully live seven years in any service and whose friends are not able to do it. The intention is clear, but friends unable to live respectfully seven years in one service would, one would think, be numerous. The real centre from which to see the country east and south of Betchworth is Rygate, but a walk from Dorking to Rygate might very well take in Lee, which is a little out of the beaten track. But if you ask the way, do not inquire for Lee. Lie is the name. The village is very small, but it stands round a pretty little green, and one of the old timbered cottages with a horsham slab roof sets the right grace to a group with the church and its trees. Lee Church has fine brasses of the Ardern family, who had Lee Place, once an ancient and moated house half a mile north of the village, now a rather nondescript but quaint building, the moat remains, the house has been partly pulled down, partly rebuilt. Lee Place belonged first to the great family of de Bros, but its earliest legends are of the Arderns. There was a Sir Thomas de Ardern who wooed Marjorie, the wife of Nicholas de Poynings, in a very rough manner, he saw no way to making her his own wife except by making her widow of de Poynings, and so killed him. Tradition says that she died of a broken heart, and haunts Lee Place, a sad lady in white, but it was probably not Sir Thomas, but a descendant of his, who first had Lee Place. Still, 
to Li belongs the story. After the Ardernes, Li place came to the Copleys, who were also of Gatton. One of them, Sir Thomas Copley, had original notions as to the proper bearing and attributes of an English gentleman. Mr. John Watney, writing in the Surrey Archaeological Collections, gives a long letter which Sir Thomas wrote to Queen Elizabeth in 1575, defending himself, among other things, for having taken to himself titles to which he had no right. His defense is ingenious. As to the other point, where your majesty showed to be informed, that I had attributed to myself in those letters of mark greater titles than became me or than I could well avow, that must needs be either in that I termed myself nobiles anglos, or in that, for more credit both to myself and your service, I was bold to set down Dominus de Gatton, Ruffe etc., naming certain my lordships. To the first I beseech your majesty to consider, that there is no other Latin word proper to signify a gentleman born, but nobiles. As for Jean Rossus, as I have read in good writers Vinum Generosum, for a good cup of wine and equus Jean Rossus for a courageous horse, so I never heard Jean Rossus alone so used, to signify a gentleman born, but only on the gross Latin current in Westminster Hall, and, if I had set down Jean Rossus Anglos, it would have then construed rather a gentle Englishman than an English gentleman. And as for Armiger, it had yet been more barbarous, for surely the world here abroad would rather have understood by that strange term a page or a sword bearer than a gentleman of the better sort, as custom has made it to be construed in England, that this is simply true, I doubt not, but that your majesty, excelling in your knowledge of good letters, will easily judge a gracious sentence on my suit. So that in setting down the term nobiles used through the world for a gentleman, I had no intention to make myself more noble than I am, but to take only that which was due unto me. Buckland. Buckland. I have taken Lee on the way to Rygate. But the best way to see Lee on a short walk is to reach it from Rygate traveling west. The introduction is by way of Rygate Heath, a wide and breezy common on which an old black windmill stands high above heather and bracken, a gaunt and wild neighbor to the orderly villas of the town. Last of the little villages under the downs between Dorking and Rygate is Buckland a handful of cottages, a pond, and a noble barn with upper works like a tower. Buckland keeps tranquilly apart from Rygate, and Rygate, considerately enough, builds her new houses towards the railway and Red Hill. The Roman Road at Ockley The Roman Road at Ockley Chapter 32 Under Leith Hill the Battle of Ockley the Stone Street the prettiest green in Surrey Sweethearts and Roses when the gentleman went by an engaging family history Oakwood, a forest chapel capel quiet Nudigate Bells Martins in September. Battlefields are not very numerous in Surrey. The Parliamentary Wars shed a little military glory on the north and the west, and attacks on London from the Surrey side its invulnerable side belong to almost every century of London's history. But the Great Surrey Battle, which belongs to Ockley under Leith Hill, is of the battles of long ago, dim and hazy in the mist of centuries, fearful with legends of blood in rivers, and warriors laid in swathes like mown corn. Even now, country tradition asserts, the rain that sweeps down Leith Hill sends the rain pools red in the plain below. The great battle of Ockley was fought when the Danes came 215 years before Harold fell at Hastings. They had sailed across to Kent, the historian says, with 350 large ships, and had driven in Ethelstan, who was king of Kent, Sussex, Essex, and Surrey, under his father Ethelwulf. They sacked Canterbury, and went up the Thames to London, there they beat in Beorhtwulf, king of the Mercians, and before them lay but one great town, Winchester, unsacked. Down they swept over the Thames, and out of his own country, Ethelwulf, of Wessex, overlord of the beaten Ethelstan and Beorhtwulf, came to meet them. Up the Great Stone Street, the Roman road that runs as straight as a die from Chichester, he marched, and lay across the front of his enemy, clear of the deep forest that spread south of Ockley. The Danes came on. Perhaps they rested a night in the old British camp on Unstiberry Hill, perhaps they swept straight on, battle was joined hard by Ockley Wood. Local tradition, 
always apt to associate notable deeds with easily marked places, makes the scene of the battle ugly green, but the armies could not have seen each other on the low ground, which must have been half swamp, half undergrowth. They fought, no doubt, on the higher ground near Leith Hill. The slaughter was prodigious, blood stood ankle deep, and the day ended with the great body of the Danes dead on the hills, and the rest flying where they could along the roads and through the woods. Probably not a Dane got away alive. It was a wonderful victory. Today the peace that broods over Ockley is born of wooded parks and sunlit spaces. Ockley Green must be one of the largest in Surrey, and I think is the prettiest of all. Along its western side runs a row of noble elms, bordering the road, and under the shade of the elms an old inn. This road is actually part of the stone street up which Ethelwulf marched against the Danes, and it would be hardly possible to devise a prettier road, as it passes under the Ockley elm trees, or a more tranquil outlook for an inn. Low-roofed cottages edge the grass, warm and sheltered, a drinking fountain on the green level suggests summer games and thirsty cricketers, though I think Ockley has contributed no great cricketers to the game. Beyond the green lie stretches of pasture and rich and smiling woodland. The church stands nearly a mile from the green, and to its quiet acre belongs one of the prettiest traditions of bygone Surrey the planting of rose trees over the graves of betrothed lovers. It was still a custom in Aubrey's time. In the churchyard are many red rose trees planted among the graves, which have been there beyond man's memory. The sweetheart, male or female, plants roses at the head of the grave of the lover deceased, a maid that had lost her dear twenty years since, yearly hath the grave new turfed, and continues yet unmarried. Rose trees still grow in the churchyard, though perhaps the planting of them does not go back beyond man's memory. Although so quiet a little village today, the neighborhood of Ockley has seen some wild doings. Holmberry Hill, to the north, was once one of the principal settlements of the Heathers, or broom squires, who still survive, a more respectable and a weaker folk, under Hindhead and elsewhere. Here one of their chief occupations was smuggling, indeed, the range of hills round Ewurst and Holmberry Common served as a kind of halfway house for the gentlemen who were riding with silk and brandy from the Sussex seaboard to London. It was a Bowash mother who used to put her child to bed with the injunction, now, mind, if the gentlemen come along, don't you look out of the window, doubtless the text which inspired Mr. Kipling's delightful verses. But there must have been many a Ewurst and Ockley mother who knew the gentlemen by sight, and counseled confiding children to hold their tongues and look in the proper direction as the Bowash woman bids her child in Mr. Kipling's song. If you meet King George's men, dressed in blue and red, you be careful what you say, and mindful what is said. If they call you pretty maid, and chuck you neath the chin. Don't you tell where no one is, nor yet where no one's been. If you do as you've been told, likely there's a chance. You'll be give a dainty doll, all the way from France. With a cap of Valenciennes, and a velvet hood. A present from the gentleman, a long o being good. Five and twenty ponies. Trotting through the dark. Brandy for the parson. Backy for the clerk. Them that asks no questions isn't told a lie. Watch the wall, my darling, while the gentlemen go by. The memory of smuggling under Leith Hill has, indeed, lasted into the last decade. Mr. H. E. Malden, the Surrey historian to whom all Surrey writers and readers owe so much, tells us in a paper on Holmberry Hill and its neighborhood that he personally knew an old man, a native of Cold Harbor, who had actually seen the game going on. He was born, it is true, in 1802, but he lived to be a hundred years old, and to talk to Mr. Malden discreetly about what he had seen. In his conversation Mr. Malden remarks with proper tranquility he indicated this and that respectable neighbor. Well, he said, his grandfather, and his grandfather and so on, knew something about the smuggling. He of course, had done nothing in that way, but he remembered his father holding open the gate at the end of Crocker's Lane, Cold Harbor, for a body of men on horseback, each with a keg of brandy behind him, to ride through. 
A man with whom he had worked told him how he was witness of a scene when a bold gatekeeper refused to open his turnpike gate to a body of armed men on horseback, who, after threatening him in vain, turned aside across the fields. Relics of the past still remain in the district. Under Holmberry Hill there is a cottage of which the cellars run right back into the hill, tradition has placed kegs of brandy in them. A naval cutlass was picked up some thirty years ago in a field by Leith Hill possibly it was used in a smuggler's fray with King George's men. Nor was it long ago that a trackway which runs from Forest Green, two miles to the west of Ockley, through Tanhurst over Leith Hill, was known as the Smuggler's Way. Surrey yeomen come nowhere of better stock than the oldest Ockley families. Aubrey tells a story of one of the Eversheds of Ockley, who, when the heralds made their visitation, was urged to take a coat of arms. He told them that he knew no difference between gentlemen and yeomen, but that the latter were the better men, and that they were really gentlemen only, who had longer preserved their estates and patrimonies in the same place, without waste or dissipation, an observation very just. Aubrey adds, as examples of yeoman families who had land at the conquest, the names of Steer, Harp, Heather and Aston. Steer, like Evershed, is a name that occurs over and over again in the registers, both at Ockley and Capel. Ockley's parish account books, from which Mr. Alfred Bax one of the oldest of Ockley names has made some most interesting transcripts in the Surrey archaeological collections, furnish some quaint glimpses into the life and customs of a Surrey village in old days. I make the following extracts, of which the first is noticeable particularly as evidence that a post office existed at Ockley at least as early as 1722. This yet 29 day 1722. Then John Fan and Mr. John Pratt's clerk of the post office Fan is a vittler at the Cox, corner of Sherbin Lane Cox sit of the post house. Both bound in a bond of a hundred pound for the parish of Ockley to pay one pound for the burial of William Drew in case he dy in bed lamb and Lee wise to pay the sergeant for cure of his sore legs and likewise to tack Drew out when cured which said Drew was put in by Henry Worsfold and Edward Bax overseers this year 1722. How many village families could show so long a written history as that of the Rapleys, or so engaging a record? The entries of 1739 and 1740 are a perfect climax of hopes and fears, ending, it is impossible to doubt, in the enjoyment by Sarah Rapley of every conceivable happiness. But the joys hidden under the cold print of the last Rapley entry are only dimly to be imagined. Henry Rapley's return from the sea, cured of his dog bite, must have brought out the whole village. Two miles southwest of Ockley, a short way off the stone street, stands the lonely little chapel of Oakwood. It is one of the old forest chapels, and dates back to the 13th century, but was enlarged in the 15th, the happy result of an accident. Sir Edward de la Hale was hunting wild boar with his son in the forest hard by. They had wounded a boar, the boy was thrown from his horse, and the boar charged down. His father spurred forward, too late to save him, when suddenly an arrow whizzed through the trees and the boar fell dead. In his joy, the father vowed on the spot an offering to the service of God, and Oakwood Chapel was restored and endowed. The little building lies apart, sequestered in cornfields and deep woods, the quietest treasure of sudden discovery for the stranger walking idly by country lanes. Beyond the railway to the east of Ockley, approached by quiet oak-shaded roads, lies the little village of Capel, not much more than a half mile of main street lined with cottages. Capel instills a pleasant restfulness. Almost its chief buildings are the admirably designed almshouses built in memory of Mr. Charles Webb of Clapham Common. In an age when improvements generally mean the destruction of something old, and additions to village housing accommodation mean yellow brick boxes and slate lids, it is a pleasure to set eyes upon a modern building instinct with the spirit of country places. Capel people have long had proper views as to the right rate of progress through the business of life. They are skilled, or some of them, in topiary, and when the garden of a tiny, red-tiled cottage contains a shaven yew tree recognizable as a fair-sized bird, the tenure of village life must be agreeably even. 
Third of the three villages which group themselves south and southwest of Leith Hill is Nudigate, separated from Kappel by over two miles of a zigzagging road, though the distance for a steeplechase cannot be much more than a mile from church to church. Nudigate Church is the chief part of the little village. The tower is wholly built of oak, and the beams supporting the belfry are almost as fine as those of the Thursday Slate Tower, possibly they are the work of the same craftsman. Like other Wealdon churches, Nudigate has an abiding charm in her peal of bells. They have been recast, but the Nudigate bell ringers have long records of changes rung in the little tower. Some of the records are painted on wooden panels in the belfry. To the layman who has never rung a bell the names of the changes are stimulating. College singles, grandsire doubles, college exercise and college pleasure are fairly simple, but without a dodge provokes thought, and Woodbine Violet must have been named by the village poet. Nudigate Church Nudigate Church Surrey Autumns invest the shingled spires of these Wealdon churches with a peculiar beauty. Grey and white, black streaked and shining, weather beaten and weather conquering, there is nothing in architecture lighter or more graceful than the patterned sheaves of native oaks or mounting belfries which, sometimes for centuries, have called the villagers to church. But in late autumn, when the swallows and martins are practicing starts for their long journey, the shingled spires turn themselves to fresh uses. On a sunny day the birds come about them in scores, pressing their bodies flat against the warm, dry wood, darting out for short flights, hawking gnats and midges, and flitting back again, keeping up through it all the sweetest and gentlest of anxious twitterings, and, when they are clinging to the checkered wood, resembling it so closely in color and texture as to make it hard to count a dozen birds quickly. Martins near their time for going enter on all kinds of engaging habits, especially just before and just after dusk, when bands of a dozen or so seem suddenly to make up their minds to trial flights of the most amazing speed, utterly unlike their ordinary, quiet flittings. But there is nothing prettier in all the pageant of the migrants here, than a dozen score martins with the unrest of autumn on them darting round a shingled spire. Chapter 33 Rygate Rygate Castle de Warren a swashbuckler and a swordsman the Rygate Caves Lord Holland soldiering pilgrims at the Red Cross General of the Royal Navy Old Dutch S.E. North W.W. Rygate Politics the Marble Hall the White Heart a race against time. Four castles stood along the ridge of the Surrey Downs when the barons were at war, and of the four nothing worth the name of a castle remains. Farnham's Keep was broken down by Cromwell, Guilford is a shell, Rygate, and Bletchingley have disappeared altogether. Betchworth, never fortified for war, was built later than the others, but Betchworth is an insignificant ruin. The kings and the captains have passed, and their buildings have followed them. The castles have gone down with the palaces. Surrey never had a castle like Arundel, but she has not been able to keep even a Pevensey or a Bodium. Yet Rygate Castle and its owners shaped a great deal of English history. It belonged to the great Earls de Warenay, the rival family to the Declares through all the early wars and intrigues of the kings and the barons. It stood on the ancient British track, the way which runs east and west across the country. Its place on the way was within reach of the Roman road, the stone street that ran from Chichester to London. Its possessor held the strongest strategic position between London and the coastline, or between Canterbury and Winchester, and when there was any fighting forward the lord of the highway crossroads, the Ridgegate, was the first person to be taken into account. The curious thing is that there was so little fighting along the ridge. Rygate Castle never saw a pitched battle. When Louis of France was riding by the ridge to Winchester after King John, Rygate surrendered to the French, and the Warenay only got his castle back by changing sides from John to Lewis. That was in 1216, and 47 years later, when Simon de Montfort took the Baron's army by the ridge to Rochester, Rygate could do no more than watch the army march by. The de Warenay of the day was at Lewis with the king, and when the king had lost all in the Battle of Lewis that followed, the lord of Rygate Castle fled to France. He came back the next year, and when de Montfort fell at Evesham, Rygate was once more de Warenay's. Rygate. Rygate. 
the kings must have found this particular de Warenay a little difficult to deal with. He was a bit of a swashbuckler as well as a swordsman, and once when he found himself getting the worst of a lawsuit at Westminster with one Alan de Lazouche, he ran him through the body in the king's own chamber and was off to Rygate before anybody could stop him. King Henry was furious, and sent Prince Edward, the great declare, and an archbishop to bid him come out of his castle and be punished. He came out at last, and was fined 10,000 marks for the king and 2,000 for Alan de Lazouche. But Prince Edward was not done with him. As Edward I he held a court of assize to inquire into the warrants by which the barons held their lands. De Warenay was asked for his warrant for Rygate. He drew a rusty sword and struck it on the council table. By this instrument, he said, do I hold my lands, and by the same I intend to keep them. He kept them, but he had to amend his plea into something a little less swaggering. A Rygate Byway A Rygate Byway of Rygate Castle not a stone remains. But under the great mound which bore the keep you may see what local tradition has named the Baron's Caves, where, as the story goes, the Barons met before the signing of Magna Carta. Martin Tupper, indeed, has written a whole chapter in Stephen Langton describing the interesting scene, though as a mere matter of history it never took place. To begin with, the de Warenay of the day was an adherent of King John, and not of the barons, and in the next place the barons marching to Runemead never came near Rygate at all. Mr. Tupper ears. But the passages and chambers hollowed out of the yellow sandstone are interesting, and so are the rough carvings of heads of horses which ornament the walls. Mr. Malden, the Surrey historian, thinks the caves are merely sand quarries, sand being valuable for making mortar. It is pleasanter, though probably wholly incorrect, to imagine them as dungeons, or homes of early man, or even cellars. The gardener exhibits them with a candle, and in the dark they can be eerie enough for cave bears. Park Lane, near Rygate. Park Lane, near Rygate. Long after the de Warren's reign was over, Rygate Castle saw more fighting. We met the leaders on both sides at Kingston. It was nearly at the end of the Parliamentary Wars, and Lord Holland, commanding the royalist troops, conceived the idea of a rising near London. There was to be a horse race on Banstead Downs, to draw the people together, and he was to lead them. Unhappily for his followers, he was a thoroughly incompetent soldier. He hoisted his standard at Kingston, and marched through Dorking to Rygate, where he held the castle and posted his videttes on Red Hill. Sir Michael Livesey, commanding some Kentish horse for the Parliament, was ordered up from Sevenoaks to meet him, Major Audley, one of Livesey's officers, was moved out from Hounslow, where he had three troops, to clear Banstead Downs. Audley reached Rygate first, and engaged Lord Holland, but found him too strong, he drew off, and Holland, for no soldier's reason, fell back on Dorking. He came on again to Rygate next day, but by that time Livesey and Audley had joined, and when Holland knew who was before him he turned again for Kingston. As we saw, his horse faced the Parliament's troops on Kingston Common, and he died without glory on the scaffold. Not much remains even of the Rygate which Lord Holland's troops saw on that luckless July day in 1648. The Parliament tumbled the old castle in ruins, and as at Bletchingley, anybody who wanted to build a house or a barn helped himself from the stones. Today the steadiest modern business fills the High Street and Bell Street, the two roads running west and south along which old Rygate lay. Here and there the quaint slope of a red roof, or the lichen on weather-worn tiles, has a hold on the past, and in Slipshoe Street, itself echoing the days of pilgrimages, care and good paint have preserved the beams of delightful old cottages. The Swan Inn, which may have liquored Holland's Cavaliers, has borne much from later builders, but it stands on the old site. Nearly all the rest of old Rygate has gone. The Red Cross Inn, where thirsty pilgrims dropping down from the chalk highway drank ale and rested, has made way for brand new brick and rough cast, painted a bright pink. The market which the pilgrims used to find at the western end of the town was moved to the center crossroads at the Reformation, and the little chapel at the crossroads, 
where the pilgrims said their abbeys, came down in George I's day to make room for what is now called the Old Town Hall. It is only 200 years old, but even it is not as its Georgian builder left it. Rygate Heath Rygate Heath What happened to Rygate Church in the early part of the 19th century will never be quite known. There were alterations in 1818, and it was restored in 1845, that is to say, much of its beautiful old work was destroyed. But it has kept a few of its Norman pillars, and a reverent rebuilding of much of the fabric by Sir Gilbert Scott in 1873 has left its noble relics enshrined under a fine tower. The vault holds the dust of two of England's greatest men. The first and second Lords Howard of Effingham lie there, each in his day Lord High Admiral of the English Navy. Charles, the second Lord Howard, died at Hailing House near Croydon, and was buried at dead of night in the family vault on December 23, 1624. Incredible as it sounds, from that day until 1888, the 300th anniversary of the defeat of the Armada, not a single record of the admiral who met and destroyed it was to be seen in Rygate Church, except the inscription on the coffin in the Howard's vault. Then, at last, the inscription was copied and placed on a brass in the chancel. Its terseness fits the dead man's name. Here in the vault beneath. At midnight the December 23, 1624. Lieth the body of Charles Howard. Earl of Nottingham. At Iral of English and Jean Rawl of Queen Elizabeth's Royal Navy at sea against the Spaniards Invincible Navy in the year of our Lord 1589 who departed this life at Hailing House the 14 day of December in the year of our Lord 1624 Itata Sui 87. We saw the Howards at Effingham and Great Bookham, and shall find them again at Linkfield. Mr. Granville Levison Gower, in the Surrey Archaeological Collections, has brought together some interesting particulars of the antiquities of the family. The second Duke of Norfolk, who was father of the first Lord Howard of Effingham, and now lies at Lambeth, left a remarkable will. He was, as his epitaph informs us, a high and mighty prince, and he writes of himself in the royal plural. He orders a tomb to be erected before the high altar of Thetford with pictures of us and Agnes our wife to be set together thereupon. The Lambeth parish registers do not read so respectfully. This is the entry recording the passing of the prince's widow October 13, 1545, my lady Agnes, old Dutch Essie North, buried. Rygate Churchyard holds the gravestones of two neighbors in name and place. A goose and a gosling are buried side by side. When Rygate had a castle, it also had a priory. It was founded for Austin Cannons by one of the de Warens, and its first prior was an Adam. After the dissolution, the priory estate saw some strangely different owners and guests. The first Lord Howard of Effingham, Lord High Admiral, had it, Fox, perhaps meditating his book of martyrs, stayed there as tutor to the son of the Earl of Surrey, a century later the manor came to Lord Summers, the great Lord Chancellor of William of Orange, today the modern house, built on the site of the old convent, belongs to one of Lord Summers's descendants, Lady Henry Somerset. It holds a famous oak chimney piece, said to have been brought from Henry VIII's vanished palace of Nunsuch. Rygate Priory today means Rygate Cricket, played on the Priory ground. Three of the most famous of all Surrey cricketers belong to the town. Stephen Dingate, first of Surrey players before Beldham, was born there, so was William Caffin, of the days of the Giants Fuller Pilch and Alfred Mynn, Tom Lockyer and Julius Caesar, and so, too, was W. W. Reed, one of the very few Englishmen familiar to millions by their initials alone. WG and WW belong to the great years of the game. Politics in Rygate are a mixed memory. Like Gatton, Rygate was a pocket borough, and sent two members to Parliament until 1832, when the two were reduced to one. 
even the one disappeared in 1867, when the borough was disfranchised for bribery and treating a subject of conversation which Mr. Lewis Jennings, writing three years later in Field Paths and Green Lanes, notes as dangerous if introduced too suddenly in social circles in the neighborhood. But an even more remarkable political record belongs to one of Rygate's neighbors. Gatton, once a borough and now a park, had the privilege granted to its owner in 1451 of sending two members to Parliament. The Copleys of Lee were lords of the manor in the days of Henry VIII, and Sir Richard Copley was at one time the only inhabitant of the borough, so that his voting power was considerable. When Cobbett was abroad on his rural rides, there were Rygate, Gatton and Bletchingley within a few miles of one another, all of them rotten boroughs, and each of them returning a couple of members. Cobbett, of course, boiled whenever he heard the names, Gatton in particular, was a very rascally spot of earth. He lived to see a very bad bargain for Gatton's privileges. Lord Monson, in 1830, bought the estate with its votes for two members for £100,000. Two years later, Gatton as a borough was ended by the Reform Bill and all Lord Monson had for his £100,000 was the land. Lord Monson started with the intention of making Gatton House one of the most superb in the kingdom. He began with the hall, which he built on the lines of the Cursini Chapel in the Church of San Giovanni in late Reno at Rome, though he did not add the dome. The floor he had laid of colored marbles, patterned in the most delicate designs, the marble had been designed for Ferdinand VII of Spain, and cost £10,000. The walls and arches are as richly decorated as the floor. There are four frescoes by Joseph Severn, Eleanor of Castile represents fortitude, Esther, prudence, Ruth, meekness, patience could only be Penelope. The effect of the shining stone and painted arches is of extraordinary brilliance and completeness the completeness of an unrivaled collection. But there is somewhere something bizarre, perhaps it is the setting. Marble demands marble neighbors, and the setting of these exotic treasures is the simple beauty of English parkland. The little church fits better with the great trees and the green grass. The building is nothing, the interior has the grace and the light of a cathedral chapel. Lord Monson decorated Gatton Church with the magnificence with which he imagined the hall, but his ideal for the church was quieter. He bought carved wood of the most exquisite workmanship and set it wherever the church could hold it, a pulpit and an altar from Nuremberg, said to be by Durer, but the critics disputed, the elaborately fitted stalls came from a monastery in Ghent, and altar rails from Tongres. Glass for the windows, of deep and glowing colors, he had from Ayrshot, near Louvat, the east window, a strange painting, shows the eating of the Passover. One property the little church lacks, Lord Monson never gave it a wooden ceiling, and the ill-shaped stone vault is too white and cold for the stalls. View from near Rygate. View from near Rygate. The great coaching days have many memories of Rygate. The coaches changed horses at the Swan and the White Hart, and at the White Hart today's Brighton coach stops, I think, for lunch. But when Sheer Gold wrote his recollections of Brighton in the olden time, he speaks of the inn at which the Brighton coach stopped in the days of the Regency as the King's Arms. Inns have a most confusing habit of changing their names. When John Taylor, the water poet, in 1636, made his catalogue of taverns in ten shires about London, he found some seventy or eighty taverns in Surrey, but out of the forty-nine which he mentions by name, hardly a dozen would answer to their old signboards today. The Rygate White Hart in Taylor's day was the heart. According to Sheer Gold, Rygate in the old coaching days was the scene of the most romantic episodes imaginable. He is full of comparisons between the easy charm of conversation among riders by coach and the ungracious silences of traveling by rail, and this is what you read about Rygate and the fair who traveled by coach. There was an advantage and an interest in traveling by coach which traveling by rail can never communicate. In the former you saw men and their faces, and acquired some information, in the latter you learn nothing except the number of persons killed or injured by the last accident. 
A young man who entered the coach at 8 o'clock in the morning at Brighton took his seat perhaps opposite a young lady whom he thought pretty and interesting. When he arrived at Cookfield he began to be in love, at Crawley he was desperately smitten, at Rygate his passion became irretrievable, and when he gave her an arm to ascend the steep ridges of Rygate Hill a just emblem, by the way, of human life he declared his passion, and they were married soon after. Nothing of this sort ever occurs on railroads. Sentiment never blooms on the iron soil of these sulky conveyances. A woman was a creature to be looked at, admired, courted, and beloved in a stagecoach, but on a railway a woman is nothing but a package, a bundle of goods committed to the care of the railway company's servants, who take care of the poor thing as they would take care of any other bale of goods. It is said that matches are made in heaven, it may likewise be said that matches more often begin in the old stagecoaches, and that railroads are the antipodes of love. The road from Rygate to Crawley, one of the straightest and levelest in the South Country, was once the scene of a remarkable horse race. The beginning of it was a discussion at a shooting party in the autumn of 1890 between Lord Lonsdale and Lord Shrewsbury on the pace of trotting and galloping horses. Lord Lonsdale backed himself to drive galloping horses for 20 miles, single, pair, four in hand and riding postillion, inside an hour. Lord Shrewsbury wagered against him, but there were difficulties about weather and the date March 11, 1891, and eventually Lord Shrewsbury withdrew from the match and paid £100 forfeit. Lord Lonsdale then set himself the task alone, and his headquarters were at Rygate, he had 15 horses in training, 15 men, and 13 carriages, and the cost of keeping them at Rygate came to £150 a day. The course, a stretch of five miles of road, over which horses were to be driven in the four different styles was measured from Kennersley Manor, three miles south of the White Hart, nearly into Crawley. Snow fell on the 10th, the day before the match, Lord Lonsdale borrowed a snow plough and sent it over the road. At noon on the day of the race the horses and carriages were taken to the course, at five and twenty minutes to one Lord Lonsdale drove up in a pair horse brougham, at one o'clock to the second he trotted his single horse, war paint, to the starting point, and war paint bounded down the road. War paint took thirteen minutes thirty-nine minus one-fifth seconds over the five miles, it would have been twenty seconds less, but a brewer's dray had blocked the road. The pair horse was waiting with blue and yellow, two Americans, in it, the change took three seconds, and blue and yellow galloped back to the start in 12 minutes 51 minus 2 fifth seconds. It was the turn for the coach, and it took 36 minus 3 fifth seconds to change across, a groom drove the team to the starting point, a yard before it Lord Lonsdale caught up the reins, and the four horses swept up the rise to Crawley again. 15 minutes and 9 seconds and 2 fifths the four horses took, the leaders were Silk and Everton King, the wheelers Conservative and Whitechapel, and they left their driver something over 17 minutes to ride Postilion back. It took 40 minus 2 fifths seconds to change from coat and hat for riding, and exactly at 17 minutes to the hour Lord Lonsdale rode off on Draper, a chestnut, with a bay mare, Violetta, for the pair. Draper and Violetta went over the last five miles in 13 minutes 55 minus 4 fifth seconds, and in 56 minutes 55 minus 4 fifth seconds the 20 miles were covered. And so the great race ended. The pilgrims way dropping down like white ribbons over the shoulder of the down into Rygate we have already seen. On the other side of the town the high road climbs up again to the crest of the ridge a road paved and metal to stand the perpetual wear of shod wheels grating down the hill. At the highest point of the road is one of the finest views in England, one of the finest, Cobbett thought, in all the world. The red roofs of the town cluster among trees below, beyond is all the wheel to the Devil's Dyke and Chanctonbury Ring, best of all landmarks of the Sussex Downs. The separate views of the wheel along the Chalk Ridge have each their own characteristic, from the hogs back to the heights above Titsy. For me the view from the hill above Rygate has a double memory, the purple and blue of the down seen through the stems of the beaches that line the crest, and the shadows thrown by a high summer sun in the parks and fields below. 
The oaks and elms set themselves in the open grass with little circles of darker green about their feet, like the wooden stands of the trees of a Dutch toy farm. Red Hill joins Rygate to the east, new, red, spreading, a junction of railways, a better sort of woking. You do not have to wait from nine minutes to three quarters of an hour every time you come to Red Hill. To the schoolboy it has the merit of being a stage on the road from London and the sea. Chapter 34 Croydon Croydon Palace A neglected relic Queen Elizabeth's waiters John Whitgift Hospital, Chapel, and School A record of cricket Macaulay's tyrant Isaac Walton differs Queen Elizabeth's little black husband Croydon Collier's John Ruskin by the parish pump John Gilpin. Croydon is best reached by rail. It cannot be called a convenient centre, for one returns to centres, and Croydon has little that would recall a traveller. But it is an easy point of departure either for the country east, by Addington and the Kentish border, or south through Sanderstead to Calston and Calden, or west by Beddington and the Carshalton Trout Ponds to Epsom. You may walk in any direction, except perhaps north, where you will walk into North Croydon. But in Croydon itself there are still two or three things worth seeing. One is the Archbishop's Palace. An Archbishop's Palace is the very last building which would naturally associate itself with the Croydon tram lines and Croydon up-to-dateness, and it is the last building with which Croydon appears to wish to associate itself. The palace stands apart from the bustle of the place, unhonored, unhappy and ignored. Since the last Archbishop left it in the reign of George II it has served its turn as business premises for a bleacher and a calico printer, it has been a wash house, and is now a girls' school. One thing it has never been of sufficient interest to Croydon to be rescued from sacrilege and neglect, and to take the place which is its due among historic national possessions. Perhaps one should be thankful that the palace of Cranmer, Whitgift and Laud is today in no rougher hands than the gentle sisterhood of a children's day school. If Croydon Palace were rightly restored, how fine a relic it might be. The great banqueting hall, with its noble roof of Spanish chestnut, which has even survived the steam and chemistry of a bleacher's vats, the long, paneled gallery where tradition has set Queen Elizabeth dancing, the guard chamber, perhaps built by Archbishop Arundel, who burnt the lollards, the chapel with its oak stalls, its poppy head carvings, and the gallery added by the Archbishop who stood by Charles I on the scaffold, if the oak were cleaned and the paint taken from the panels. And if under the mellow brick walls there were set out lawns and flowers, then Croydon might justly boast of its tram lines, its admirable sanitation, and its new town hall. It would possess something else. When Queen Elizabeth lay at Croydon Palace, it was not an easy matter to find room for her train of courtiers. She came in July, 1573, to visit Archbishop Parker, and wished to come again in the following May, with a larger train than before. The steward, entrusted with the task of finding more room where there had never been enough, was in despair, and made out his list of lodgings for the Archbishop, or, perhaps, the Queen's Chamberlain, to see. The Lord Treasurer was to be W.H.E.R. He was, the Lord Admiral at yet another end of the Great Chamber, the Maids of Honor W.H.E.R. They W.E.R., the Law Staff or W.H.E.R. She was, the Gentleman Huss hers their old lodging, and so on with a very long list. But the letter ends in a hopeless puzzle. For the quen's waiters, I cannot as yet find a any convenient rooms to place them in, but I will do the best yt I can to place them elsewhere, but why fyt please you senior yt I do remove them. The grooms of the privy chamber nor Mr. Jurai have no other way to their chambers but to paw thorough that way again that my lady of Oxford should come. I cannot then tell W.H.E.R. to place Mr. Hatton, and for Lockyer we here is no place with a chimney for her, but that she must lay abroad by Mrs. Appery and the rest of ye P.R.V.Y. chambers. For Mrs. Shelton here is no rooms with chimneys, I shall stage one chamber without for her. Here is as much as I have any ways able to do in this house. Of the great archbishops few, strangely enough, have left memorials behind them at Croydon. Whitgift, Grindle, and Sheldon have their monuments in the church, of the others, Juxon added some carving to the palace chapel. Whitgift was the great Croydon Archbishop, 
and did for Croydon what Abbott did for Guilford. He founded a hospital, and endowed a school. Whitgift's Hospital, Croydon. Whitgift's Hospital, Croydon. Whitgift's Hospital stands today almost as its founder left it. His initials, I.W., worked in patterned brick into a gable, and the motto he chose for the doorway, Key Dad Papari Nunquam in Dejebit, face a roaring thoroughfare and flaring shops, but inside the oak doors little can have changed. Weather-beaten red brick, mullioned windows looking out over flowers and shaven lawns, tiled roofs and tall chimneys make up a picture of solid goodness which fits well with the archbishop's memory. The chapel stands open, a dark, simple little place. The oak benches are the same on which the first pensioners sat, and down upon them look curious faded pictures, dingy in black and gold. One is a fine portrait of the founder at his writing table, with his seal, his sandbox, a bell, quill pens, and a compass, or is it a watch? Before him lies an open Latin Bible, and he points to his favorite text Cast thy bread upon the waters. On another wall hangs a framed poem in manuscript, some forty or fifty lines of extravagance in which the archbishop is compared in turn to a straight sound cedar, a lost gem, a pearl, and a fairest nottles plant, whose death forces the poet to wish, that with a sea of tears, my verse could make an island of thy honor de hers. Another poet writes a prodigious Latin elegy containing the briefest summary of the miseries and calamities of the human race. A painter adds a picture of death digging a grave. Whitgift School is an old foundation in a modern building, and has added a record to cricket history. Mr. V. F. S. Crawford, one of the hardest hitters of his day, was a Whitgift boy, and has done remarkable batting as a schoolboy and since. But his most remarkable innings was played at Cane Hill, when he scored 180 out of 215 made while he was in, and reached his first 100 in 19 minutes. That the school buildings should be modern is inevitable, for the school outgrew itself 40 years ago. But the schoolhouse which Whitgift built was pulled down in consequence an act which doubtless sits lightly enough on Croydon's conscience. Four years ago the hospital nearly followed the school, the argument being that there was insufficient room for the tram lines. Croydon Church, like nothing else in the town, became modern by accident. It was burnt down in 1867, and Sir Gilbert Scott rebuilt it into the finest church, perhaps, in the county, next to St. Mary's, Southwark. In the fire the tombs of the archbishops almost disappeared. Grindles is no longer to be seen, though possibly some tumbled stones collected into odd corners may be part of it. Sheldon's is a pile of fragments, heaped together behind a railing, charred and broken, hideous with the sculptured skulls, bones, worms, and winged hourglasses with which our ancestors grimly decked their graves. Whitgift's monument has been restored and is a striking example of rich and intricate decoration, even if the pomp and color of it are too garish for a tomb. One looks at the stern, quiet features of his effigy and wonders what was the truth about the man. Was he what Macaulay has called him a narrow-minded, mean, and tyrannical priest, who gained power by servility and adulation, and employed it in persecuting those who agreed with Calvin about church government, and those who differed from Calvin touching the doctrine of reprobation. Could he ever have been rightly described Macaulay so describes the master of Trinity who was to be Bishop of Worcester and Archbishop of Canterbury as in a chrysalis state, putting off the worm and putting on the dragonfly, a kind of intermediate grub between sycophant and oppressor? Perhaps Macaulay was naturally unlikely to judge him well. A portrait drawn by one who lived nearer his day is Isaac Walton another, perhaps a gentler, I.W. He built a large almshouse near to his own palace at Croydon in Surrey, and endowed it with maintenance for a master and twenty-eight poor men and women, which he visited so often that he knew their names and dispositions, and was so truly humble, that he called them brothers and sisters, and whensoever the queen descended to that lowliness to dine with him at his palace in Lambeth which was very often he would usually the next day show the like lowliness to his poor brothers and sisters at Croydon, and dine with them at his hospital, at which time, you may believe there was joy at the table. Walton thought him a very tactful prelate. 
he managed Queen Elizabeth admirably, and by justifiable sacred insinuations, such as Saint Paul to Agrippa Agrippa, believest thou? I know thou believest, he wrought himself into so great a degree of favor with her, as, by his pious use of it, hath got both of them a great degree of fame in this world, and of glory in that into which they are now both entered. Queen Elizabeth was devoted to him, and nicknamed him her little black husband. Without a license from her little black husband she would not touch flesh in Lent. The archbishops left Croydon, in 1758, when Archbishop Hutton died. The line of archbishop tenants of the palace had been broken in the days of the Commonwealth, when Sir William Barreton, one of the parliamentary major generals, lived there. He was a soldier of conviction, and was nearly torn in pieces by the mob at Chester, for ordering a drum to be beat for the parliament. Croydon's historian, Steinman, quotes from a pamphlet of Cavalier Days, the mystery of the old cause briefly unfolded, a quaint appreciation of him. He was a notable man at a Thanksgiving dinner, having terrible long teeth, and a prodigious stomach, to turn the archbishop's palace at Croydon into a kitchen, also to swallow up that palace and lands at a morsel. Barreton, as a reward for his military services, had been given several sequestrated properties, a chief forestership, and a seneschal ship. Four hundred years ago, Croydon was the center of a great Surrey industry. The Croydon colliers were proverbial. They supplied London with coal, that is, charcoal, before the days of sea coal, the coal which blackens London smoke today. Then it reached London by sea. One Grimes, or Grimm, the greatest of the Croydon colliers, who lived in the reign of Edward VI, was actually sued by an archbishop for creating a nuisance with his smoke. The collier won. He was sufficiently celebrated to become the hero of two 16th century plays, one of which bears his name, Grimm, the collier of Croydon. To be as black as a Croydon collier, was to be as black as a sweep, and a right Croydon sanguine was a deep red-brown. Once Croydon, always Croydon. The first railway line built in the country and sanctioned by Parliament ran from Croydon to Wandsworth. It was part of an original scheme proposed in 1799 for linking up London with Portsmouth by an iron railroad running through Croydon, Reigate, and Arundel. But it was thought best to begin with the part which ran from Croydon to Wandsworth, and perhaps it was as well that the scheme went no further, for it cost £35,000, and was a complete failure. The shareholders lost every penny. One feels it ought to have succeeded. The carriages or trucks were drawn by horses, and the wheels ran along grooved iron rails. Anybody who had a cart which fitted might put it on the rails and let his horse pull it along, if he paid the tolls, which were not heavy. However, its life was short. The Croydon Canal, opened in 1809, robbed it of much of its heavy goods traffic, and the London and Brighton Railway demolished it altogether. This is how Felix Summerlee, his real name was Sir Henry Cole, and he liked a good walk with a good dinner at the end of it, described the change in his pleasure excursions in 1846. A small single line, on which a miserable team of lean mules or donkeys, some thirty years ago, might be seen crawling at the rate of four miles in the hour, with small trucks of stone and lime behind them. Lean mules no longer crawl leisurely along the little rails with trucks of stone, through Croydon, once perchance during the day, but the whistle and rush of the locomotive, and the whir of the atmospheric, are now heard all day long. Felix Summerlee must be suspected of admiring the change. One who knew old Croydon well, and admired its changes less, was John Ruskin, who had relations there and visited them as a boy. Of one he writes in Praetorita. Of my father's ancestors I know nothing, nor of my mother's more than that my maternal grandmother was the landlady of the old king's head in Market Street, Croydon, and I wish she were alive again, and I could paint her Simone Memmi's king's head, for a son. Of his aunt at Croydon he has a pleasant memory. My aunt lived in the little house still standing or which was so four months ago the fashionablest in Market Street, having actually two windows over the shop, in the second story, 
but I never troubled myself about that superior part of the mansion, unless my father happened to be making drawings in Indian ink, when I would sit reverently by and watch, my chosen domains being, at all other times, the shop, the bakehouse, and the stones round the spring of crystal water at the back door, long. Since let down into the modern sewer, and my chief companion, my aunt's dog, Towser, whom she had taken pity on when he was a snappish, starved vagrant and made a brave and affectionate dog of, which was the kind of thing she did for every living creature that came in her way, all her life long. The old king's head and the fashionablest house in Market Street have gone. So has much else that Ruskin would have recognized. To guess at what his Croydon was like you may open Steinman's history at a little engraving of Whitgift's hospital, from a drawing made at the crossroads. The hospital stands as it is today. Opposite it, a square, two-storied in stretches over the road a fine carved bracket with a bunch of grapes in iron, proclaiming that here are post horses to be had from Nietzsche, Jane. A tall-hatted rustic pensively wheels a barrow in the middle of the road opposite the inn, a group of villagers in stout boots, smocks and stockings stands at the street corner, and, precisely on the spot where today's tram lines swing north and west, a lazy-looking person in a straw hat, perhaps a sailor ashore, leans against a post within a yard or two of an imposing parish pump. Croydon tradition claims John Gilpin. He is said to have lived in a farmhouse, which Croydon pulled down in 1897. It was known as Collier's Water Farm, and stood near what is now Thornton Heath Railway Station. Undoubtedly a John Gilpin lived there, but the author of the local guidebook who asserts that he was Cooper's original refers all inquirers to Dr. Brewer for corroboration, and that admirable sage informs me that Gilpin was Mr. Bayer, an eminent linen draper of Paternoster Row. Chapter 35 Beddington and Carshalton Beddington Hall careful dissipation the polite verger a punning epitaph Actian and Artemis for sale Carshalton pools a dry well William Quelche's apology the rudeness of a Dr. Carshalton's greatest man fighting and spelling. According to the historians, the springs of the Wandel rose under the walls of Croydon Palace. Croydon has seemingly decided that they shall rise further off, and the Wandel suddenly appears, full flowing, perhaps a quarter of a mile away. You can walk along its bank and watch young Croydon transfer minnows from muddy water to jam pots. A mile from the town stands Beddington Hall, now an orphan asylum which sends red-cloaked children out for walks into Croydon, but once the country mansion of the great family of Carew. Nicholas Carew built a house at Beddington in the reign of Edward III, but it was Sir Francis Carew, rebuilding it under Elizabeth, who first brought greatness to Beddington. He entertained the Queen there twice, and the Orange Garden was famous for many generations of Carews. When Aubrey saw the trees at the end of the 17th century, he wrote that they were planted in the open ground, where they have throve to admiration for above a whole century, but are preserved, during the winter season, under a movable cupboard. The hard frost of 1739 killed them. A later Sir Nicholas Carew rebuilt much of the house, but retained the hall. He was an exact and particular person, and never let his careful dissipation prevent him from keeping a precise record in his account book. One of his pocket ledgers has found its way into the British Museum. Here are some extracts of his expenses. September yet 25th 1706. I bought a PR of coach horses four years old come five and gave four and thirty pounds for him and Carew. He had a nice taste in wines and tea, and was properly generous to musicians and servants. I have met with occasional difficulties in trying to enter Surrey churches, but Beddington, which is one of the most finely decorated, offered the most prolonged opposition of all. I arrived there about three o'clock in the afternoon, and finding the doors locked, inquired of one who emerged from a stoke hole where I might get the keys. I might not get them, he replied the church was being cleaned. But might I not just look round, having come a long way to see the church? I might not, she was cleaning the rear dose. Might not one who wished to write about the church enter while she was cleaning the rear dose? One might not, much had been written of the church already. Would he be so good as to direct me to the rectory? 
he would, and did, and as I walked away shouted after me that the rector was certainly out. But I found him in, and very courteous to a stranger, and I learned that, as I had hoped, the rule was that the church should be opened every day. He gave me his card, and wrote a message on it, and with the card I went back to the church. The verger had disappeared. He was neither in the churchyard nor the stoke hole. A stonemason working in the churchyard came to my assistance. The verger was in the church and would doubtless open the door if I knocked. I knocked. Nothing happened. The stonemason knocked, indeed, he knocked a great deal. I begged him to stop knocking, for passers-by stayed to see what this thing might be, but he was thoroughly interested, and went on knocking. Perhaps he knocked for a quarter of an hour. A young girl came up to tell us that the door would certainly open before half past four, for that was tea time. Just then the door opened, and before it was shut again in our faces I just had time to brandish the card. He replied at once he would let me in by another door. He did so, he never asked to see the card, but went on industriously with his sweeping. Perhaps no building in Surrey has been more carefully restored than Beddington Church, nor more richly decorated. The chancel with its frescoes and mosaics, and the carved and painted roof are probably as fine as anything of the kind in any parish church. But is the result attained the result aimed at? The richness, the glamour of gold and purple and rare woods and stones are there, as they must have been in Solomon's temple. But to me the simplicity and cool quiet of aisles and white pillars sometimes seem to forsake such gorgeousness and glow. There are many interesting monuments and brasses in the church, especially in the Carew Chapel, where Carews of Beddington have lain since the 15th century. The strangest memorial is the punning epitaph on the steward to Sir Nicholas Carew. He died in 1633, and his name was Greenhill, which inspired his commemorator with a motto for his brass, More superviriti's montes, and ten curious lines vinder thy feet interred is here. A native born in Oxfordshire, first, life and learning Oxford got, Surrey to him his death, his grow. He once a hill was, fresh and green, now withered he is not to be seen. Earth in earth shovel thee up is shut, a hill into a hole is put. But darksome earth by power divine bright at last as yes on may shine. A mile further west, beyond Wallington, which in spite of embracing Villatum still keeps an old inn and a pretty, shaded green, is Carshalton. Carshalton begins magnificently. In the spacious days of King George I there was designed for Carshalton Park a superb dwelling, which Leone was to have built for the lord of the manor, he built the Onslow House in Clandon Park. But the house was never built. The gates remain. They formerly guarded the green glades of a deer park. Now they stand for lornly cheek by jowl with new yellow brick. Actaeon, from one great pillar, gazes on less divine pictures than a goddess bathing, Artemis, on the other pillar, drapes herself for unseeing eyes. A papered notice board lolls against the superb ironwork of the gates. Hunter and Huntress, pillars and wrought iron, are for sale. Few villages in Surrey are prettier today than they were forty years ago. Carshalton is hardly a village, but is it less pretty than it used to be? Let Ruskin decide, from the opening of the Crown of Wild Olive. Twenty years ago, he writes in 1870, there was no lovelier piece of lowland scenery in South England, nor any more pathetic, in the world, by its expression of sweet human character and life, than that immediately bordering on the sources of the Wandle, and including the low moors of Addington, and the villages of Beddington and Carshalton, with all their pools and streams. No clearer or diviner waters ever sang with constant lips of the hand which giveth rain from heaven, no pastures ever lightened in springtime with more passionate blossoming, no sweeter homes ever hallowed the heart of the passerby with their pride of peaceful gladness half hidden yet full confessed. The place remains, 1870, nearly unchanged in its larger features, but with deliberate mind I say, that I have never seen anything so ghastly in its inner tragic meaning not in Pison Marema not by Campania tomb not by the sand isles of the Turk Ellen shore as the slow stealing of aspects of reckless, 
indolent, animal neglect, over the delicate sweetness of the English scene, nor is any blasphemy or impiety, any frantic saying, or godless thought, more appalling to me, using the best power of judgment I have to discern its sense and scope, than the insolent defiling of those springs by the human herds that drink of them. Just where the welling of stainless water, trembling and pure, like a body of light, enters the pool of Carshalton, cutting itself a radiant channel down to the gravel, through warp of feathery weeds, all waving, which it traverses with its deep threads of clearness, like the chalcedony in moss agate, starred here and there with the white granulette, just in the very rush and murmur of the first spreading currents, the human wretches of the place cast their street and house foulness, heaps of dust and slime, and broken shreds of old metal, and rags of putrid clothes, which, having neither energy to cart away, nor decency enough to dig into the ground, they thus shed into the stream, to diffuse what venom of it will float and melt, far away, in all places where God meant those waters to bring joy and health. And, in a little pool behind some houses farther in the village, where another spring rises, the shattered stones of the well, and of the little fretted channel which was long ago built and traced for it by gentler hands, lie scattered, each from each, under a ragged bank of mortar and scoria and bricklayers refuse, on one side, which the clean water nevertheless chastises to purity, but it cannot conquer the dead earth beyond, and there, circled and coiled under festering scum, the stagnant edge of the pool effaces itself into a slope of black slime, the accumulation of indolent years. Half a dozen men with one day's work could cleanse those pools, and trim the flowers about their banks, and make every breath of summer air above them rich with cool balm, and every glittering wave medicinal, as if it ran, troubled only of angels, from the porch of Bethesda. But that day's work is never given, nor, I suppose, will be, nor will any joy be possible to heart of man, forevermore, about those wells of English waters. Things are not quite so bad today. Ruskin himself had the smaller pool cleaned and set about with stone, and planted with periwinkle and daffodils. The other two larger pools are the care of a district council, which forbids attempts to catch the big trout that cruise in their clear, weedy waters, and otherwise looks after them for a public which may value them more highly than in Ruskin's day, but drops in a great many newspapers. Another so-called well and Bullen's well, her horse put its foot into soft ground above a spring is a well no longer. Iron railings ward off the profane, and narcissus and ivy cluster round its brim, but below, according to the weather, is dust or mud. At the churchyard gate are the trunks of two ancient but still living elms, to which is fastened a beam beset with hooks, which either hold or once held joints of meat for the butcher's shop behind. The church, which is a strange mixture of old and new, the new being gradually built onto the old, is the resting place of Gainsfords and Ellen Briggies, two of the great old Surrey families, and contains at least one remarkable inscription. M.S. Under the middle stone that guards the ashes of a certain friar, sometime vicar of this place, is raked up the dust of William Quelche, B.D., who many stread in the same since the Reformation. His lot was through God's mercy to burn incense here about thirty years, and ended his course April the 10, in DNI 1654, being aged 64 years. Mr. Quelche was vicar in troublous times, and the distractions of the Civil War led to a hiatus in the parish registers. The fault lay with the parish clerk, but the conscientious Mr. Quelche felt bound to clear himself in the eyes of future ages by a long apology in the register of baptisms, which begins beseechingly enough. Good reader tread gently. For though these vacant years may see me to make me guilty of thy censure, neither will I SYMPLY excuse Mijel from all blemish yet if thou do but cast thine EIE upon the former pages and se with what care I have kept the annals of mine own time, and rectified sundry errors of former times thou wilt begin to think either is some reason why he that began to build so well should not be able to make an end. But the entries for the years before the war broke out were occasionally a little vague. Here are three full years records of marriages. 
1640 a Londoner married Mr. Kep's sister of Mitcham on Easter Monday. 1641 Mr. Meese married a couple who came from Fishstead whose names he could not remember. 1642 Not one married woe to Yevikar. Some of the names and surnames sound odd Epaphroditus Wood. Epaphroditus Wandling. And Vakar. Hevadebar Hill. Ro. Buttonshire. Dilcock. Gander. Mustian. Thunderman. Nep Milfi. Carshelton House, a massive pile of red brick, was built by Sir John Fellows, one of the directors of the South Sea Bubble. It stands on the site of a house which belonged to the most famous doctor of his day. He was John Radcliffe, founder of the Radcliffe Library, and so much run after as a physician that he felt able to be intolerably rude to his patients, even if they happened to be kings and queens. William III never forgave him for telling him that he would not own His Majesty's drops eichel legs for the three kingdoms. Queen Anne refused to make him her court physician, but sent for him when she was dying. He would not leave Carshelton, pleading the gout, and he lived and died in angry remorse. The Queen never recovered, and the doctor did not dare to show his face in London. Sutton. Sutton. Carshelton's greatest man lies in a nameless grave. Admiral Sir Edward Whittaker, leader of the assault which first made Gibraltar a British fortress, used to spend his summers at Carshelton, and was buried in Carshelton churchyard, but the slab which marked his grave was moved and lost when the church was enlarged. He was 44 when with Captain Jumper and Captain Hicks he led his men against the redoubt, and he was as brilliant a fighter as he was a poor speller. I quote from a letter he wrote describing the siege and assault to his friend Sir Richard Haddock, controller of the navy, a day or two after the action. There was three small ships in the old mold, one of which annoyed our camp by firing amongst them. One having about ten guns, lying close to the mold, and just under a great bastion at the north corner of the town, I proposed to Sir George the burning her in the night. He liked ITT, accordingly ordered what boats I would have to my assistance, and about twelve at night I did ITT effectually, WTH the loss of but one man, and five or six wounded. July 23 at four this morning, at Mel Bing began WTH his ships to cannonade, a Dutch reared Mel and five or six ships of tears along WTH him, WCH made a noble noise, being within half shot of the town. My ship, not being upon service, I desired Sir George to make me his adyukan to carry his commands, from time to time, to at Mel Bing, which he did. P.S. This is right all in a hurry, sir, Y.T. I hope you ally excuse me. The aide-de-camp had not forgotten the concluding formula of the schoolboy complete letter writer. Beyond Carshelton is Sutton, not less exuberant than Croydon. The Cock Hotel of Coaching Days has been rebuilt, the railway is convenient for Epsom or London. Chapter 36 Calden to the Downs Calston a giant Christian prince Calden the ladder of life the brig of Winnie Moore Chipstead Mers Tom a wizard rector Addington the little church's horn tooks diversions. It is possible to escape from Croydon's railway stations. You can push out from its ringing streets into green and quiet country, and find little old churches within a mile or two of the railway, as undisturbed as if no railway were yet running. You may leave the line at Pulley, and within an hour's walk find yourself in the wind on the downs, among Anglo-Saxon barrows and immemorial yews, you may even be able, though not without thought, to exclude from a generous view of hill and valley the enormous lunatic asylums which fate and county councils have piled and multiplied in this part of Surrey. There is a strip of country lying south of Pulley in which you cannot get more than a mile and a half or so from the railway, but which contains tiny hamlets and lonely roads. Pulley and Kenley will one day come out to Calston, perhaps, but Calston's day is not yet. The village itself is nothing more than a cottage or two with a church. But the road to Calston opens on broad slopes of grass and plough, bordered with a line of use an ancient trackway, perhaps. Such a line, or rather lines, for there are several along the sides of the downs a little further south, would certainly be claimed as evidence of a pilgrim's way if they ran east and west between Guildford, 
say, and Dorking. Fields with such noble hedges to define them have their own air of wildness and age, it is easy enough, even with pulley slate roofs hardly a mile away, to fancy partridges calling across those open spaces. Calston, indeed, was once celebrated for its game. Aubrey tells us that in the parish there was a large coney warren belonging to the Desboveries. They, for many years under Stuarts and Georges, were lords of the manor. From Calston one may walk to Calden over Farthing Down. The horizon changes, but Farthing Down itself remains high and free, smooth with short down grass, and dinted with the hoofs of galloping horses. Croydon and Pulley send many riders abroad on Saturdays and Sundays. But Farthing Down is peopled with other older forms. Along the ridge, bordering the ancient trackways, lies a line of barrows. They were opened in 1872 by Mr. John Wickham Flower, some were found untouched, and contained perfect skeletons. In one grave lay the bones of a great lady, buried with her was a beautiful wooden drinking cup, its staves fastened by bronze bands of an intricate runic pattern of coiled snakes. Another grave held the skeleton of a warrior giant, his sword lying across him and the boss of his shield upon his foot. Mr. Flower thinks he can add a name. Calston is a corruption of Cuthredes Jun, and perhaps Cuthred, an Anglo-Saxon prince, lies buried here with his family. Cuthred, son of Quickhelm, and grandson of Senegils, the first Christian king of Wessex, was baptized in 639 at Dorchester. Farthing Down stretches for nearly three miles north and south, and under its southern slope lies the little village of Calden. Calden Church holds the most remarkable wall painting in the country. The Ladder of Life, or Ladder of Salvation, is the subject, and it occupies nearly the whole of the west wall of the church. In red and white and yellow ochre paint you are shown the torments of the damned, the salvation of heaven, the trampling of Satan. A ladder rises through the middle, up it the poor souls of men struggle to the joys above, some tumble headlong, a demon picks off others with a pitchfork and sets them aside to burn or boil. An enormous dog eats a woman's hand, in life she had thrown to dogs what she should have given to the poor. A usurer painted without eyes, for usurers could not weep, sits among flames, devils drive pitchforks into his head, money bags hang round his neck, he counts and swallows red hot coins. Other hapless souls, condemned to walk a bridge of spikes, carry burdens over a thin plank like a saw set on edge. Above is a nimbus of clouds, and above the nimbus, the weighing of souls. The Archangel Michael balances the souls in great scales, a fiend tries to make them kick the beam. On the other side is the harrowing of hell. Hell is the mouth of a monstrous devil, Christ advances with the cross and banner, and thrusts the wood of the cross into the devil's mouth. The souls rise up delivered from purgatory, above them, a flying angel floats with a scroll. Mr. J. G. Waller, writing in the Surrey Archaeological Collections, explains most of the painting, but has hardly a guess for the scroll. The heavens depart, as it were a scroll rolled together, Mr. Waller does not mention the text which to the layman seems obvious but the expert may have reasons against it. The punishment of the bridge the walking over a sharp edge, set with spikes or narrow as a hair is one of the oldest things of all the religions. The Chinese had it, in the distant eastern ages, and Mr. Waller, in the collections, prints verses which show it surviving in Yorkshire in 1624. There was a Yorkshire tradition that a person after death must pass over Winnie Moor, and at a funeral it was the custom for a woman to come and chant verses over the corpse. These are an extract. When thou from hence doest pass away, every night and all, to Winnie Moor thou comest at last, and Christ receive thy soul. From Winnie Moor that thou mayest pass. Every night and all, to Brig of Dread thou comest at last, and Christ receive thy soul. From Brig of Dread, and a bradder than a thread, every night and all, to Purgatory Fire thou comest at last, and Christ receive thy soul. East of Calden is Caterham, west is Chipstead and southwest is Mers Tom, each two miles or so away as the crow flies and something more as the road runs, 
and each with a railway station. Caterham once was a valley, Aubrey wrote of it, in this parish are many pleasant little volleys, stored with wild thyme, sweet marjoram, barnel, boscage, and beeches. I do not know barnel, but the last twenty years have set many houses among the boscage. They have built, too, two new churches, one of them set very finely on a hill, the old church is disused, or used, rather, only for a Sunday school. Upon Sunday scholars, from a Norman wall, looks down a hideous stone corbel. A clown's face stretches a devil's mouth wide open with hands like rat's paws, the sharp teeth grin like rat's teeth, perhaps in the Sunday school they make their own faces at it. Chipstead, to the west, is on a hill the other side of the railway. It has some pretty modern cottages by a pond and shading elm trees, a post office also, with the smallest possible aperture for introducing letters to the notice of the postmistress within. The church has some quaint features, there are a number of oddly shaped lancet windows, a curiously carved boss in the groining of the tower, and a strange arrangement by which the members of the choir sit facing the east with their backs to the pulpit. In the churchyard lies Sir Edward Banks, perhaps Chipstead's most illustrious native. He was born poor and he died rich, and he built three great bridges, Waterloo, Southwark, and London. Chipstead Churchyard, too, has a fine yew, but good yews are common in the churchyard south of Croydon. The best walk from Calden is over the hill to Mers Tom, the signposts show you the path and mark it the pilgrim's way to Tollsworth Farm with the utmost assurance. From Tollsworth Farm the path drops over a plough down the side of the hill, before the railway and the tunnel came the old way perhaps went straight across to the church. Mers Tom itself has little to show except one pretty little side street, but the church is more full of curiosities than any other near. Its builders placed it delightfully on a mound which is all air and sunlight, and though much of the charm of the church was destroyed in 1861, much that is old and curious remains. A queerly placed clock tells the time low down on the tower, inside are ancient monuments, one a stone effigy recovered from use as a pavement, others to the Elan Briggy family. That is only one spelling of the name, and perhaps as good as any other, variations are Elina Briggy, Eling Briggy, Elina Ruggy, Elarug, Elmeruggy, Elmbrugge, Elmridge, Elmbridge, Elmebrugge, Elmbridge, Elan Ruggy, Eling Brug, Elan Brig, Eling Brig, Eling Brig, and Ellen Bridge. An Elan Briggy in those days could spell practically anything. Other memorials are fragments of stone carving, once belonging to the Southcoats and Walder graves, and built without reason into windows and walls. Over the west chancel arch is a broken piece of carving from old London Bridge, and for Lornest possession of all, the north chantry is paved with a tessellated floor which was made in prison, I was told, by an unhappy woman who hoped that forgiveness would take and use her work. Mers Tom has had some famous rectors. One was the great Thomas Lineker, King's physician to Henry VII and Henry VIII, founder of the Royal College of Physicians, and friend of Melanchthon and Erasmus. He became a priest when he was 58, four years before his death, and was only rector of Mers Tom for a month. I much wonder, Fuller writes of him in his worthies, at what I find in good authors, that Lineker a little before his death turned priest and began to study the scriptures with which he was formerly unacquainted, in so much that reading the fifth, sixth, and seventh chapters of St. Matthew he vowed, that either this was not the gospel or we were not Christians. Another rector, Robert Cole, once was a nonconformist, especially in the matter of ecclesiastical vestments, but eventually got rid of his objections. Ecclesiastical commissioners then decided to have an object lesson in properly dressed clergymen at Lambeth. Mr. Cole was dressed in full clerical attire, and was then placed as the front figure at the meeting, while the Chancellor of the Bishop of London thus harangued the auditory, My masters and the ministers of London, the council's pleasure is, that ye strictly keep the unity of apparel, like to this man as you now see him, that is, a square cap, a scholar's gown, priest-like, a tippet, and in the church a linen surplus. The auditors then had to sign volo or nalo, and those who refused were deprived of their livings. 
Poor Mr. Cole, priest-like in his tippet, cuts a meeker figure than another Mers Tom Rector, James Somborn. This reverend gentleman was actually supposed to possess supernatural powers, and when a thief climbed up a pear tree in the rectory orchard, Mr. Somborn went in pursuit, fixed his gaze upon the robber from a suitable distance and from where he stood, using dreadful arts, fastened the robber in the tree. Another walk from Croydon, for those who like a string of little old churches, and an occasional fine view, would be by Addington to the southeast through Sanderstead to Worlingham, or further south to the edge of the Chalk Ridge at Woldingham. The railway is never very far off. There is nothing imposing among these hillside hamlets, they leave an impression of tiny villages which felt their first need to be a church, the congregations must have been small and poor. They, of the Surrey churches, are nearest in heart to the little, lost-down churches of Sussex and Mr. Kipling's most magical poem. Addington, perhaps, could hardly be called lost, for many archbishops have lived at Addington Park, and two lie buried in the churchyard, Archbishop Longley and Archbishop Tate. There are memorials to three others Manners Sutton, Howley and Sumner. But the most attractive name on the church walls belongs to the wife of the builder of Addington House. She was Mrs. Grizzle Trekothick. Addington still lies in deep country, Sanderstead, its neighbor three miles to the southwest, is half in the country and half in the town. Old Sanderstead, the sandy place, has a large, square red brick house overlooking a park and a quiet churchyard, where the little church, with sloping roofs over each aisle, looks rather like a hen brooding chickens. In the chancel is a memorial to one of those squires who held strange offices under Tudor kings. He kneels in painted marble, and he was John Onsted, Eskier, servant to ye most excellent princess and our dread sovereign Queen Elizabeth, and Syriant of her maida's carriage by ye space of forty years. Southeast of Sanderstead are Farley and Chelsham, each with an old church, Farley's is a tiny building by a fine farmyard, but the piece of the little church is gone, its modest spire, as you walk to the churchyard, is dominated and affronted by the hideous clock tower of a neighboring lunatic asylum. Why should such a thing be? County councils have decreed that in this part of Surrey must be massed together the thousands of poor souls who have lost the reason which county councillors must be supposed to possess, but why insist on their unhappy presence? A building to hold such sadness should be a quiet thing, hidden among trees, silent, alone. But that would suit neither councillors nor architects. For them, asylums must stare, scar, insist that they will be seen and known, and here, in what should be tranquil and lovely country, they violate the hills. Two other villages, Worlingham and Woldingham, lie east of the railway. Worlingham stands round a pretty green, and has a pleasant inn, the church, which once lay among fields, is at the end of a chestnut avenue which belongs to the future. It is a curious little building, with a sense of wide light and cool stone, and has been beautifully restored by Mr. Philip Mainwaring Johnston, who discovered, and has admirably preserved, a particularly interesting low side window with a circular niche in the chancel. Woldingham, right on the edge of the chalk ridge, has a tiny church set apart among the fields, nearer the village, a pretty wooden chapel almost the only pretty wooden chapel I have seen. But the best of Woldingham is the broad and breezy grass plateau on which it stands. On a clear day you may see London, a better view to the south is blocked by new buildings and gardens. The railway returns to Pulley and Croydon, Pulley, where Took lived, and gave his name to Horn Took, with 8,000 pounds, for winning him a lawsuit. From Pulley Horn Took named his diversions, they may have diverted him, but if they did, he could be moved to mirth by a very dreary business indeed. Chapter 37 Horley and Charlwood Restore church windows a cow for an apprentice a Horley 11 Thunderfield Castle Horn Outwood common a daring jump over the green burstos astronomer Causey St. Margaret and the devil a country sermon. The pretty village and church of Horley is the opening of a descriptive paragraph in a Surrey guidebook not 30 years old. Horley is more than a village and a little less than pretty today. But it has two good old-fashioned country inns, and it is a convenient center to some interesting country. 
it contains in itself little of interest except the church, which has a fine tower, but which is one of the unhappiest examples of unintelligent restoration. The story of the restoration is, indeed, hardly credible. In 1877 the Surrey Archaeological Society visited the church, and Major Heels wrote an admirable paper on its architecture, particularly drawing attention to the beauty of the windows in the North Isle, which dated from 1310, and contained some rare deep ruby glass. He described the tracery as the most beautiful in the county. Yet within five years the church was restored, the windows, which were in excellent preservation and would have lasted another 500 years, were destroyed, every stone of them, and the glass had disappeared, either broken up or sold. The Six Bells in Horley The Six Bells in Horley Horley Parish registers have some pleasant entries. Stray daughters, who ate too much at home and otherwise were hard to look after, used to be apprenticed to persons who would undertake, for a consideration, to keep them until they were twenty-one. The consideration might be in cash or in kind. Thus, Jeremy Shu, on January 13, 1604, took in Chamley, daughter of Edmund Chamley, deceased, apprentice until she come to XXJ, in consideracon he receives some household stuff to the value of VJS aged and is to be eased in not paying to the poor for third years to come. John Chelsham had a better bargain, for he agreed to take in Williams till she came to twenty-one, and had from her father one mare and a colt in full satisfaction. Sometimes the apprentices were bound even longer. Susan Washford was bound to Bernard Humphrey, and he undertook to keep her sufficient meat, drink, and apparel until she come to the age of power and twenty years. Susan's mother was a widow, and she paid to get rid of her daughter a cow and twenty shillings from the church wardens. Not many Surrey towns or villages can boast a family cricket eleven. Horley can. Eleven Watneys of Horley have played frequent matches against local clubs, and against eleven Wiggins of Mortlake. Mr. F. S. Ashley Cooper has collected some other instances of family cricket teams in the county. Eleven Bacons, a father, and ten sons, played eleven postmen at Thornton Heath in 1895, but were beaten by the postmen. In 1877 eleven Mitchells played eleven Heaths on Shalford Common. The Heaths all belonged to the same family, but the Mitchells were only relations. Eleven Lovells played a match at Tulls Hill in 1901, but had much the worst of it, and, most famous name of all, twelve Caesars of Godalming, three fathers and their nine sons, once played the gentlemen of the district. The family luck was no better, they lost by sixteen runs. Hardly a mile to the southeast of Horley lies an Enigma Thunderfield castle. There is no castle, perhaps there never was one. A moat of brown water, splashed with white duck feathers, an irregular mound beyond, thick with brushwood, and an ordinary set of farm buildings through a gate to the side that is all that is to be seen of the castle today. Was it an old British camp? Almost certainly not, nor a Roman camp. Mr. Malden, the Surrey historian, thinks it may have been one of the numberless castles built by the quarrelsome declares to annoy the equally quarrelsome de Warens. Perhaps it was built in the days when castles sprang up like mushrooms, and perhaps it was demolished when demolitions were so frequent that one more or less was never noticed. It may have had a stone keep, but nobody can tell whether it had or not unless he excavates the ground within the moat, and that is a task which nobody, apparently, desires to try. Another mile and a half along the west road from Horley leads to Smallfield Place, once the manor house of the Bish family, afterwards a farmhouse, and now a private residence, with the Jacobean part of the old house apparently well worked in with the new. Further, by another mile, is the tiny village of Horn, not much more than a school, a church, and an old cottage or two. In such a simple, open-air little place it was attractive to see, on a hot September day when I was there, a ring of school children being given their lessons out of doors in the shade. Horn is one of those little villages in which, when the busy, pleasant hum of the children's school first comes down the wind, you wonder where the children spring from. 
It does not look as if there were enough cottages within walking distance to provide a class, much less four or five standards if that is the correct expression. Horn is, indeed, one of the most out-of-the-way little places in this part of the county. But it makes a satisfactory objective for a walk from Horley, and its small church contains at least two memorials of interest. One is an elaborate piece of wood carving, painted to look like marble, which commemorates John Goodwine, who died when James I was king, the other is an ingenious model of the church itself, as it stood before restoration. The restorers altered the interior pretty thoroughly, but the old church must have been a curious building. It had a long, large window on the roof, especially let in to throw light on the hymn books of the musicians in the gallery. How was such a window cleaned? Walking in this part of Surrey, which is chiefly pasture, is apt to be a little monotonous, without a good view. One of the prettiest views near Horn is at Outwood, a little more than a mile to the northwest, on the way back to Horley. Outwood Common is delightful. Two great windmills, black and white, spread sails to the blowing air, below them, black and white like the mills, pigs nose quietly over the short grass, and geese strut cackling. To the north, beyond rich and tranquil fields, lie the grey-green wooded hills by Bletchingley and Nutfield. The windmills at Outwood. The windmills at Outwood. Horn is pretty near the center of the country of the Burstow Foxhounds, which stretches from Lee, the other side of Horley, to Eden Bridge in Kent. Two good stories are told of White, the Burstow Huntsman. One is of an extraordinary jump, singular not for its height or the width of ground covered, but for its daring and adroitness. It was on one of the best days the Burstow ever had, when they killed a fox at Crawley after an hour and ten minutes run almost without a check, and went on to find another fox near New Chapel Green, which hounds ate in Kent at half past five, nobody knows quite where, so bad was the light. Nearly at the end of the second run White found himself on the edge of a narrow, deep gill, with a stream at the bottom, crossed by an overgrown footpath which went down to the stream and up again by flights of stone steps opposite each other. Riding down two or three of the steps, he took a standing jump over the stream and landed on the top steps the other side. On another occasion his daring was of a different kind, he did not know where he was riding. Hounds had crossed the golf links on Ullswood Common, and White, close behind them, was riding straight for one of the greens. A member of the hunt shouted to warn him, but White, who had not the slightest notion what was meant, galloped straight over the green, turning round to point at the hole and shout to the hunt, Where hole? Where hole? Burstow itself, hidden among pines, has named the hounds, but has not a large part in Surrey history. One of its rectors, the Reverend J. Flamsteed, who is buried in the church, was the first astronomer royal. Charles II made him that, when he was 29, nine years later he took orders, and went on astronomising till his death. Newton helped him and quarrelled with him over the publication of his observations, but it was something, even in the days of Charles II, to be made astronomer royal when Newton was alive. Three miles on the other side of Horley lies Charlwood, once a wholly restful little village, but of late years stiffened and discolored by the building contractor. The center street of the village, near the church, is quaintly arched by a pair of elm trees, cropped and pollard to meet overhead. Elms are not often selected for experiments in topiary. But Charlwood has more than one feature peculiar to itself, or at all events to the district. The village lies deep in Wilden clay, which can grow luxuriant roses, but which in days when Surrey roads were less well laid made getting about in the winter rains a matter of difficulty for those who could not drive. So those who walked made their own paths, which can be seen running along the side of most of the roads in the neighborhood. Causeys is the local name for these causeways, which are single slabs of flat stone set like stepping stones in the clay, sometimes for miles together. The villagers tell you that they have been there since no one knows when. They may be right, but their probable date is the middle of the 17th century, when John Gainsford, as we shall see, was making a causeway like these at Crowhurst. Charlwood. Charlwood. 
A very curious set of wall paintings portrays, in the south aisle of Charlwood Church, the legend of Saint Margaret. Saint Margaret was a virgin and a martyr, a most popular saint in the Middle Ages, and the heroine of a remarkable story. She was the daughter of a pagan priest at Antioch, and since she was a weak child, she was sent into the country for fresh air. Her nurse brought her up as a Christian, and when she was older she was sent into the fields to mind sheep. One day the governor of Antioch, whose name was Olabrius, was out hunting, saw the pretty shepherdess, fell in love with her at sight, and offered her his hand in marriage on the spot. Saint Margaret refused him, she might not wed with a pagan. Olabrius was furious. He seized the poor shepherdess, beat her cruelly, and threw her into prison, even there she was not safe. The devil himself came after her in the form of a dragon, entered the prison and swallowed the saint whole, as you may see in the picture. However, providence intervened, and by a miracle she escaped from the dragon's body. Evidently providence then gave up helping, for Olabria succeeded where the devil had failed. He ordered her head off at once, and the artist has painted her soul flying to heaven in the form of a dove. Another painting sets out a commoner story, the allegory of the three living and the three dead. Three kings ride out hunting in the forest, and are met by three ghastly specters, who lecture them on the vanity of this world's pomps and pleasures. I should think this used to be a favorite. It must have been vastly comforting to the poor, and pretty easy, too, for the parson. Anybody could make a sermon on the sufferings in store for kings and other rich people, and the way they go out hunting and shooting and not caring for anybody, and then the specters come at them and they see how empty life is. Even today those ruddled drawings can set a spell. Stare at them, and the little church calls back its preacher and his flock, there, in the pulpit, he stood, gesturing at the dragon and Saint Margaret, here, below him, sat the quiet-hearted countryman, wondering in the solemn Sunday sunshine, here, perhaps, a child, hearing the story for the first time. Saint Margaret must have been more difficult than the kings. She begins well enough, and she goes on well the village maidens would doubt whether they would have the strength to refuse an olabrius. Then the deliverance from the devil would do admirably, the bumpkins would swallow that as easily as the devil swallowed Saint Margaret. But how to go on? How to explain the failure of providence afterwards? The preacher must have slurred that, and got on quickly to the wings of the dove. Two great Surrey families belong to Charlwood. One is the line of Sander, or Saunder, settled at Charlwood as early as Edward II, and still surviving, in name at all events, in the neighborhood. It was Richard Saunder who placed in the church the delicate 15th century oak screen, the most beautiful in the county, but a more famous member of the family was Nicholas Saunder, Regius Professor and Jesuit Divine, over whose writings many good churchmen quarreled. The other family are the Jordans of Gatwick, almost as old as the Saunders, and like them surviving in cottage life today. Godstone Godstone Chapter 38 Godstone and Bletchingley The white heart at Godstone cobbets violets Bletchingley beagles and foxhounds Dr. Nathaniel Harris begging the love of neighbors a gratuitous woman swift and a gentle prelate Bletchingley manner the master of the revels an English gentleman's armor how to be buried posing for a tombstone Nutfield Fuller's earth and its new uses. The key to the east of Surrey is Godstone. It is true that the village itself lies more than two miles from the railway station which bears its name, but which might equally well have been named Tandridge or Crowhurst. But there is no other centre in East Surrey from which so many other villages and places of interest are easily reached. To the west, a mile and a half away, lies Bletchingley, and another mile beyond that, Nutfield, which has not yet been absorbed by Redhill, and, indeed, belongs to Surrey country as surely as Redhill belongs to the railway and the town. To the north are Caterham and Calden and Woldingham and Worlingham, Tandridge is two miles away, Oxted a little more, and Limpsfield not quite four, north of Limpsfield is Titsy, and east of Limpsfield and Titsy is the Kent border. Crowhurst lies to the southeast, and beyond that Linkfield, but Linkfield is almost Sussex, 
and is perhaps a little too far for a walk from Godstone, it is best reached by rail. Godstone begins hospitably, at least to the traveler from the south, with three old inns, the Bell, the Rose, and Crown, and the old White Hart, now the Clayton Arms. The Bell and the Rose and Crown have not, I think, won any particular place in history, probably they were always a little overshadowed by the spacious frontage of the old White Hart. The Rose and Crown, for all that, displays an imposing board setting out the numbers and the addresses of the many cycling clubs who have made it their country headquarters doubtless it has been the first stage of many happy, dusty journeys. But the old White Hart has its place in the classical country books. Cobbett often lunched there, and probably the inn parlor where he had his bread and bacon is very much the same as when he wrote of the village in rural rides. Perhaps the rooms upstairs hold more furniture than in the twenties particularly the fine dining room with its oak beamed ceiling, which is as full of furniture as a room can very well be, besides serving various public uses as a place in which audits and meetings are held and county and local account books inspected. In the yard outside, too, although the great vats of the brew house are gone, and Renault cars run under the arch which used to echo with the shoes of spanking teams, there can be little changed since Cobbett saw it. He wrote, in 1822. At and near Godstone the gardens are all very neat, and at the inn, there is a nice garden well stocked with beautiful flowers in the season. I here saw, last summer, some double violets as large as small pinks, and the lady of the house was kind enough to give me some of the roots. The garden is still gay and full of flowers, though if I were the landlady I should certainly stock some peculiarly pretty sorts of violets to keep up the tradition even if she were to find it a little difficult to provide the flowers in bloom in high summer. The village itself has not grown greatly during the past hundred years. Cobbett describes it as a beautiful village, chiefly of one street, with a fine large green before it, and with a pond in the green. There is not much else to be seen now, the green is as wide and sunny, the geese and ponies graze as contentedly, and the pond is as bright under the chestnut trees and limes. If there has been any very noticeable change, it has been made, perhaps, nearer the church and away towards the railway station, which lie pretty far apart. From the main road by the Clayton Arms there runs a gravel path up to the church, which stands on higher ground, half a mile from the green, and by the path lies a very fine pond, broad and deep, edged with willows and bulrushes, where wild ducks swim, and on the far side opening into a shallow bay in which you may watch plovers bathe through the summer afternoons. The church has not quite the grace and charm of some of its simpler neighbors, but it is interesting as containing a number of monuments to the Evelyns. Church mice are proverbial, but Godstone has a church robin, or had one when I was there in the autumn of 1907. Bread had been placed conveniently for him in one of the windows, and he flew about watching me quietly, and eventually sang a loud solo from beside the organ cantoras, I think. Outside the church are some of Godstone's newer buildings, the alms houses erected by Mrs. Hunt of Wanham House in memory of her daughter, like the additions to the church, they are the work of Sir Gilbert Scott. Nothing could be more admirable than the repose and solidity of these delightful houses, with their massive oak beams and sturdy red chimneys. Sir Gilbert himself lived for a time at Rock's Nest, between Tandridge and Godstone. A mile and a half to the west of Godstone lies Bletchingley, high on the ridge that runs parallel to the downs, above Mers Tom, to the north. When Mr. Jennings walked into Bletchingley, in his field paths and green lanes, the population seemed to him at first sight to be made up of butchers and beagles. That was more than thirty years ago, but Bletchingley still keeps up its reputation, in regard to the Beagles, indeed, it has added to its just fame, for the odds are that, in the summer months at all events, the first animal to catch your eye in Bletchingley will be a foxhound. The kennels of the Burstow Hunt are at small fields, near Horley, but the puppies introduce themselves to other lodgings. Another abiding feature of Bletchingley is its cobbled gutters. The quiet, sunny main street is one of the broadest of all Surrey village roads, and its gutters drain it admirably. It lies between low and comfortable old houses, of which the White Hart is the chief, 
as becomes an ancient and notable inn. The White Hart when I saw it last was welcoming a couple of foxhounds, another strolled across the road careless of a hooting horn, another stood in a shop door. But of all that belongs to the past in Bletchingly the best lies away from the main road. Brewer Street is the name of an offshoot of Bletchingly to the north, and contains one of the most perfect small timbered houses in the county the gatehouse of the old manor. Old Timbered House near Bletchingly Old Timbered House near Bletchingly Bletchingly has been given a bad character by Cobbett. The vile rotten borough of Bletchingly, he calls it, and adds, from a godstone in, that it is happily for godstone out of sight. Long before Cobbett the Bletchingly politicians were in hot water. One of them, Dr. Nathaniel Harris, was rector of the parish in the early days of the Stuarts, and took his politics with him, as other clergymen have done, into the pulpit. A Mr. Lovell was the candidate he wanted in for Bletchingly, and he did his best for a canvas. He preached a sermon specially directed against persons who would not vote for Lovell, he took his text out of Matthew now the chief priest and elders sought false witnesses, and he referred generally to his opponents as lying knaves. It must have been inspiriting to hear him. His candidate got in, but there was a petition against him for bribery, and Dr. Harris got into trouble. He had to kneel at the bar of the House of Commons and humbly confess his fault and pray for pardon, and on the next Sunday he had to confess again in church, and to beg for the love of his neighbors. The Reform Act ended Bletchingly as a borough. It had been bought in the reign of Charles II by Sir Robert Clayton, and was just as flagrant a job as Gatton or Hasselmere, generally a Clayton sat for it. In the Clayton era there were not many more than a dozen electors, but the numbers who turned out at an election were remarkable. The inn set out their barrels in the streets, free to all drinkers, the Bletchingly cobbles ran beer. As a disfranchised borough, it ended with a flash of distinction, its last members were Thomas Hyde Villers and Lord Palmerston. Other rectors of Bletchingly were gentler souls than Dr. Harris. One of them, William Hampton he belonged to a remarkable line of Hamptons, seven generations and all clergymen left a pretty passage in his will. He bequeathed to his granddaughter, Judith Herod, a plot of ground in Bletchingly, because, as he wrote, she is very like her mother and beareth the name of her great-grandmother my mother a gratius woman. Another, Thomas Herring, rose to be Archbishop of Canterbury. Not everybody would have recommended him. Swift abused him. Herring preached a sermon in Lincoln's Inn and condemned Gay's Beggar's Opera, and Swift went to the attack in the Intelligencer. I should be very sorry that any of the clergy, he wrote should be so weak as to imitate a court chaplain who preached against the beggar's opera, which probably will do more good than one thousand sermons of so stupid, so injudicious, and so prostitute a divine. Swift would have quarreled with his biographer, who gives him an engaging character. His person was majestic, he had a gracefulness in his behavior and gravity in his countenance, that always procured him reverence. His pronunciation was so remarkably sweet and his address so insinuating that his audience immediately on his beginning to speak were prepossessed in his favor. Bletchingly. Bletchingly. Few manners in Surrey have passed through more distinguished hands than Bletchingly. At the conquest it was given to the great Richard de Tone Bridge, and perhaps he built Bletchingly Castle. He was pretty well off for land in Surrey, for he held 38 manors in that county alone. He was the head of the declares, and they held Bletchingly for eight generations. The most famous of them was the Red Earl who knew how to change sides between Simon de Montfort and Henry III so as to be cursed as a traitor six centuries ago and recognized by later generations as a patriot and a statesman, who could curb the barons as well as resist the king. He was the last but one of the declares to hold Bletchingly, and it was during his absence, at the Battle of Lewis, that a royalist party destroyed the castle. His son died at the head of his horse at Bannockburn, and the manor came by marriage into the Stafford family. They held it for another six generations, until the third Duke of Buckingham, Lord High Constable under Henry VIII, ended the splendors of the Staffords on the scaffold. Sir Nicholas Carew had the manor next, and followed Buckingham to Tower Hill. Then Anne of Clevies, 
too plain for Tower Hill, lived there, and Sir Thomas Cowardin managed it for her and succeeded her. He is the fascinating figure. He moves in a royal light of courts and kings, of hunting and hawking in the sunshine, and plotting in dark chambers, and guessing the value of a queen's smile. He was Henry VIII's master of the revels, and keeper of the king's tents, hails, and toiles, which were wooden stables and traps for game, and at Bletchingly he entertained Henry and perhaps more than one of his queens. You picture the master of the revels riding in velvet by Catherine Howard, and wondering whether her eyes would take her by the same stairway as Anne Boleyn. When Queen Mary was proclaimed after Edward, and there were risings and rumours of risings in support of Queen Jane, Sir Thomas Cowardin had his difficulties. He had been getting his orders from Jane one day and Mary the next, and suddenly there was an end, he was arrested, and all his arms were ordered to be seized. Bletchingly Castle was searched, and was found to contain a good deal more than the armour of a few retainers and the artillery of a deer park. The inventory showed twenty-four demi-lances, eighty-six horsemen's staves, one hundred pikes, one hundred morris pikes, one hundred bows, two handguns, and other weapons, besides sixteen heavy pieces of cannon enough to arm a hundred horse and more than three hundred foot. All were seized and taken to the tower. Sir Thomas complained bitterly. Might not an English gentleman keep armor in his country house if he pleased to do so? Mary could prove nothing against him, and was obliged to let him go. But she thought his weapons best kept in the tower, and so, despite his protests, did Elizabeth after her. Sir Thomas's petition for their return and for redress is amongst the Lazuli manuscripts. Here is part of his statement. That on XXV. January. I marry he was lawfully possessed at Bletchingly of and in certain horses with furniture armure artillery and munitions for the wars and divers other goods to the value of two thousand pounds and that upon certain most untrue surmises brutes and rumours raised against him was brought into diverse and sundry vexations and troubles during which time one Sir Thomas Saunders Knight and William Saunders of Ewell on pretence of common did take into their heads and possession the said armure and eight of his great horses and did convey the same in seventeen great wains thoroughly loaden and at the same time spent no small quantity of his corn hay and straw and had only restored four loads and of the said eight great horse one of the best the third day after died. And the rest are in so evil plight and lykyng and were never since otherwise liable to serve in the cart to his great hindrance and undoing. When Sir Thomas died, his funeral was prodigious. No expense was spared, the feasting was gargantuan, the villagers mourned with the best beef and beer. Mr. Granville Levison Gower, in the Surrey Archaeological Collections, has obtained from the Lazuli Miz a full account of the charges, from which I make extracts. It is headed. Such charges as grew the day of the obsequies of Sir Thomas Cowardin, Knight, deceased, viz. For Saint to George Melsheem John Taylor for Blackelsksbly vs. IDM 2 ton of beer thurili. IDM IIII quarters wheat thurili zeeas thuriid. Item 2 oxen veli zeeas thuriid. Item IIII veals zeeas thuriid. Item IIII mutton zetas aided. Item IIII pigs vs thuriid. Item IIII dozen pig hans aids. Item 7 dozen conies aides. Item 4 dozen chickens vis aided. Item sugary species and fruits v. Lee. Item wine v. Lee. Item to one Garrett for helping in the kitchen two days IIS. Item to Richard Lees for Monye borrowed of him to be distributed at Horsley when Sister Tom Cowardin died for Nisarai's Thurila. Item for the loan of black cotton ZES1 DOB. Item for the waste of other cotton IIIs. Item for XXVII yards of black cotton that conveyed the wagon wherein the course was carried to Bletchingly from Horsley XVS Ixt. The black and the baked meats and the beer cost altogether £149.16. 1-1-D but Sir Thomas had foreseen it all. There were estimates obtained for such things in those days. Here is the estimate made by a herald of the funeral charges of Sir Thomas's lady. Preparation to be made for the burial of the Lady Cardin. First the body to be well sired, seared, and chested. 
Item a place to be appointed WHER the body shall be buried. Item, order to be talking for the hanging of the church white blacka. Item, order to be talking for the rails WHER the mourners shall know, to be hanged with blacka, and also the church, and the said rails, to be garnished with scotchins. Item, to appoint a gentleman in a blacka gown to carry the pennon of armes. Item, to appoint the women mourners, whereof the chiefest to be in the degree of a lady. Item, to appoint a KNYGHT or a squire to lead the chief mourner. Item, to appoint IIII gentlemen to be assistants to the body. Item, yeoman in black acots to carry the body. Item, to appoint a preacher. Item, to appoint a pall of black a velvet to lay upon the body during the service. Item, press and clerks to buy appointed for the said service. Clarence Yulks King of Armes was to manage it, to have five yards of black cloth for his morning gown, five shillings a day for his services, three pounds sixs, eight d for his fee, and to be paid back his charges to be borne to and fro. Men knew how to die then, and how to be buried. Bletchingly Manor, after the Cowardens, came to the Howards of Effingham, and so to an heiress Elizabeth Countess of Peterborough, the richest and loveliest lady of her day. Her son fought for the king against his own father, and the House of Commons fined him ten thousand pounds for turning Roman Catholic. The money had to be found, and the manor was sold to Sir Robert Clayton, Whig, Lord Mayor, Plutocrat, and, according to Dryden, extortioner. But Dryden's political satire was not always fair. Ishban, in Absalom, and Akito fell is Sir Robert. Ishban, of conscience suited to his trade. As good a saint as usurer ever made. There was a suspicion that Sir Robert would have liked to purchase a peerage, and Dryden was furious at the shame and scandal, though a quieter spirit, John Evelyn, dined more than once with the mayor, and evidently had some admiration for his hospitality. He was a discreet magistrate Evelyn writes, and though envied, I think without much cause. If Sir Robert Clayton was criticized during his lifetime, he left plenty of matter for dispute behind him when he died. Half Bletchingly Church is dominated by his monument. Mr. Jennings was appalled by it, a fearful neighbor he calls it, and is of opinion that whatever may have been the misdeeds of the dead, he never could have done anything bad enough to deserve his terrific monument. As a matter of fact the dead man designed his own memorial, after the serenely contemplative fashion of his time. Is the monument, after all so appalling? It cannot but be interesting, for it is an index to the taste of a bygone age and age when the survivors of the dead found relief in Latin superlatives, and the living looked into the future with the respectable vanity of an alderman posing before a mirror. No doubt Sir Robert spent many happy hours over his monument. Did he, or did the sculptor suggest the plump cherubs which stand on each side, rolling stony tears from upturned eyes? Did he decide on the particular direction in which he should throw a leg? Was it he who selected the disjointed texts which are carved below him? Or did the sculptor submit samples? It would be an arresting spectacle, the finality of the whole thing, the weight of the choosing would oppress even a Lord Mayor. A specimen angel would be shown him, no, he could not approve an angel. Had the sculptor no other sizes in cherubs? What texts were being used this season? Stone tears. The sculptor probably thought of those. The church once had a fine spire. Aubrey mentions it particularly, as measuring more than forty feet above the battlements, with five great bells, the tenue weighing two thousand weight, which were melted with the spire and all the timber work destroyed 1606. It was computed that in the spire were 200 loads of timber. In the tower below the timber is still magnificent and massive, and there is a new peal of bells, cast in 1780. Bletchingly has one of the longest records of church bell ringing in the county. On April 11, 1789, its ringers rang a full peal of 5,600 changes college exercises in 3 hours 36 minutes, as you may read in a record in the Belfry. In the record the ages of the ringers are carefully given. They range between 19 and 30. 
Bell ringing is hard work. Between Bletchingley and Redhill lies Nutfield, which has not yet been caught into the town. Perhaps its progress into Redhill will be slow, for it stands inconveniently high for wheeled traffic in and out of that huddled basin of bricks, and from its own station a mile to the south the roads up the hill are some of the steepest in East Surrey. Before Redhill brings it more money and more bricks, it ought to be worth an enterprising landlord's while to convert its principle into its old methods. The old queen's head is a posting in with the remains of what was once a spacious parlor, solid with oak beams big enough for a belfry, warmed by a broad open fireplace and offering the hospitality of two great chimney seats. The chimney seats have lapsed into cupboards and a stove stands where once the wielden logs roared up into the night. But if Godstone with its Clayton arms, or Chitting Fold with its crown, beckons in the passerby to look at old oak and old walls, why should not Nutfield? Nutfield Church Nutfield Church Nutfield's chief industry, the digging of Fuller's earth, dates back to beginnings that are now quite forgotten. The Nutfield pits are still working, and spread over the slope on which they lie a dreary stretch of blue and grey upturned soil as if a giant gamekeeper had been digging out colossal ferrets. The industry is old enough and important enough for the export of Fuller's earth to have been prohibited as far back as Edward II, and in 1693 one Edmund Warren was tried in the Exchequer for smuggling a quantity of earth out of the country, though it was proved to be not Fuller's earth but potter's clay. But there is no doubt that great quantities were smuggled abroad, with corresponding injury or so it was thought at the time to the cloth and woolen industry of Guilford and southwest Surrey. Later days have discovered later methods of scouring cloth of Greece, and the trade no longer makes large demands on the pits of Nutfield. But Fuller's Earth has still its uses at the toilet table, and in America other uses. I have ascertained them exactly. It is employed to dehydrate certain oils with which the pork packer adulterates lard. Linkfield. Linkfield. Chapter 39. Linkfield and Crowhurst. A chapter of Hume the village cage the copthorn poachers a shop for three centuries the green face sold in a griffin's hoof second best fish Eleanor Cobham and the witch Crowhurst a tree and a rubbish heap an iron tombstone fifteen daughters running Crowhurst place. Linkfield is not large enough, nor enough overbuilt and railway ridden, to dare to the title of capital even of a distant corner of Surrey. But it stands above and apart from the quiet country round it, like a Bible in an old library. Near it, or in its streets, are some of the prettiest and most ancient timber houses in the county, the churchyard with its brick paths, its rose beds, the red walls round it and its view of the weald, has the serenity of deep meadowland and sunlit cloisters, the church itself, with its sculptured oak and baronial tombs, belongs to all English history from Cressy. If the churches of the surrounding parishes, with their brasses and their registers, make up an admirable local guide book, the records of Linkfield Church are a chapter of Hume. The Village Cage, Linkfield. The Village Cage, Linkfield. The village itself is the pleasantest mixture of every style of Surrey cottage, brick and timber, weather tiling, plain brick, plain wood, and a queer row of square white stuccoed buildings which looks as if it had been dumped inland from opposite shingle and dancing seas. It only lacks tamarisk to be sheer worthing. The village centers on its pond, not a broad nor a very limpid piece of water, but distinguished by a pair of swans, and by a curious obelisk standing at its head which once may have marked a shrine. Built onto the bowl of an old oak by the obelisk is an apartment engagingly labeled Ye Village Cage. Other Surrey villages have had their cages, but only Linkfield has kept one. The door is massive and threatening, and you get the keys at the chemist's the other side of the road, or rather, a guide politely accompanies you and displays the cage's secrets. The cage not long ago fell into disuse. It was once used as a temporary lock-up for drunk or disorderly persons, or others who had traversed the local bylaws of morality. Local justice descended upon them, and they were cast into durance until morning should bring soberness with a headache, or, in more serious cases, until proper conveyance could be got round for Godstone. The cage has seen at least one exciting rescue. This was some fifty or sixty years ago, 
when a number of desperate characters vaguely described as the Cockthorn Poachers were captured and hailed into prison. As to the exact number of captives, tradition varies, but the legend which is the most respectful to the powers of the local constable sets it at eleven. The eleven were surrounded, the door of the dungeon closed on them, and the village tried to go to sleep. Darkness came on, and a daring deed. Other poachers stole into the village, got to work with picks and crowbars, took the roof off the dungeon and hauled out their comrades exulting. The village wisely did not attempt to recapture. The cage saw its last tenant in 1882, and the story of the rescued poachers may still, perhaps, be heard from the mouth of the oldest inhabitant, who was himself at one time a constable. As an expert in suppressing crime, he never liked the plan on which the cage was built. The floor is higher by two steps than the ground outside, and you had to go upstairs to it. In fact, you had to throw your prisoner upstairs a most perilous business. It ought to have been built so that you could take him by the left leg and throw him downstairs like a Christian. Caged prisoners at Linkfield were not always treated with the utmost rigor of the law. At one time the door was pierced by a grating, and through the grating kindly souls passed packets of tobacco. Liquor could not be passed in packets, but found its way in somehow. Afterwards in severer days the grating was closed, and prisoners neither drank nor smoked, as became their miserable condition. Nine years after the last captive languished behind the blocked grating the prison was taken over by the village for fresh purposes. Henceforward it was to be the museum, and was duly vested in trustees. Its collection still grows slowly. Anything to do with village crime we make that our special subject, the curator informs you with a pleasing urbaneness. The collection includes a man trap, a pair of handcuffs, a canvas bed which furnishes the museum whenever it is wanted as a mortuary, a pair of farmer's snow boots used a hundred years ago, and a pair of farmer's ordinary boots used more recently. Of tiny village streets there is no more fascinating byway than the little road which leads up to the south door of Linkfield Church. On the right is the Star Inn, taking its sign from the arms of the great lords of Sturborough who lie in the church, and built beside the inn a row of quiet cottages, perhaps once part of the inn. On the left one building stands out from the rest, an early 16th century timber house, admirably preserved and of peculiar interest because after 300 years it is still carrying on the business for which it was intended. It was built as a shop, and it is a shop still. Modern preference for plate glass and easily opened doors has changed the original plan of the ground floor, but the first floor remains almost as its builder left it, and its heavy girders with their rounded ends jutting out over the pavement below are a happy testimony to the worth of Wielden builders and Wielden wood. Wielden paint on the other hand, has not improved. The girders are still dark and stained as oak, or is it chestnut, should be stained by age and weather. But a yard or two away there are beams as massive and as well seasoned which flout the lapse of centuries with a flaring and be varnished buff. The church is noble and tranquil without and within. A chained Bible stands on a lectern, another Bible, bought May the 10th 1683, as the inscription runs on the title page, by William Saxby of Surrey ESQ, for the use and benefit of all good Christians is in use today. But the chief interest of the church today, as it has been its chief glory in the past, is its association with the great family of Cobham. The Cobhams of Sturborough their castle stood two miles east of Linkfield, but has fallen came of a line which through two of the most eventful centuries of English history was represented in almost every battle, consulted in the most difficult diplomacy, and allied at last by marriage to an English king. Their family goes back to a justice itinerant who settled in Kent, but the real founder of the Surrey branch was the justice's grandson, the first Lord Cobham of Sturborough. He was one of the greatest soldiers of his day, and, from the ransoms he had for the prisoners he took in battle, one of the richest. It was to him, with Sir John Chandos and the Earl of Warwick, that Edward III entrusted the Black Prince at Cressy, at Poitiers he rescued the King of France, he was Lord Admiral of the King's fleet from the mouth of the Thames westwards, and to end it all, he died in his bed of the plague. His effigy on his tomb tramples a soldan, 
whose face has been duly painted green by the artist an interesting relic, according to Mr. J.G. Waller, of Crusaders' traditions. There were not enough names for colors in those days, and perhaps the soldiers trying to describe the olive skins of the Arabs, may have called them green. For some obscure reason, too, the Sultan with his green face and his red beard is intended by the artist to be alive. Nobody can say why that should be, but the sculptor doubtless knew. He was a careful and accurate man, you can still trace below Lord Cobham's left knee the fastenings of the garter. Lord Cobham's wife, Joan, was the author of one of the longest wills in existence. She remembered everybody, including the prisoners in chains at Southwark and the sick men in the hospitals. Her executor Robert Belknap was to have a horn made from a griffin's hoof with a silver core, and the said horn has a silver rim and two silver gilt feet. But she was most anxious, poor lady, about her soul. Before everything else there were to be said seven thousand masses, immediately upon her death, and the priests were to have twenty-nine pounds threes. Forty-four saying them. A penny a mass, that is, and the priests took the pence. But it was twelve years before they had said the masses. The second Lord Cobham had mingled experiences of love and war. According to the inscription on his tomb, broken in the church but preserved in the College of Arms, he was as brave as a leopard, a sumptuous entertainer, handsome, imperturbable, and courteous. He was a soldier, but the great struggle of his life had nothing to do with a battlefield. It was his attempt to secure a dispensation from the Pope for marrying his cousin in defiance of the canon law. Almost a year passed before the Pope gave his decision on the point, and then he ordered the unhappy cousins a horribly tedious penance. For four years they might not eat meat, they might not drink wine on Wednesdays, and at the six fasts they might only eat the second best kinds of fish, and not those which were most agreeable to them. They had to feed four poor persons daily, and wait upon them themselves, and these poor persons were to have bread and meat or fish, with half a flagon of ale, and were to have new tunics and new russet hoods every year. All this was in addition to various heavy fines. The money part must have been the least exasperating, but it might have been amusing to choose the less agreeable kinds of fish. The eldest son of this much bepenanced marriage had two distinctions. He was for some years the warden, at Sturborough Castle, of the French heir to the throne, the Duke of Orleans who was taken prisoner at Agincourt, and he was the founder of Linkfield College. Linkfield College had a provost, six chaplains, four clerks, and thirteen poor persons, but none of its walls stand today. The life of the college farm alone survives, in an inventory of the implements and livestock taken at the dissolution. Here are some extracts. The laborer's chamber. Warriors and statesmen though the Cobhams were, one of their women folk has made more history than they. It was Eleanor, daughter of the founder of Linkfield College, who married the Lord Protector, the good Duke Humphrey of Gloucester, and who was convicted of dire misdemeanors. Edward Hall, the old historian, writing of 1441, tells the story. For first this year, Dame Eleanor Cobham, wife of the said duke, was accused of treason, for that she, by sorcery and enchantment intended to destroy the KYNG, to then tend to adjuance and to promote her husband to the crown, upon these she was examined in St. Stephen's Chapel before the Bishop of Canterbury, and there by examination convict and judge to do open penance, in IIJ open places, within the city of London, and after that a judge to perpetual prison in the Isle of Man, under the coping of Sir Johann Stanley, KNYGHT. At the same season were arrested, as aiders and counsellors to the Seti de Chess, Thomas Southwell, Priest and Chanan of St. Stephen's, in Westminster, Johann Hum, Priest, Roger Bolingbroke, a coning necromancer, and Marguerite J.O.U. Ardain, surnamed the Witch of I, to whose charge it was lied Y.T. They, at the request of the Duchess, had devised an image of wax, representing the K.Y.N.G., which by their sorcery, a little and little consumed, entending thereby in conclusion to waste, and destroy the Kinji's person, and so to bring him to death, for the witch trays on they W.E. are a judge to die, 
and so Marjorie J. O. U. Ardain was brent in Smithfeld, and Roger Bolingbroke was drawn and quartered at Tiborn, taking upon his death, that there was no or no such thing by time imagined, Yohan Hum had his pardon, and Southwell died in the Turi before execution. The beautiful Duchess's penance is in all the history books. But it is Shakespeare, and not the historians, who makes her walk through the town in a white sheet and barefoot. Three miles north of Linkfield is Crowhust, one of a noble pair of names. Crowhust in Sussex and Crowhust in Surrey each has its immemorial yew, a tree of trees. But the yew of the Surrey churchyard is there no better way of honoring a tree than the Crowhust way? Who is to look at a tree like this without unhappiness? From the road the first impression to be had of it is nothing very imposing, a mass of deep and shining green, of no great stature, with strong, springy branches brushing the church walls that is all. But the nearer view. You expect, and find, an enormous gnarled trunk, and then your first idea is that someone has thrown a rubbish heap at the tree, and that most of the rubbish has stuck old tea trays, broken kettles, saucepan lids, the sides of tin trunks. You then perceive that over gaps and wounds in the vast and riven shell there have been bound, or nailed, or otherwise fastened a number of patches of thin sheet iron, painted a peculiarly ugly red. These patches of paint shriek with the names of a thousand cockneys, and the names suit the method of mending the broken tree. Gus should be the name of the man who fixed that patch, herb, surely, daubed on that paint, Alf, I think, drove in that nail. Could none of the foresters of the Weald have helped a great tree better in its old age? There should be methods of preserving a tree which are not of necessity hideous, else, it would be better for the giant to die as it pleased. The church stands commandingly on a hill, overlooking level pastures and woodlands. But the view to the west, with all its breadth and quiet, is not more happy than the nearer picture to the east. Church gates stand opposite few more charming medleys than the multiplied gables, tumbled triangles, and oblongs of red tiles belonging to the roofs of the house on the other side of the road. This fine old brick building, with its formal garden path and clipped use is now, like the Gainsford's manor house a mile away, merely a farmhouse. But it was once the family residence of the Angels, the other great family of Crowhurst after the Gainsfords. Like the Gainsfords, the Angel family has disappeared. The last John Angel died in 1784, and left a very curious will. His property was to go to anyone who could prove himself, not herself, descended from an ancestor of his who lived in the reign of Henry VI. Many claims followed, none were proved. Crowhurst Church and the Old U. Crowhurst Church and the Old U. The house has one record at least of unrequited hospitality. This is an extract from the parish registers. 1653 July 24 William Hillier son to Hillier of Bingfield in Berkshire who coming as a stranger to Mr. Engel's house in Crowhurst died, by whom being carefully attended by physicians and others in his signs and decently and in good fashion buried, the father of the said William Hillier refused to paye one farthing for his physician and burial like an unnatural father. Inside the church is a strange monument a slab of Sussex iron, let into the floor near the altar, and commemorating Anne Forster, the granddaughter of a patriarchal neighbor, Sir John Gainsford. It is odd in more than one way, it is the only iron tombstone in the county, though it is a tombstone that has often been copied. There are still several reproductions of it scattered about the country in the form of firebacks, evidently the founders considered the design convenient. Perhaps they might have made a better job if they had been severer scholars, for some of the lettering on it is quaint and topsy-turvy, the SS being twisted the wrong way round and the FS lying unhappily feet uppermost. Yet it fits well with the other old Gainsford and Angel monuments, and is also a memorial of a dead and gone industry, the iron smelting of Surrey, Sussex, and Kent. The farmhouse opposite Crowhurst Church. The farmhouse opposite Crowhurst Church. Leisure churchgoers should choose a service at Crowhurst at sunset, September drives the sun at the right angle to light its dark oak and the great beams of the belfry. Many churches have windows built high in the west end, through which part of the splendor of the setting sun can filter, 
but this window is set low, and the red sky floods the church. From the church to Crowhurst Place a mile away runs an interesting byway, the only one in Surrey, so far as I know, built by a private gentleman of permanent material, extending for a mile from his house to his place of worship. In the year 1631 the John Gainsford of the day, at the fine old age of 76, determined he would walk wet to church no more. He had a stone-flagged causeway laid from the manor house to the churchyard, it being before, as the parish register informs you, a loathsome dirty way every step. He paid two workmen fifty pounds for the job, and the causeway is still to be picked out across the meadows. Crowhurst Place Crowhurst Place The Gainsfords were one of the best, though not the greatest of the old Surrey families. They are first heard of in the reign of Edward III, when John and Marjorie Gainsford had the manor of Crowhurst from John de Stangrave and Joan his wife a delightful gathering of English names. One of them, in Tudor days, was Sheriff of Surrey, and well in the Tudor fashions, he had six wives. But he must have found them disappointing in their family duties, for the first five of them brought him fifteen daughters running, and it was only from the sixth and last that he got a son and heir. He was one of a long succession of Johns and Erasmuses, but the line failed at the end. There were never enough boys in the Gainsford families, and when at last the manor went to a daughter the spell was broken, the house was sold. The Bridge Over the Moat, Crowhurst Place The Bridge Over the Moat, Crowhurst Place Crowhurst Place was originally a timber house built in or near the reign of Henry VII, and according to tradition Henry VIII used to stay there on his way to visit Anne Bullen at Hever Castle over the border. It was, and still is in some respects, an admirable example of the masonry and carpentry of the 15th century, but the destroying hand of later builders has removed part of the timber and filled up the gaps with brick and weather tiling, so that its full character has been taken away. The Great Hall, with its glorious beams, was too much for the utilitarian. The waste of space distressed him. He therefore cut it in two by running a floor across the length of it halfway up, and subdivided his floor into bedrooms to accommodate the resident farmer's numerous family. It would be difficult to ruin a fine hall more completely. But the house still has its own beauty, though it is the wild beauty of poverty and neglect. It stands half a mile from the road to the southwest of the church, approached by a rough bridle path. The first glimpse through the trees is of gables striped white and dark, a moat, befeathered and noisy with ducks, and a little wooden bridge crossing the moat to a side door. Beyond lie great barns, a flagged courtyard and flagged paths, and round the corner a second bridge over the moat, brick-built and massive, and by the garden gate a mounting stone, which it would be pleasant to think gave Anne Bullen's royal wooer an easy step into the saddle. But it came later, perhaps. Is it not possible that Crowhurst Place may be rescued as Tangley Manor was? It has the hall, and the kitchen and the oak paneling, and the great fireplaces for which we search all the house agents' catalogues, it is moated, it has dined a king, there should be a ghost somewhere. But it rests apart, a farmhouse only. Brambles grow about it, such as should fence in a castle of sleep, above them timbered gables and tall chimneys to fit the cold and spacious hearths within. The fires that lit those hearths wait their rekindling. Chapter 40 Oxted and Limpsfield East of Godstone Tandridge the notebook of a Surrey Justice Sturdy Rogues Oxted a rustic Guilford Mittens and Corduroy's Limpsfield self-criticism the old oak chair Titsy Park and the Roman Villa Tatsfield above the Downs. East of Godstone five churches stand in a bow stretch to the Kent boundary. Not each church has a village. Oxted and Limpsfield, in the middle of the bow, are nearby a railway station, and Limpsfield plays golf on the common, both are little old villages with many new houses about them. But Tandridge and Titsy, towards each point of the bow, are churches almost without cottages, but with great parks beside them, Tatsfield, easternmost of all Surrey villages, has houses and cottages, but the church stands apart, looking out over the weald. Tandridge was once Tanridge, and had a priory, which disappeared, of course, at the dissolution. It was quite a little place, its earliest record, 
dated somewhere near the end of the 12th century, describes it as the hospital of St. James, in the Ville of Tunreg, with three priests, in perpetuity there serving God, and CONF raiders of the said hospital. So Odo, son of William de Damartine, writes of it in his deed of gift of lands, a windmill, and silver cups to make a chalice. The establishment was less a priory than a small hospice, in which poor and needy persons were cared for, and to which wayfarers might come for refuge, one of those gentle places for the help and refreshment of sorrowing men that are set so strangely before the days of Tudor cruelties and tortures. The prior's hospice welcomed and comforted the tired poor, Elizabeth's age beat them, men and women, four sturdy rogues. Tandridge Church Tandridge Church Later Tandridge history centers round the church and Tandridge Court. Tandridge Court has had noble owners, but perhaps the most interesting is Bostock Fuller, who was a justice of the peace in the days of Elizabeth, and who has left a notebook describing his work and the cases that came before him, which takes his reader extraordinarily close to Tudor times and customs. The manuscript, entitled Notebook of a Surrey Justice, is in the Bodleian Library at Oxford, and Mr. Granville Levison Gower in the Surrey Archaeological Collections, has made extracts from the Bodleian transcript. Here are some of them. The seventh I rode with Mr. Evelyn to Sir W. Gainsford's who was sigh, to have his testimony versus George Turner and that day we took Thurage rogues two men and I.J. women on Blindley Heath and had them to Godstone they had stolen I.J. ducks and accused Ash other of other facts, and the eighth day I went to Mr. Evelyn's and there we saw them whipped and made them passports to Devonshire and Somersetshire. The fifteenth day I caused two stout rogues called Mary Rendall a widow, and Anne Marks a whip to be whipped at Tanridge and sent to Rawlins in Essex. June 1608 The two two th I rode to Kingston Assisi's and there I stayed two three th and twenty fourth days. Botley and Renfield whom I sent to the jail were there hanged and Burgess whom Mr. Evelyn and I belled was burnt in the hand. January 1608 John Berry whom I sent to the goal for stealing Colcox and White's hens was arraigned and whipped. Bartholomew Gander being accessory and Roker, were put into the BYLL with the principal. 1612 December 23rd I sent a warrant for Richard Mathu of Regate for hunting my lord at Irel's Conies. 1613 the 4th of June. Amias Gullock brought to me by the officers of Gatton the 4th day of June for stealing of a PD coat which was taken with him, but the party would not accuse him of Falani, and he said he bought it. I caused him to be whipped and sent to the place of BYRTH at Coombe by Chard in Somersetshire. July 19. 1613. The Abu Abound and John Lamb is accused by the Denny's for shooting in a gun and Veen lawfully killing of his conies. Julie 1616. The Zith I sent Eli's. Edsel Siruin to Richard Green to the House of Correction for striking her dame and threatening her after and for departing from her Sirius. 19 degrees November. They brought Toller with a goose which he said he stole from Rose Harling, and I charged the constable to lay him by the heels all night and to bring him again next morning. He brake the stocks and ran away. So went village life for Tandridge in the golden days. Few cottages have been added since Mr. Bostock Fuller used to ride to the assizes. He would see little change, perhaps, in the church, with the glorious oak beams that bear up its belfry, and little, too, in the mighty yew whose branches brush its tower. Over one gravestone he might be puzzled. It has been placed in the grass, I think since his day, near the south door, and is an ancient monument of hard sandstone with a cross carved on it. Legend says that it was brought from Tandridge Priory, but there are others like it at Oxted and Titsy which belong to an older date than the Priory. A Street in Oxted A Street in Oxted Oxted is northeast of Tandridge, but there are two Oxteds. One is the new village near the station, with new shops, a new inn, and the old church. The other is the old village, set apart from the railway, a little village clustered about a main street running up the hillside a rustic Guilford, a main street with cottage fronts for Guilford house fronts, 
and an ancient timbered in hanging out a golden bell instead of Guilford's clock. Guilford's houses should hold Kate Greenaway maidens and prim ladies with mittens, Oxted should have corduroys and aprons, brown children, and sunbonnets. So Oxted has, and it has also, I think, more little inns than any Surrey village near its size. Each has its sign, the street holds out a gallery of signs, stone steps and raised alleys run to the cottage doorways, and the children play curious village games with chalk squares and knuckle bones, safe in the doorways and on the pavement. There is a corner by the road crossing the main street which is the prettiest in East Surrey. Weather beaten, brick and timber cottages frame it, the bell inn, with its beams like letters of a big black alphabet, hangs out its gold bell, beyond, the road slopes to dim country greennesses and the hill of the downs. Oxta Church Oxta Church Oxta Church Tower is noble and massive, a great content is about its quiet, solid battlements. Once it had a spire, and I wish I had never read that the spire was destroyed, now when I see it I am always wondering what the church was like with a spire. In the churchyard are two ancient tombstones, like the single stone at Tandridge, they, too, are far older than the church. Other strange monuments are in the church. One is to the memory of Anne, wife of Charles Hoskins, who thus mourned her in 1651 let this pattern of piety map of misery mirror of patience here rest. In another memorial you may trace the history of an extremely large family. John Aldersey Haberdasher and M. Chant Venter of London died in 1616, aged 75, and had issue 17 shield iron. The whole 17 are represented in marble accompanying, and from their dress and different sizes you may guess what happened to them. There are ten sons and seven daughters, of the ten sons, six are bearded men, who grew up, perhaps, and were men like their father, three are younger, just ordinary sons, and one is a baby I suppose died as a baby. Of the seven daughters, two are babies, and the five that wear caps you may imagine to be girls who grew up and were married and lived happily. In Barrow Green House, an admirable building, perhaps more Georgian than Jacobean, once lived Grote, the historian. He lies in Westminster Abbey, his widow, as we saw, is buried in Shear Churchyard. Barrow Green Farm, close by, is all that an old farmhouse should be, complete with barns, an oast house, and a fascinating front to the road. Oast houses begin here, near the Kent border. Surrey grows few hops, only at Farnham and near Oxted, I think. In the West Hampshire encourages her, and here she takes heart from Kent. Limpsfield is the other side of the railway. The centre is unlike old Oxted, for it is the church, but you cannot get a picture of Limpsfield as separate and self-contained as of old Oxted. Oxted sets itself on its hillside more charmingly than any village of the Surrey Weald, you get the picture from halfway up the road to the station, and you should look at it when the sun is setting. Then the white ricks in the foreground loom larger, and the huddled roofs and gables age into another century, the blue smoke of wood fires drifts in the wind across the hill. But you cannot hold Limpsfield at such a pleasant distance, you must come into the village street close to the old cottages, and close too, to a large house with a noble frontage on the roadway, great houses are seldom set so near to cottages and the road. But Limpsfield, with all its attractive antiquities of timber and gables, somehow strikes a modern note. Dedalens is the name a name one vaguely tries to scan for a Latin verse of a little, hidden house of great age, in the village street. But it is the common, not Dedalens, or neighboring roofs, which marks Limp's field, and on the common are golf links and the huge red brick buildings of a school. A century ago Limp's field held an author and a critic. He was the author of a tiny book, Limpsfield and its Environs, which was republished in 1838 with an introduction by a friend, who signs himself H.G. and dates his preface from Westerham. At Westerham, too, the curious little republication was issued. It is illustrated by George Cruikshank and with pleasant prints of old penciled drawings, and besides a poem, contains a number of descriptions of the chief houses of the neighborhood. Here is one of them. Charts Etch. 
On inquiring of a native, we were told that this place was the residence of Mr. Antiquary Street Field. We doubt, however, if he has any just pretensions to that designation, a divine across the border assuring us that he is skilled in glamoury, and illustrating his account by stating that where there was a hill, there he would have a hollow, where there was a dell, there we should find a mound, and, indeed, we ourselves experienced the delusion, for the spot which we had known for many years as a bleak desert, appeared sheltered and decorated with thriving plantations, a house new from the kill, cheated us with its Elizabethan air, neither was the spell broken when we found ourselves in the interior, there we saw, or thought we saw, one of Raphael's loveliest easel pictures, one of Rembrandt's deep-toned yet brilliant interiors, and a goodly row of ancestors in flowing wigs and ample ruffles, whilst, in fact, the former were no more than a foxy Italian copy of the divine Urbino, and a modern English attempt to mimic the glorious Fleming, and the latter, Cockneys and Kentish. Yeoman. Such a concatenation of studied insults might be supposed to have finished with a libel action. But it is the only description of a neighboring house which has a hint of raillery, and a penciled note in a copy I found of the little old book adds the explanation. Charts Edge belonged to the author of Limpsfield and its environs. I imagine, also, that Mr. Antiquary Streetfield was the author of The Old Oak Chair, republished in the same volume by his friend H. G., and described as a ballad sung at an anniversary dinner of the Westerham Amicable Benefit Society, to which the author has proved a steady friend. This is the ballad of the old oak chair. My good sire sat in his old oak chair. And the pillow was under his head. And he raised his feeble voice, and ne'er will the memory part from my living heart. Of the last few words he said, when I sit no more in this old oak chair, and the green grass has grown on my grave, and like armed men, come want and care. No, my boys, that God's curse will not make matters worse. How little soever you have. The son that would sit in my old oak chair, and set foot on his father's spade, must be of his father's spirit heir, and know that God's blessing is still the best dressing. Whatever improvements are made. And he sat no more in his old oak chair. And escaped thrift laid his hand. On his father's plough, and he cursed the air. And he cursed the soil. For he lost his toil. But the fault was not in the land. And another sat in his father's chair. And talked, o'er his liquor, of laws. Of the tyranny here and the knavery there till the old bit of oak, and the drunkard broke. But the times were not the cause. But I have redeemed the old rickety chair, and trod in my father's ways, have turned the furrow with humble prayer, to profit my neighbors, and prosper my labors, and find my sheaves with praise. Crookshank draws the scape thrift roistering over punch and church warden's pipes. The careful and thrifty farmer is in another picture. He has no pipe, and he talks kindly to his wife, and dandles his son on his knee. There is a large ale jug on the table, and he has had a capital dinner. Titsy, a mile and a half away under the downs, is not a village at all, just a modern church outside Titsy Park, and a cottage opposite the church which was once an inn, and could swing a sign now if it wished, the frame is there. Once the church stood inside the park. That was when Titsy Place belonged to the Greshams, the ancestors of its later owners, the Levison Gowers. Sir John Gresham, looking one day in 1776 at the old church, decided that it was too near his house, it was only 35 feet distant. With the insolence of the day, he knocked it down, and the modern church stands obediently outside the gates. But Titsy Park has made amends. When the late Mr. Granville Levison Gower was at Titsy he brought to light, and described in the Surrey Archaeological Collections, the foundations of a Roman villa discovered in the park, almost touching the old road used by the pilgrims on their way to Canterbury. The foundations were interestingly complete, and from the ground near were dug coins, pottery, and a bronze mask. Today the villa may be visited, 
but it is overgrown by weeds and elder bushes, and the visible remains are of scanty walls and tumbled pillars, rabbits, I think, see most of it. From Titsi you may climb a steep road and find Tatsfield Church, separated from its scattered village, clean on the edge of the steep hill. Tatsfield Church, which is old and small, stands nearly 800 feet above the Weald, and its little churchyard, with a path in it leading to no gate, but only to a hedge, lends a curious sense of a garden. The stretch of Sussex and Kent to the south is freer and wider than any other Surrey church sees, but Tatsfield, like other places with a fine view, suffers continual loss in cloudy weather. When I was last there the church stood alone on the brow, over unguissable depths of grey mist. Chapter 41 Dulwich to Wimbledon Growing London Cigars by Dulwich Valley Edward Allen, actor, bear baiter, dog fancier and founder of a college God's Gift Dulwich Buttercups Dr. Johnson A Prayer in a Library Merton Wimbledon Camp A Miser's Grave An Opportunity for a Dual Groans for George Ranger Memories of the Windmill Nothing is more capricious than a vast town pushing out into the country. No law binds it, no power can resist it, it will not be tempted, or denied, only one future can certainly be prophesied for it, that where it comes it will remain. Looking at London and its surroundings on a new map and an old, it is an arresting thing to trace almost to watch the growth of the inexorable black ink on what a decade or two before was in violet white. There is nothing orderly about it, nothing mathematical. London does not grow as the circles spread from a splash in a pond, nor regularly and certainly as geologists say stones grow in the soil a fascinating and rather dreadful secret of growth. London grows suddenly by fits and starts. Once, perhaps, the town crept out quietly, a field at a time, a new road in a twelve-month. Now it catches great parks and manors. But which way it will go out to catch them you cannot guess. It may walk threateningly, and it may leave alone, as it has left the deepest of hayfields alone in Kent much nearer London than in Surrey. One rule, perhaps, it keeps relentlessly, it will never leave country between London old and London new. The Londons join at once. Ruskin, in Praetorita, shows you London striding by Herne Hill to Croydon. Herne Hill should be a hill with a heronry on it, but the name is new, it was King's Hill when John Speed made his map in the days of James I. But Herne Hill was in the country when Ruskin knew it. Norwood was a hill, Dulwich was a valley. Central in each amphitheatre, the crowning glory of Herne Hill was accordingly, that, after walking along its ridge southward from London through a mile of chestnut, lilac, and apple trees, hanging over the wooden palings on each side suddenly the trees stopped on the left, and out one came on the top of the field sloping down to the south into Dulwich Valley open field animate with cow and buttercup, and below, the beautiful meadows and high avenues of Dulwich, and beyond, all that crescent. Of the Norwood Hills, a footpath, entered by a turnstile, going down to the left, always so warm that invalids could be sheltered there in March, when to walk elsewhere would have been death to them, and so quiet, that whenever I had anything difficult to compose or think of, I used to do it rather there than in our own garden. The great field was separated from the path and road only by light wooden open palings, four feet high, needful to keep the cows in. Since I last composed, or meditated there, Various improvements have taken place, first the neighborhood wanted a new church, and built a meager gothic one with a useless spire, for the fashion of the thing, at the side of the field, then they built a parsonage behind it, the two stopping half the view in that direction. Then the crystal palace came, forever spoiling the view through all its compass, and bringing every show day from London a flood of pedestrians down the footpath who left it filthy with cigar ashes for the rest of the week, then the railroads came, and expatiating roughs by every excursion train, who knocked the palings about, roared at the cows, and tore down what branches of blossom they could reach over the palings on the enclosed side. Then the residents on the enclosed side built a brick wall to defend themselves. Then the path got to be insufferably hot as well as dirty, and was gradually abandoned to the roughs, with a policeman on watch at the bottom. Finally, this year, 
a six-foot high close paling has been put down the other side of it, and the processional excursionist has the liberty of obtaining what notion of the country ear and prospect he may, between the wall and that, with one bad cigar before him, another behind him, and another in his mouth. Dulwich Valley and Cows and Buttercups it has still an uneasy echo of the town. Somewhere, surely, there always broods over Dulwich the spirit of the founder of its college. He is the Londoner of Londoners, and the oddest combination of characters that ever left a name as pious benefactor of a school. Edward Allen, or Allen as his college spells him, was to begin with an Elizabethan actor. He was one of a company of strolling players before he was twenty, he was twenty-two when he had somehow made himself a gentleman, to be so described on a deed of gift, and when he was twenty-six, he was such an actor that Ben Jonson compared him to Rossius and Cicero, and Thomas Nash wrote that not Rossius or Isabi, those tragedians admired before Christ was born, could ever perform more in action than famous Ned Allen. Perhaps he made his money as an actor-manager, perhaps he married money, for his wife was the daughter of a pawnbroker, who was also a theatre proprietor and one of the grooms of the Queen's Chamber, perhaps he began lending money early in life himself. He and his father-in-law, when James succeeded Elizabeth, were made chief masters of His Majesty's games of bears, bulls, and dogs, they had a menagerie in the Paris Gardens at Southwark where they kept wolves and lions, they worried bulls and had dog fights, and showed pleasant sport with the horse and ape and whipping of the blind bear. Money rolled in, with the apes and the bears and the loans, and in October, 1605, Allen, by this time full esquire, bought the manor and lands of Dulwich for £4,900. Eight years later he left Southwark for Dulwich, and set about founding his college. Aubrey has a quaint legend of the foundation. How should an actor found a college? The devil was in it somewhere. Tradition told that Mr. Allen, being a tragedian, and one of the original actors in many of the celebrated Shakespeare's plays, in one of which he played a Damon, with six others, and was in the midst of the play Surpris D by an apparition of the devil, which so worked on his fancy, that he made a vow which he performed D at this place. That was the beginning of Dulwich College, according to one story, according to another, it was only because Alan had begun so earnestly, and tied himself up by so many legal contracts that he did not repent of his vow and take back all he had given. That was when, a widower of fifty-seven, he wanted to marry a girl of twenty. She was John Dunn's daughter Constance, and perhaps Dunn felt bound to ask for liberal settlements. However, the settlements were arranged somehow, and the college was founded. The College of God's Gift was his name for it, and as its founder he described himself as chief master, ruler, and overseer of all and singular over games of bears, bulls, mastiff dogs and mastiff bitches. His blood relations were to be master and warden, if possible, and so, for many years, they were. One of the statutes explains the name God's gift. There were to be twelve poor scholars, chosen partly by merit and partly by chance. When a place became vacant three or four children were to be elected by the parish vestries, and of these two were to be chosen by the master and warden, and then the two were to draw lots. The manner of drawing of the said lot shall be thus, two equal small rolls of paper to be indifferently made and rolled up, in one of which rolls the wards God's gift are to be written, and the other roll is to be left blank and so put into a box, which box shall be thrice shaken up and down, and the elder person of those two that are elected to draw the first lot, and the younger person the second, and wick of them draw it the lot wherein the wards God's gift are written. Shall be forthwith admitted. Another gift followed Allen's. When Sir Francis Bourgeois died early in the last century he left his fine collection of pictures to the school. The gallery is open to the public, but a description, in the space I have here, could be no more than a list of names. Dulwich still has some of its fields and buttercups, the playing fields are a pleasant oasis which is the last vision of sunlight and grass for the traveller on the Chatham and Dover Railway before plunging into the murk of the Penge Tunnel. Of its neighbours to the west, Streatham clusters about a tangle of railways, Streatham, 
which was deep country for Dr. Johnson, knocked down, in 1863, the house and cut up the park that Dr. Johnson knew when they belonged to the Thrails. He would not recognize the church the church to which he bade farewell with a kiss it has been rebuilt. The library, which, if it were standing today with the books that Johnson read, would be the most sought for room in Surrey, went, of course, with the house. Eighty years before it fell Johnson had parted from it with a prayer. Help me, he prayed, that I may, with humble and sincere thankfulness, remember the comforts and conveniences which I have enjoyed at this place, and that I may resign them with holy submission, equally trusting in thy protection when thou givest, and when thou takest away. That was the library which was destroyed only forty-five years ago. But Streatham, when it knocked down the Thrales house, had very good authority for parting with all it had of Dr. Johnson. Mrs. Thrale would not have minded. She sold all the letters Dr. Johnson wrote her for a matter of five hundred pounds. Between Streatham and Wimbledon London strides out in patches. It has not yet taken in Mitcham, which has a fine green with memories of great Surrey cricket, and which grows all manner of scented flowers, lavender and mint and rosemary and everything old-fashioned for herbalists and perfumers and ladies' sachets and linen chests. But Merton, northwest towards Wimbledon, has been caught fast. Merton Church, in which Nelson used to worship, and which has his hatchment on the wall, above fine cross beams of oak, stands among brand new roofs and roads. Opposite the church is the forlornest thing, a house which once was Sheridan's, and which is now the warehouse of a shop, and hangs in its hall and rooms printed calico. The windows are broken and cobwebby, the garden is a ruin, but the calico, which you may buy at a shop in the town, is fresh and very brightly printed. Francis Nixon, the founder of Merton's Calico Printing, which is quite an industry, lies in the churchyard. And so, by a ring from east to west, where London joins the Surrey countryside, we come to Wimbledon, Wimbledon old and new, as old as a camp which may have been Saxon, as young as yesterday's new villa. The camp, it is true, exists no longer. It has had more learned essays written over it than any in Surrey, it has been claimed as belonging to Casavellanus, it has been argued to be a Roman camp, and it has been urged that it marks the site of a battle between Saxon and Saxon for the possession of Surrey. It was a war camp, pretty certainly, from its shape, which was almost exactly circular. But you can see the shape no longer. Wimbledon was unfortunate enough to see its famous camp fall into the hands of a Mr. Sawbridge Oral Drax, and he, in 1875, dared to level its dikes with the ground, to cut down its mound, and fill in its ditch. Of acts of wanton and insolent destruction, this stands supreme in the history of the county. Wimbledon has held a great house, and has seen royal progresses which cost the lord of the manor a fortune. Thomas Cromwell was one of the lords of the manor, and after him came Catherine Parr, but the great days were those of the Cecils. Lord Burley, Elizabeth's treasurer, lived at intervals at the rectory house, and some of Elizabeth's summer excursions came to Wimbledon, she stayed with her treasurer and with his son. But the Cecil who belongs most to Wimbledon is not the treasurer whose nod summed up the wisdom of a parliament, nor any lord of Burley, but a younger son who was a soldier and a sailor. He was admiral and marshal general of the forces sent by James I and Charles I against the Spaniards, he was made Lord Wimbledon, and his memory on the records of the army of his day is that his name of Cecil was punned into General Sitstill when he was a soldier of almost foolhardy personal daring, and that he reintroduced into the army the old English march. There was one certain measure, a royal warrant informs us, which had been lost through the negligence and carelessness of drummers, although it had been by the approbation of strangers themselves, confessed and acknowledged the best of marches. This march, at the instance of Lord Wimbledon, was beaten in the King's presence at Greenwich in 1610 and ordered to be exactly and precisely observed by all drummers in the Kingdom of England and Principality of Wales, without any addition or alteration whatsoever. We do not hear it in these days of battles without drums and colours, but we do not fight much better, perhaps, 
without the drums. The old Wimbledon church was demolished, the new church was built in 1786. It has many monuments, but the grave which fascinates is the tomb neither of a great statesman nor a good man. It is apart in a far corner, over it is laid a huge slab of black stone, perhaps half a foot thick, and the stone tells you that under it lies the body of John Hopkins, Esquire, familiarly known as Vulture Hopkins. Misers have had hard things said of them often enough, of Hopkins Pope wrote that he lived worthless, but died worth three hundred thousand pounds, and, reflecting on the use of riches, Pope made a couplet on his funeral. When Hopkins dies, a thousand lights attend the wretch who living save the candle's end. But those legends belong to paper and books. They are less easily destroyed than an epithet engraved on a stone, but who of deliberation would carve an insult, as this is carved, for a dead man? The Golf House and Windmill, Wimbledon Common The Golf House and Windmill, Wimbledon Common Wimbledon will never belong to the town so long as it keeps its common. It is the wildest thing near London. It is almost as wild and lonely a place today as when in Georgian and early Victorian days statesmen and noblemen chose it as a fashionable and convenient ground for dueling. The common has seen more than one historic duel. The Duke of York and Colonel Lennox met there in 1789, the Duke received the Colonel's fire, and the ball grazed his hair, but he did not fire in return. Pitt fought a duel with a member of Parliament on Putney Heath north of the Common in 1798, each fired twice at twelve paces and hit nothing. Sir Francis Burdett and Mr. John Paul fought in 1807, wounded each other and went back together to London in the same carriage. Canning and Castlereagh fought in 1809, and Grattan, two years after Queen Victoria came to the throne, received Lord Londonderry's fire and himself fired in the air. Another Grattan could meet another Irish peer today, and if they chose their place as well, nobody would hear a pistol at all. The bracken and the heather slope into dells and valleys which would shelter three duels in a morning, you could deliver a salvo and hardly scare a nursery maid. But Wimbledon's longest acquaintance with firearms was in the days before the National Rifle Association moved to Bisley. Queen Victoria fired the first shot on July 2, 1860, when she pulled a scarlet cord and scored a bullseye with a Whitworth rifle, a red and white flag was shown in an instant, you read, and three points were scored to the Queen of England. The last shot was fired in 1889. I went to that meeting as a schoolboy, and am even now filled with an awe that belongs to spacious days, remembering that we were told that on the last evening the whole camp was to give three great groans for George Ranger, the Duke of Cambridge, whose duty it had been to declare the common unfitted for the distant probings of misdirected Martini Henry bullets. Those concerted, resentful, thousand-throated groans seemed a tremendous nightly business, there were campfires, one imagined, from which the circular groan would ascend, a rumble which should expel a ministry, unseat a prince. Not very much came of the groaning, I suppose, certainly the volunteers liked the Bisley Ranges, next year, much better. But the old windmill, which looked on in its time at thirty full meetings, still surely misses the week when the dells and the long stretches of heather rattled from the first gun to sunset with the crackle of martinis and match rifles. The windmill watches red-coated golfers today, playing to some of the prettiest greens in the south of England, but the days for the windmill were when the tents were white about the heather, and when they sold Stuart's verniers where today a more leisure generation misses short putts. Chapter 42 The Surrey Side Mortlake the boat race a dual Putney by the Sea Punch and Judy Kennington Gallows and Faggots the proper way to subscribe to a cricket club Camberwell Beauties the Tradescants and their dodo Mr. Jeffrey Safari the old Surrey side the Tabard the old road. The Surrey side begins, perhaps, if it begins anywhere definitely, at Mortlake, where the boat race ends. By Q and Richmond the Thames runs for pleasure boats, gigs, and skiffs with shining oars. Below Mortlake the river hears the forge and the dockyard, torpedo boats drive out into the tide, it is different water, London water, under their bows. 
The four miles of the Thames of the boat race mark the gradual change. On a rough day the two eights ride through waves which are less like a river than a sea, and perhaps the rough water has made some of the best history of the race. When Cambridge sank in 1859 she was waterlogged early in the race, she could not have won, but the steamers following the eights prevented her even from passing the winning post, by swamping her with their wash. Oxford won, but Cambridge's was an equal honor. The crew rode on as the boat went under the water, and the name that will always belong to that race is that of a future Lord Justice, Mr. A. L. Smith. Cambridge and Mr. A. L. Smith went on rowing in the water, knowing that Mr. Smith could not swim. On another rough day, 39 years later, the race was lost and won by the toss, the Cambridge boat filled at the start, and Oxford rowed in out of the wind. Other historic races belong to the curve of the river above Barnes Bridge, three in particular, in 1886, 1896, and 1901 when the crew that was behind at Barnes Bridge passed the other crew at the bend of the river and won. Of other historic races, perhaps the wins of the two crews in which a Goldie turned the fortunes of his university will always possess peculiar glories. The first Goldie, in 1870, ended a series of nine Oxford wins. Another Goldie, in 1899, helped Cambridge to end another series, also of nine. The name and the two nines in the date surely made the feat inevitable. The river water does not change, but the banks have altered from grass and reeds to concrete and stone. It was a mile or so from Barnes Bridge, in a field near Barn Elms, but who could guess where, that the second Duke of Buckingham fought and shot Lord Shrewsbury. The Duke left behind him one of the wickedest lives of the most dissolute courts of English history, but he left nothing viler than the name of Lord Shrewsbury's Countess, who rode in boy's clothes as a page to the dueling ground, and then held her seducer's horse while he shot her husband. They left him dying and rode back together. That was in 1667, an earlier and a kindlier association of Barn Elms is a resident who afterwards died at Chertsey, Abraham Cowley, later came Jacob Tonson, bibliophile and publisher of Pope and Dryden. And it was at Barn Elms, too that the Kitcott Club, the thirty who dined at Christopher Katz in the Strand, and bound themselves to uphold the Protestant succession, met and dined and looked at their portraits painted by Sir Godfrey Kneller. The Kitcott portraits are now at Bayford Berry, near Hertford, and for the last fifteen years Barn Elms has housed, not publishers or painters, but polo players. The Ranelagh Club was born to help Hillingham over the water provide grounds for the youngest of the great games naturalized in England. Nine years later Barnes welcomed another club, Roehampton, which added three more grounds to the four of Hillingham and Ranelagh. The boat race finishes at Mort Lake, it starts at Putney, and Putney is the headquarters and the rendezvous of many clubs and rowing men. The Surrey Bank from Putney Bridge upstream is a string of clubhouses, boathouses and little wooden buildings that do duty for both, and here, on sloping banks sometimes washed by brimming tides, sometimes broad and flat by a shrunken stream on which no racing boat will set its dainty keel, London gathers on March afternoons to wait for the return of the practicing crews, and to watch the blue-scarved oarsmen in and out of the boathouses and the balcony windows. There is somewhere an air of the seaside about that stretch of gravel and open river bank, it is the sunshine on the varnish of the boats, perhaps, or a smell of tar in the wind, or of salt from the weeds that the tides leave dry, or is it the banjo of the occasional nigger black to get pence from the waiting crowd. On a September day a year or two ago, when Cambridge within a week was to race Harvard, I saw on that strip of road one of the very last of the genuine London Punch and Judy shows. Toby, of course, had gone, dogs may sit no more in frills to catch for coppers. But the rest of it was correct enough, the checkered canvas, of the proper shade of blue, draped the wooden frame discreetly at the right moment, there was the old interval of suspense, the old, the piercing squeal, the dexterous cock of the red legs over the balcony, the crocodile came and the hangman, and the devil, I watched them all. So did two of the Harvard crew, and did not know their luck. 
Nothing of English pride stirred in the blood of those two stalwart young men, they walked off even before the turn of the hangman. East of Putney the river is a thoroughfare of London, and the names along the Surrey side are London names. Lambeth Palace has already included itself in Mrs. E.T. Cook's highways and byways in London, and so has Vauxhall, and the Church of St. Saviour's, Southwark, the finest of all churches which once looked over Surrey fields. But Kennington, no matter how near it lies to London omnibuses and London tube railways, can never be anywhere but in Surrey, Kennington with its memories of the 45, and the Chartists, and, a much stronger link with county history than mere memories of the past, Kennington Oval, the visible, flat, noble cricket ground which stands for the story of all Surrey cricket of the past half century. The Oval is scarcely half a mile from Vauxhall Bridge and the river, but it is the centre of the county for those who watch Surrey cricket. Once the Oval was part of Kennington Common, even in 1845, the solid road which circles the ground was no more than a ditch and a quickset hedge. But a hundred years before 1845, cricket, even then, was a game in Surrey. Frederick Lewis, Prince of Wales, and father of George III, was introducing his favourite pastime to the nobles and the gentlemen. In 1737 Kent played Surrey and London on Kennington Common, and round the pavilion set up for the Prince of Wales there was so great a crush of spectators that a poor woman fell and had her leg broken. The Prince gave her ten guineas. That was a cricketer. And yet, within eight years, Kennington was back among the vilest barbarities of the Middle Ages. The 45 was to set a mark of ferocious savagery in Kennington annals hardly surpassed by Tyburn. The Earl of Kennington, that, with the nickname of Butcher, was one of the titles of the Duke of Cumberland, had sent to jail in Southwark nine officers whom he had taken prisoner at Carlisle, fighting for Charles Edward Stewart. They were ordered for execution, and on July 30th, at 11 o'clock in the morning, were taken on three sledges to Kennington Common. The gallows were there, the block, the faggots. The prisoners were allowed to pray among themselves. Then they were pinioned and placed in the cart under the gallows, the fires were lighted, the cart moved away. Before they were dead they were cut down, beheaded, disemboweled and their hearts burned in the fire, the executioner, throwing in the heart of the last, who was no more than a boy, cried God save King George. Part of the crowd answered with a shout, the rest looked on in sorrow. The boy who suffered with the elder men was James Dawson, and Shenstone wrote a ballad on his death. He had been engaged to be married to a young girl, who insisted on seeing her lover's last moments. When all was over, she threw herself back in the coach, called to him that she followed him, and as she spoke, died. Another gathering on Kennington Common might have had more wholesale consequences. The Chartists met there in 1848. Fergus O'Connor was their leader, and he and the petition which the delegates were to take to the House of Commons went out in two large cars. The petition went first, drawn by four horses, and piled up like bales of cotton, the car was decorated with flags, banners, and mottoes, and so were the horses. Then came O'Connor and the delegates, equally superb in bunting. They drove down Holborn and across Blackfriars Bridge, and on Kennington Common an enormous crowd, between 15,000 and 50,000, the different accounts say, received the banners and the delegates with loud cheers. But no bloodshed followed. O'Connor was informed that the crowd could not be allowed to march to the House of Commons, where, indeed, they would have found the Duke of Wellington with cannon. The Chartist leader made two eloquent speeches, and the chairman declared the meeting at an end. The delegates' horses were whipped up so hurriedly that the delegates fell to the bottom of the cart, three cabs drove up and took charge of the bales of petitions, and the meeting was at an end. One detail which the contemporary historian gives of the finish has a fascinating echo half of Ainsworth, half of Dickens. The horses became restive and began to kick. Then was distinctly heard from many quarters the peculiar cry of the young London thieves. What was it like? Can anybody do it today? 
the great crowds at Kennington today come to see better sights than carts and banners. Surrey cricket has focused itself at Kennington, rather curiously, it has happened that Surrey plays cricket today on no other ground. Kent and Sussex, two neighbours, play their county matches on three grounds or four, Surrey, which has traditions at Mitcham and Dorking, has shrunk back to Kennington only. And Kennington, long ago, was nearly lost to cricket. A year after the Chartists had crowded over the common, the county club was in debt for £70. The story of the paying of the debt and the revival of the club has the real ring. The club met and were in despair, they could not hope, with such a debt, to play matches. The Bishop of Tasmania, in his entertaining little history of Kennington, tells, in 1889, the story. The meeting almost decided to break up the club, and I suppose, had such a vote been carried, the Oval would have been at once built over and some very happy memories of Kennington would never have existed at all. It is to the present Lord Bessborough that we owe the continuance of cricket upon the Oval. He was vice president at the time, and suggested that the £70 should be paid off by allowing six gentlemen to become life members by paying down £12 apiece. A gentleman present next said who would pay £12 to be a life member of a bankrupt club. I will, said old Mr. Cressingham, one of the oldest members, and I will, said five others, of whom Mr. Ponsonby was one. Lord Bessborough, in writing of this memorable meeting, adds looking back to that distant day I fear I have been a bad bargain to the club by becoming a life member for pound twelve. Nothing of the country and little of the past belongs to Kennington's neighbours. Stockwell, which perhaps sees a hansom as often as a motor car, once named as a native one of the greatest of English race horses. Camberwell, when willows grew about a village stream, long since dry, named a butterfly, but Camberwell beauties, though they sleep sometimes in Surrey wood stacks, and flaunt their white laced wings in Surrey sunshine perhaps twice in a summer, fly no more by brooks in Camberwell. Perhaps in the old days the Tradescants, who lived near Vauxhall, used to catch them. The Tradescants, father and son, were great naturalists and collectors, and at their house they got together the Museum of Rarities which after their death came to the Ashmolean Museum at Oxford. John Tradescant the son made a list of them, and though Oxford ungratefully hid the collection in an outhouse and only discovered it again in 1882, many of the curiosities he mentions move undergraduates to surprise today. In the original list are strange fowls. Some kinds of birds, their eggs, beaks, feathers, claws and spurs begin the list of chapters, and then come a crocodile and an egg given for a dragon's egg and Easter eggs of the Patriarchs of Jerusalem. Two feathers of the phoenix tail I do not remember at Oxford, nor a cherry stone holding ten dozen tortoise shell combs, made by Edward Gibbons. But I think the Ashmolean collection still holds the flea chains of silver and gold, with three hundred links apiece, and yet but an inch long, and, of course, the Oxford dodo's skin is famous. It was not a dodo, though, to John Tradescant. It was a dodar, from the island of Mauritius, it is not able to fly, being so big. The wrong thing about it all is that the name of the Tradescants ought to be associated with the collection, and not the name Ashmole. It was never Ashmole's to give to Oxford. Ashmole was a rich and greedy neighbor, and though Tradescant left his museum to his widow and after her death to Oxford, he, the polite Ashmole, bullied Mrs. Tradescant until she signed a paper stating that she had begged him to take the museum for his own. She would have signed anything, poor lady, to get rid of him. She suffered so much from persecution from the generous donor of her husband's museum to Oxford, that she drowned herself in a pond, a few months before having signed a statement that she had caused a great heap of earth rubbish to be laid against his garden wall doubtless she caused nothing of the sort so high that on the first day of August last, in the night, by the help thereof, it is strongly presumed that thieves got over the same and robbed the said Mr. Ashmole of thirty-two cocks and hens. Easternmost of Surrey in London, Rotherhith lies about the docks of the pool. The pool should have a book to itself, and will not go into mine, 
but of rather hith ashore there is a record which deserves keeping. Aubrey, or his later editor, gives a list of the rather hith residents who contributed to the rebuilding of St. Mary's Church, and the names, sorted and classified, should be set aside for a future Dickens. Here are a few of them Blois, Figgins, Cuthbert Finkel, Gollop, Cronker, Shadrick Lifter, Walter Mel, Mr. Jeremiah Rosher, Mr. Jonas Shish, Mr. Nathaniel Stefan, Mr. Matthias Walraven, Mr. Scroggs, Mr. Jeffrey Safari, Mr. Valentine Teed. Vermonsey, which has kept the Thule Street of the Three Tailors, but elsewhere preserves names only instead of stones, has memories of one of the three Surrey abbeys. It was founded as a priory for Cluniac monks by Alwyn Child, a citizen of London, in 1082, and it became an abbey some 300 years later. Bermondsey Priory had a church of some note, for in it was a crucifix which the old chronicles describe vaguely as having been found near the Thames. The crucifix attracted special pilgrimages, and when the monasteries were ended, it disappeared. There was the picture of Saint Saviour that had stood in Barmsey Abbey many years in Southwark Tokin Down, a diarist writes at the time. All that remains of the church and crucifix is the name, which has come to Saint Saviour's, or the Church of Saint Mary Overy the style now is to call it Southwark Cathedral. Saint Saviour's belongs to London Highways, as I have said, but I may take for Surrey the lines, not already quoted for London, I think which are set on the tomb of Richard Humble, alderman of London and ancestor of Wards and Dudleys. The tomb has busied many pens, the verses remain to be read are they too well known to be written out again? Like to the damask rose you see. Or like the blossom on the tree. Or like the dainty flower of May. Or like the morning of the day. Or like the sun or like the shade. Or like the gourd which Jonas had. Even so is man whose thread is spun. Drawn out and cut, and so is done. The rose withers, the blossom blasteth. The flower fades, the morning hasteth. The sun sets, the shadow flies. The gourd consumes, the man he dies. Beaumont wrote the lines, legend says, perhaps wrongly, but they have the Elizabethan life and ring. If one had to choose a dozen square yards of London to sum up the Surrey side, where should they be? For me, there could be no choice. One spot would demand the first, the only place. It would be where Waterloo Bridge touches the Surrey shore, where you may look south to a Surrey hill by Sydenham, and north to half the panorama of London, from St. Paul's to Westminster Abbey. There, on the first few yards of the bridge, above the little hill which shrinks the wide roadway into a neck and stops over laden drays like a wall, blows the aura of all London that crowds south of the river, all Surrey that belongs to the London Thames. The business of the town and the country mingles with the business of the river and the sea. An afternoon in December, the month of months to know London in, is the time to be there. Upstream from the knower on an east wind rides the damp of salt and of estuary fogs, about you are the steam of sweating horses and the pungent clinging sense of malt and hops and brewing, up on a yellow tide under the arches of the bridge swings a string of barges, piled with bales of hay. A flock of pigeons sways and wheels in the sky, drops to the roofs, settles with a clatter, sails up into the sky again. Black-headed gulls, in their winter suits of dove color and white, walk about the muddy edge of the rising tide, drift on the stream like torn paper, soar and hang in the wind above the bridge, peering this way and that for the fish and bread the Londoners give them, or late in the afternoon wing quiet journeys into unknown spaces of western light. Beyond the bridge the lights dot orange sparks in the films and shades of great buildings and the embankment roadway. That is pure London, and London, too, is most of the Waterloo Road, with its new hospital, and the roar of the trains from the junction, and the old curiosity shops with the foreign names, and the wig makers, and the cheap furniture spoiling in the rain. But Surrey is there, too, a shop that shows cricket bats, and another that has fruit ladders, and, above all, the little shops that offer boxes of pansies and delphinium roots and hyacinth bulbs all the seasons round to Surrey men leaving London behind them in the evening.
Suri recollects that she is not quite London in the Waterloo Road, she plays cricket and plants pansies. That would be the Surrey side I should choose, with the magic of the tide water about it and somewhere, however faint, the scent of the Surrey gardens. But the old, the oldest Surrey side? That belongs to the river shore south of London Bridge, where once, too, Londoners could cross from crowded wood and brick to walk among Surrey Hawthorn and Surrey Daisies. The roar and the soot of the borough have set that strip of country deep in London, hardly divided by the water. But it was there, when Chaucer's nine and twenty pilgrims lay at the Tabard Inn, that Surrey began for Londoners and for all who had come to the dear and sweet city of which Chaucer sings to journey south from the Thames on a pilgrimage to Canterbury. The Tabard Inn is no more, the fire that swept over Southwark ten years after the fire of London destroyed the building Chaucer knew. The piety of a later day raised another tabard, perhaps like the old tabard with the same galleries and balustrades to look down from upon pilgrims and minstrels and monks and fools. But that tabard in became the Talbot in a careless age, and as the Talbot it was raised to the ground forty years ago, when nobody minded what became of the old inns and churches and the things best worth keeping in old Surrey. The tabard has gone, but the ancient road remains. Smoke and stone are about it, where once it stretched out bare among green fields, but the fields are there, for those who can see them, behind the veil of smoke, and through them a wayfarer may still travel with the knight who loved freedom and courtesy, the monk shaking his belled bridle, the plowman on his mare, and the dainty fingered prioress with her eyes as grey as glass, riding to join other pilgrims travelling east to Canterbury by the old road. Map of the County of Surrey The End